Prologue The man who was no longer a man stood before an alien who was not what it seemed. Everything is in place, the man said. The alien tasted the air as though sniffing for lies. Are you certain? Yes, General, he replied confidently. Nevertheless, he felt extremely self-conscious of how he was standing. The aliens he thought he was dealing with were particularly good at reading body language. The slightest gesture or twitch of a facial muscle might be misconstrued as doubt. The population has been lulled into a false sense of security, or if not security, then certainly hope that security might one day be possible. Barring the unforeseen, all should proceed according to plan. I am pleased, the alien said, claws clicking on the floor as it paced restlessly before him. Inwardly, he sighed his relief. Meeting his side of the bargain was literally a matter of life and death. Does that mean... When you return, and I am completely satisfied that your half of the bargain has been met, the alien said sharply, then and only then will you receive that which you desire. The alien's tail thumped the ground once. End of discussion. It couldn't have been clearer if it had used words. He shrugged, nodding his acceptance of the alien's terms. There was no reason to believe that things wouldn't go as expected. He would get what he wanted. He had taken care of everything, after all. Then I shall leave you, General, he said, with your permission. It looked him over briefly as it concurred. You may depart, it said in a series of tones too loud for the human ear to endure comfortably, yet possessing such subtlety that few could comprehend it. No human mouth had ever uttered so much as a single word in that tongue. That he spoke it fluently was simply to be expected. I shall meet you back here in a matter of days. Be assured that I will be waiting, the alien said, still pacing the floor. And remember, we have what you want. He bowed, knowing that he could never forget that. As he left the picket ship via the narrow umbilical, his body adapting to freefall with built-in ease, he eagerly anticipated his return to claim what was rightfully his, the triumphant beginning of his new existence. It didn't matter how many lives it cost. He would happily stand by a bonfire of bodies if that's what it took for a chance to warm himself on immortality's fires. With a smile, he set a course for destiny. Part One Expedition Luke Skywalker scrambled up the rocky slope, his lungs burning with each heavy breath he took. He was relieved to hear his nephew beside him also panting for breath because that meant his own difficulties with the climb were in no way a reflection of his age or fitness. It was simply that the atmosphere on Manlali Mafir was thin, that was all. Behind them came the terrible baying of the Krizlaws. The sound was high-pitched and piercing, even through the rarefied atmosphere, and sent a shiver down his spine. With their great rancor-like heads bent low, sniffing for assent, Luke knew that the smooth and pink-skinned aliens wouldn't be too far behind, converging from around the ruined palace to join in the hunt for the landing party. He glanced over his shoulder, half expecting to see them snapping at his heels already. Thankfully, though, they weren't that close. But even as he looked, he saw seven of them emerge from a decorative archway at the base of the nearest wall, tripping over one another and slipping on the rubble in their haste as they headed for the ceremonial mound. Another three jump-rolled from a window, scurrying out of sight behind a statue. Small reddish eyes, two thin arms tipped with three poisoned claws, two powerful legs designed for pouncing, Mouths with jaws extendable enough to swallow a human head in one gulp. The thought was a reminder for Luke that he should keep moving. Only ten of them, Dr. Soren Hegarty said, the surprise evident beneath her own panting. She seemed to be finding the pace more difficult than the others, barely keeping up, even with Jason's help. There have always been eleven. I thought that might have been... Significant. 
A second later, another Krizla leapt through the window, shattering what little remained of the already splintered ornate frame, then dashed for the mound also. The xenobiologist shook her head, as if to suggest she was tired of being right all the time. Eleven, she confirmed. Come on, Dr. Hagerty, Jason said. Luke felt his young nephew subtly augmenting her stamina with the force. We have to keep moving. Ritual hunting party, you think? Lieutenant Stalgis asked. The stocky Imperial in light combat armor turned to snap a shot back at the seven coming up the mound. The blaster bolt took one on the shoulder, provoking an ear-splitting squeal of pain, but didn't slow the creature down. Something like that? Hagerty gasped. Luke and Jason exchanged worried looks. The xenobiologist was tiring fast, and the top of the mound was still some distance away. The structure consisted of soil packed tight around a central core of stone, creating a tall, conical pseudo-pyramid with a truncated stone summit, perfect for an impromptu landing field. The shuttle was waiting for them there, engines warmed up and ready to whisk them off to safety. The only problem was that at this rate, with the doctor's endurance flagging, they weren't going to make it. The two Jedi turned simultaneously to see the Krizlaws making their way up the slope in assured and steady bounds, digging in with their claws and using their enormous thigh muscles to propel them forward. Seeing Luke and Jason making a stand, the creatures hurried their ascent, their howls intensifying with each leap. Luke had seen the effects these ululations could have on lower life forms when he'd witnessed the Krizlaws feeding. The intense vibrations of their howls stunned nerve centers, disoriented senses, and sent muscles into spasm. While their prey was thus incapacitated, the Krizlaws would eat them whole. Dr. Hegarty had said that the Krizlaws believed the still-beating heart to be essential for good digestion. You won't be digesting this Jedi, Luke swore determinedly, whole or otherwise. He sent his senses deep under the surface of the mound. Packed it might be, but the soil wasn't bound like ferrocrete. There were fissures underneath the surface, numerous pressure points that, with one solid nudge, could be... there. Signaling Jason, he mentally linked up with his nephew using the force-meld technique perfected in recent months. Together, their minds pushed at the pressure point he had found beneath the surface. Dirt erupted from the slope below as though a buried machine had suddenly come to life. The shower of dirt hid the shifting forces beneath as disturbed ground found itself falling, gathered momentum, disturbed more in turn, and became an avalanche that swept over the Krizlaws, driving them back down to the base of the mound. Stalgis cocked an eyebrow. Impressive, he said approvingly, and with obvious relief. Slinging his blaster rifle over his shoulder, he headed back up the mound at a more leisurely pace. "'We're not out of this yet,' Jason said. Luke silently agreed. Urging himself forward, he activated his comlink. "'We're on our way,' he reported. "'Any sign of disturbances?' The pilot of the Imperial shuttle didn't waste any words. "'All clear. We're ready for liftoff.' Above them... He could hear the whine of engines. Relieved that they would soon be off-planet, Luke allowed himself a moment to puzzle at what had gone wrong. Everything had gone so well at first. Manlali Mafir was a planet that Hegarty had listed as one whose indigenous population told of a migratory world that had once appeared in their system, stayed briefly, and then vanished. It wasn't necessarily Zonama Seacote, but everyone agreed that the lead was worth following up. Upon arrival, however, it had been apparent that something had changed. The Jostran natives of Manlalimafir were, according to Hegarty's records, slow-moving centipedes barely larger than a human arm. What they'd found, though, was a colony of Krizlaws, listed as feral herd beasts with no more intelligence than a common nerf, and no sign of the Jostrans at all. Something appeared to have elevated the Krizlaws to full intelligence— while at the same time wiping out the Jostrans. Either that or the Imperial probe records had simply been wrong. 
The language used by the Krislaws was, in fact, the same as that recorded in Hegarty's files, except that it was attributed to the Jostrans. The Krislaws were not a star-faring species, so the arrival of the Imperial shuttle had prompted an enthusiastic welcome. Luke, Jason, Hegarty, and a small honor guard of stormtroopers had been invited to a ceremonial banquet, at which the visitors had witnessed the grisly eating habits of the planet's indigenous inhabitants. The local chief, who looked indistinguishable from the others except for a brightly colored belt wrapped around his smooth midriff, had freely passed on the legend about the star world that had appeared in the sky four decades earlier. Lacking telescopes or other optical instruments, their observations had been somewhat limited, but it seemed that this star world had appeared as a blue-green light in the skies of Manlali Mafir. It had stayed there for almost three of the planet's months. Then, as mysteriously as it had appeared, it disappeared again. For the time that this star world held its place in the sky, Manlali Mafir had undergone a period of increased seismic activity. Numerous volcanoes around the planet erupted, and the lands making up the three continents had been rent by groundquakes, all of which resulted in the deaths of many of the natives. Although the locals at the time, whether Jostrans or Krislaws, Luke had been unable to determine, had no geologic knowledge to speak of, or indeed any understanding of the gravitational effects that astral bodies could have upon each other, they had, nonetheless, associated the spate of disasters with the arrival of the new planet. To them, the star world was a harbinger of death and upheaval, and Luke made every effort to reassure the chief, and his people, that it was unlikely the star world would ever return. It was then that the trouble had started. A hush had descended on the gathering as Luke patiently explained that the visitation of the rogue planet had been nothing more than a chance event and it was doubtful that such an occurrence would be repeated. He assumed that Zonama Seacoat was simply looking for somewhere safe to hide, and had moved on once it had become clear that Manlali Mafir was inhabited. It was very possible, he had assured the chief, that the star world was in fact by now on the other side of the unknown regions. He explained that the terrible consequences of its visit, the ruin of most of the planet's stone cities, the disruption to ocean currents, and the impact upon some vital environmental resources, such as aquifers, were only temporary. These things, he promised, would soon return to normal. Instead of being relieved by his reassurances, though, the locals had become agitated. The chief had signaled his guards, and the visitors, esteemed guests just moments earlier, had suddenly found themselves treated as captives. Luke had forbidden any form of resistance from his party confident that he could talk their way out of a violent confrontation. It was only as he had tried to make contact with the chief through the force, however, that he'd realized just how difficult this might prove. These beings, it turned out, had two centers of consciousness. Where Luke might ordinarily have influenced any other creature's thoughts and convinced it simply to let them go, there was no one place to apply pressure within the chief of the Krislaws. One thought center was bright and alert and easily deflected his probe. The other was dull and diffuse, as slippery as a new root egg. He couldn't influence either as easily as he'd hoped, and the revelation threw him for a moment. He had never encountered this situation before. During his confusion, one of their stormtrooper escorts had been forced onto the ground. A robed Krizlaw tipped the stormtrooper's head back and, bizarrely, attempted to force some sort of wriggling grub down his throat. The man gagged and tried to spit it out, but the tiny creature went down anyway. That was enough for Luke. Giving up on direct control, he had used the force to thrust the robed Krizlaw away from the fallen stormtrooper. The man's life signature was still strong, despite his revulsion at the unexpected meal. Pushing his own guards away, he had helped the stormtrooper to his feet while Jason quickly freed himself and the others. Within no time at all, they had broken free of the Krizlaws and were running for their lives. As they fled, Luke had heard the distinctive sound of the chief screeching commands to those gathered around him. Soon a group of eleven ritual hunters, as Hagerty thought of them, had formed and given pursuit. 
The chase through the decaying palace had been fast and furious, with two of the stormtroopers at the rear of the group being snatched up by the jaws and claws of their pursuers within seconds. The sound of their cries as the Krizlaws fell upon them was terrible to hear, but their deaths had given the others valuable seconds. When one of the Krizlaws was successful, all of the hunting party came to a halt to devour their prey. This was the first hint that Hagerty had received of the nature of the ritualistic hunting group comprised by the eleven Krizlaws. Maybe now, Luke hoped, with most of the eleven buried beneath the rubble, they would give up the chase. It was a nice thought, but Luke still didn't feel confident that they were out of trouble just yet. Even now, as they neared their objective at the top of the ceremonial mound, he didn't allow himself to embrace the relief that he could sense emanating from Stalgis and Hagerty. Self-confidence had a way of making one lower one's guard, and that could cost lives. He wasn't about to assume they had escaped, until they had escaped. Finally, the slope eased, and they staggered onto the mound's wide stone summit. The Sentinel-class landing shuttle rested on an eroded bas-relief, depicting a mythical battle between two hideous-looking deities. At the top of the extended landing ramp stood a gray-uniformed Imperial pilot, waving for them to hurry. "'Gee, what's the rush?' Stahl just said dryly, putting an arm under the shoulder of the only other surviving stormtrooper, the one who'd been force-fed the grub. "'Can't they allow us a few moments to admire the scenery?' "'Maybe that's why,' Jason said, pointing ahead and to his left. Approaching with an ungainly but effective series of long-legged leaps were the three Krizlaws who had separated from the rest of the hunting party at the base of the mound. It was clear they were going to reach the shuttle first, which probably explained their triumphant howls and ululations. Luke gathered the force about himself and Jason. By using it to increase their speed, the two of them could head off the three Krizlaws, giving the others opportunity to get to the shuttle. Three of these creatures would certainly be no match for the lightsabers of two trained Jedi. Barely had he taken a step when matching howls sounded from off to the right. A quick glance told him that eight more of the Krizlaws had found them. Eleven again, Hegarty said breathlessly. There was a hint of defeat in her tone. They can't be the ones we buried, Jason said. It's not possible. They aren't, Luke said. They have different markings. These must be replacements. How did they know? Stalgis asked. The question became moot as the eleven howling aliens converged on the escapees. Two Krizlaws separated from the rest and headed for the shuttle, giving the Imperial waiting at the top of the ramp good reason to hastily retreat inside. Seconds later, laser cannons issued from their retractable housing and began taking pot shots. The Krizlaws were too fast, however, their long leaps taking the gunner by surprise. Luke stopped running. There was no point wasting energy on a mad dash if there was no chance of making it. Sending for the shuttle's speeder bike was also pointless, since that could save only two of them at the very most. A familiar meditation damped down feelings of frustration and anger. This was no time to give in to darker emotions, he told himself. There had to be another way to save the landing party from the approaching aliens. Stahl just assumed a sharpshooter's pose and snapped off a dozen rounds in quick succession. One of the Krizlaws stumbled and fell, missing one of its arms and geysering purplish blood. Luke watched in horror as the creature staggered back to its feet and continued on, limping. Stahl just's jaw clenched as if biting down on frustration, but he kept on firing. Luke and Jason placed themselves at two points of a defensive triangle, with Stalgis and the other stormtrooper at the other corner, and the exhausted Hagerty in the middle. The xenobiologist was only slightly older than Luke, but she had no battle skills. The type of expedition she was used to, Luke imagined, would have had little cause for running like this. Krizlaws spread out in a circle around them. Luke used the force to discourage those who came closest, but knew it was only a matter of time before he and the others were rushed. There was no way they could possibly repel all nine at once. As he steeled himself in preparation for the inevitable attack, and possibly a fight to the death, his thoughts went out to his son, safe in the heart of the Galactic Alliance, 
and he sent a wordless message of apology to Mara, waiting in orbit in Jade Shadow. The Millennium Falcon's exit from hyperspace was anything but graceful. Leia gripped the arms of her co-pilot's chair, glad that Han had finally installed one that accommodated her slight build. Behind her, she could hear C-3PO rattling. "'Oh, my!' the golden droid exclaimed, shifting unsteadily on his feet to try to keep his balance. "'I hope we haven't hit anything.' Han flicked a couple of switches. Then, when that obviously failed, he leaned back in his seat and kicked the base of the console. A few seconds later, their trajectory flattened out. "'Sorry about that, folks,' he said to no one in particular. "'Normal services have been resumed.' Leia rolled her eyes and glanced back at Tahiri. The young Jedi sat stoically in her seat, her stare fixed at a point outside the cockpit canopy. Throughout the journey, she had remained quiet and unresponsive to any attempts at conversation, her thoughts focused firmly inward. Leia hadn't pressed her. She sensed that some complicated healing process was taking place in the girl, and she was reluctant to disturb it. Nevertheless, there were times when she felt that a more direct approach might be appropriate, especially those times when Tahiri's brooding silences went on for hours at a stretch, never seeming to end. Tahiri's blackout on Galantos had been a startling setback, occurring at a time when Leia had believed that Tahiri could be on the mend. Still, there could be no faulting her reactions when she'd woken up. Without her well-honed Jedi instincts, they might not have reached orbit when they did or, indeed, made contact with the mysterious Rin who had helped them escape. Leia inwardly sighed. Whatever was going on inside Tahiri, it was frustratingly inconsistent. The subspace receiver bleeped. Leia glanced at the scopes and opened the line. Captain Main's voice issued from the comm speakers. Falcon, I await your instructions. Glad you could join us, Salonia she said. Have a nice trip? As pleasant a stroll as one can expect through hyperspace. Leia smiled at the captain's remark as she surveyed the planet before them. Bakara was a beautiful blue-green world known for its agricultural and repulsor lift exports. Its two moons had been heavily mined for materials used in the manufacture of the second Death Star. It was also right on the edge of the galaxy, diametrically opposite the corridor of worlds that had first fallen victim to the Yuzhan Vong invasion. From Bonadon to Bakara via Bathawi was an old saying that suggested it was easier to get from the corporate sector to Bakara via a wide detour to Bothan space than it was to go straight through the core, with its dense overlap of mass shadows and treacherous hyperspace lanes. It also connected three high-tech but otherwise very different industrialized worlds. Where Bonadon was a desertified wasteland, Bakara was still verdant and pastoral, on the other end of the spectrum of environmental degradation. Belkaden, the first world attacked by the Yuzhan Vong and one of Bonadon's relative neighbors, was in a spectrum of its own, its biosphere modified to suit the aliens' introduced biological factories. Leia hoped she never saw the day when such degradation stretched from one side of the galaxy to the other linking all the worlds she knew in a terrible web of pain and sacrifice. If the day ever arrived when Shimra ruled over Bakra, then she would know that the end had truly come. For now, though, it still looked peaceful enough. Numerous satellites orbited the planet, and she imagined that it wouldn't be long before someone detected and hailed the Falcon and Pride of Salonia. Assuming that normal procedures were still being followed— all entries into the system were closely monitored. The Bakaran government was constantly alert for another Cyruvi invasion. After the first attempt twenty-five standard years before, four destroyers and cruisers, intruder, watchkeeper, sentinel, and defender, had been specifically constructed and installed to guard the system. Two of them, watchkeeper and the task force flagship intruder, had been destroyed when co-opted into service to the New Republic at Salonia and Centerpoint. That left only Defender and Sentinel to hold the fort. Bring back any memories, Leia? 
Han asked with a crooked grin as his hand reached out to squeeze hers briefly. She returned his smile but didn't respond directly. They had visited Bakara very early in their relationship. Under other circumstances, she might have let herself enjoy the reminder of those headier days. Stand ready, Salonia, she told me. See if you can raise the planetary network. Don't identify us. Use Salonia's registration codes. Maine responded in the affirmative, and Leia switched to another frequency. Twin Sun One, maintain formation unless ordered otherwise. Understood. Jaina's voice came briskly from the cockpit of her X-Wing. The remaining fighters of Twin Suns surrounded the two command vessels in a flattened dodecahedron, missing one point. Do you sense anything, Jaina? Leia asked her daughter. Nothing out of the ordinary. What about you, Tahiri? Huh? The young Jedi snapped out of some deep thought. I'm sorry, what? I asked if you were picking up anything unusual through the Force, Leia said. Oh, no. Nothing yet, anyway. Tahiri closed her eyes as she sent her mind reaching out through space, seeking any echoes of the people on and around Bakara. Tahiri's looking now, Leia told Jaina. There was a slight but meaningful pause from Jaina's end. Leia had noticed a definite reserve growing between Jaina and Tahiri, but she'd had no opportunity to discuss it with her yet. The present arrangement with Gina on duty more often than not and rarely aboard the Falcon, meant that there was simply no time to be alone together. If something had happened to get in the way of the friendship between the two young women, Leia had no idea what it was. Okay, Gina finally said. We'll keep our sensors peeled. Han brought the Millennium Falcon around along a broad arc designed to to end quite clearly in orbital insertion. Leia wanted no ambiguity that they were on a peaceful mission, despite their military escort. After the Rin's vague hints, she wasn't taking any chances. She opened a line to Salonia again. Any word yet, Captain? Nothing, Main replied. We're picking up some light chatter, but not much else. There are a large number of vessels in parking orbit or in station docks. Most of them just look like freighters. No launches? None detected? Leia considered this for a moment. Keep hailing them, she said shortly. They must be ignoring us or simply not noticing us. Either way, they won't be able to keep it up much longer. Let's just stick to our course and see what happens. And be ready for anything. Understood. Leia turned to Han. He sat in silence beside her, his brow pinched with worry. You okay? He looked at her and cocked one eyebrow. Do I really need to say it? he asked. She shook her head and sighed. He didn't need to tell her that he had a bad feeling about this. She could feel something was wrong, too. But without evidence, she had no reason to act any way other than normal. Finally, the subspace channel crackled, and a response came in. Salonium, this is General Panib of the Bakaran Defense Fleet. Please state your intentions. Leia remembered a Captain Grell Panib from an earlier visit to Bakara. She imagined it was probably the same person. A short, stiff-backed redhead, he'd had all the social graces of a hungry Wookiee. Maine ignored the request. We're allies, Captain, looking for a docking vector. I'm sorry, Salonia, but we're going to need more detail before we can give you one. Of all the— Han muttered. It's a perfectly reasonable request, the general went on, his voice taut with attention Leia couldn't immediately fathom. There has been no notification of you coming. General Panib, this is Leia Organa Solo, she interrupted before Han could explode. 
We have come to your planet on a diplomatic mission. We would have notified you in advance, but communications have been unreliable around here of late. There was some hesitation from the general. I appreciate what you are saying. There have indeed been problems with the communications networks. Nevertheless, I must insist that you now state your intentions for coming here. Hey, how about you drop the attitude? Han responded hotly. We're the guys who saved your skins from the Sairuk a while back, remember? I remember. I recognized that beat-up old freighter the moment I saw her. Lay hid a worried smile as she watched her husband bite down on an indignant retort. But things aren't so simple anymore, Ponib went on. We have something of a situation here at the moment. What kind of situation? Leia asked. You're not welcome here. A new voice crackled over the restricted comlink frequency. Go steal someone else's ships. What? Han exclaimed. It was clear this time that he didn't intend to hold back. His face reddened as he leaned forward to speak into the commune. Listen, you. Wait, Han. Leia cut him off. He looked at her with an incensed frown, but did as she asked. General Ponib, is this person speaking with your authority? Certainly not, the general responded, spluttering and whoever it is shall be court-martialed as soon as— You can't court-martial everyone, General, the intruder mocked. He had distorted his voice to mask his identity. You can't silence the truth indefinitely. When I find out who is responsible for this, the General blustered, I swear that I shall have you— The truth? Leia broke in. And just what is the truth? There is nothing to discuss here. The general's voice was rising as he lost control of the situation. We don't need you meddling in our affairs. We aren't here to meddle, Leia defended quickly, although I will admit that we are concerned about your affairs. I believe you are in great danger, General. People masquerading as allies may have recently contacted you. I can assure you that they are not what they seem. Whereas you are, I suppose— this came from the person who had broken into the conversation, his voice dripping with derision. At least they don't pay lip service to the idea of an alliance, while eroding our defenses and leaving us open to attack. Leia bridled at this. We have never abandoned our allies. Like you never abandoned Dantooine and Ithor? The stranger shot back. Or Duro, or, or Tina, or— Cold fury welled up in her. Every planet lost cuts us deeply. Every life lost cuts us deeper. I must apologize, Princess, Ponib said anxiously. The general's tone had changed dramatically from a few minutes earlier, and he sounded genuinely apologetic. We are doing our best to find the source of the transmission. I'm sorry, too, Princess came the distorted voice of the intruder. But I'm afraid that the time has come to find ourselves some new allies. Uh-oh, Han said from Leia's side, his eyes scanning the display in front of him. What is it? she asked. Sentinel's launching bay's just opened, he said, shaking his head ominously. He pointed at the screen. Issuing from the launching bays of the cruiser Sentinel was a swarm of Cyruvi battle droids coming directly for them. Whatever it was we came to stop, I think we might be too late. Uncle Luke, look! Jason guided his uncle into the double mind of one of the nearby Krizlaws. He had used the force to cloud the brighter, more intense mind, but still the creature kept on coming. Somehow, the more doltish mind was enough to coordinate the body while the higher mind was elsewhere. And exactly how is this supposed to help us, Jason? Luke asked. Look closer, Jason pressed. We're not dealing with single creatures here. They're symbionts. Two creatures combined? Luke said dubiously. I don't see how that— 
But then suddenly, he did see. The higher, brighter mind of the creature belonged to the rider, and was the directing intelligence. It gave the orders that the body then carried out, no matter how wounded. The lower mind belonged to the body, which could keep going even with the higher mind disabled. Jason's theory certainly fit the evidence, and he was intuitively better at understanding animals than Luke was. But if he was right, then the lower mind should be more easily startled by pain. And if that was the case, why hadn't the one in which Jason had disabled the higher mind simply run away from Stalgis's blaster fire? He soon found out. The writing intelligences were ferocious killers, crudely intelligent but not open to reason. Trained to hunt, not to discuss differences, the pack would keep coming as long as some of the riders remained to keep the lower minds in check. Following Jason's lead, Luke sent his mind into another of the Krizlaws and clouded its controlling intelligence. It, too, continued to obey its higher mind's final instructions, snapping hungrily at the four people along with the rest of the pack. Luke and his nephew continued around the circle of beasts, one by one, confusing their higher minds. It was only after they had disabled the sixth creature that there was a noticeable change in behavior. The pack became less orderly, less focused, while their baying became more unsettled and aggressive. Luke could feel a note of alarm entering the remaining higher minds as the thoughts of those around them descended back to their natural, animalistic states. As fascinating as it might have been to observe, though, it wasn't helping the landing party. Two of the enraged creatures rushed the group and were repelled by the combined blaster fire from Stalgis and the injured stormtrooper. One of the Krizlaws collapsed with a yelp and a whimper at their feet. The other, having taken a blaster bolt to the throat, leapt away, spitting blood. Barely a second had passed when another attacked from the far side. Luke took this one out himself, stepping forward a single pace, as he brought his lightsaber up in a glowing arc, stabbing at the beast's soft pink underside. It fell to the ground, but he hadn't killed it. The jaws of the alien continued to snap at Hegarty's feet as it scrambled relentlessly toward her. Stalgis brought the nozzle of his rifle around and placed a precise blaster shot into the side of the Krizlaw's head to finish it off. Two more attacked them uncoordinated and clumsy, and Luke felt his world contract into a furious concentration of teeth and glowing red eyes, with bright flashes of energy, blade and bolt, adding a surreal counterpoint to the proceedings. Another Krizlaw lunged, extendable mouth open to engulf him. He swung his lightsaber again, this time with more force, using the thought of Mara and Ben to strengthen his resolve to stay alive. The blade cut through the creature's forelimbs, but it wasn't enough to halt its movement through the air. It connected solidly with Luke's chest, knocking him to the ground. Its huge, slavering jaws were suddenly centimeters from his face. Before he'd had the chance to bring his lightsaber up to defend himself, five blasts sounded from nearby, each one striking the alien's head. Mucus and blood splashed Luke's face, and the Krizla fell heavily to one side. He would have liked to offer his thanks to the stormtrooper who'd fired the shot, but he had already turned his attention to the other creatures attacking them. There wasn't time to be grateful. Luke climbed to his feet, bringing his lightsaber to bear in anticipation of the next onslaught. But there was none. All of the Krizlaws suddenly recoiled, each emitting a sound that was so high-pitched it hurt his ears. He remained in a defensive stance, dumbstruck, his blade still held in front of him, waiting for the attack that refused to happen. Around him, the air was thick with confused animal thoughts as the Krizlaws wheeled and fled, scrambling and leaping in an uncontrolled, chaotic mass for the lip of the plateau. Mystified, Luke turned to check the others. Stalgis had a cut to his forehead. The stormtrooper was bleeding steadily from a bite to his shoulder. Hagerty was unharmed. Jason favored his right leg as he snapped off his lightsaber and turned to face them, a look of satisfaction on his face. "'You're doing, I presume?' Luke asked. "'I managed to get a handle on the lower mines,' Jason explained. "'Finally. Once we'd knocked out enough of the riders, they were unable to assert themselves. 
The pack was frightened of us and took the first opportunity to get away. Is the pack a group mind, do you think? Hegarty asked, clearly intrigued by the idea. Yes, with a fixed number of components forming a stable configuration, Jason added. Of course, Hegarty said. There were always eleven of them. They probably evolved that way, and the creatures controlling them now simply took advantage of the configuration. And that's how they knew when some of their number had been killed, Jason said. Whenever a vacancy was created in the group, there was always another Krizlaw to fill it, with the new ones automatically knowing as much as the others in the meld. Luke nodded in agreement. It made sense. Now was not the time to be discussing it, though. We should get to the shuttle while we still can, he said. I'd rather not hang around and wait for the chief to put together another group, this time with controlling intelligences intact. They did as he suggested, with Hegarty taking the lead. Stalgis assisted his injured comrade while Jason and Luke brought up the rear. Good work, he told his nephew as they walked, and timely, too. I don't know how much longer we could have held them off. Jason nodded, his expression one of simultaneous relief and pride. I had to do something. I couldn't let us be taken down by a pack of animals. Never underestimate the power of the animal, Luke said soberly. Sheer numbers can overwhelm the best of tactics. Along with not having any fear of death, it's possibly the most powerful weapon an enemy can have. They reached the landing ramp with no further incidents, although the baying of Krizlaws was a constant and eerie reminder of why they should get off this planet and never look back. Luke helped the injured stormtrooper into the shuttle and onto one of the craft's small cots. Stalgis followed close behind, grabbing a med pack on the way. He's going to have to be examined thoroughly, Hagerty said speaking to the others in a hushed tone so that the stormtrooper wouldn't hear. That force-feeding he received could be dangerous. He seems okay now, Jason said, apart from the shoulder wound. I think Dr. Hegarty is more concerned about internal injuries, Luke said, glancing over to where Stalgis was administering treatment to the injured trooper. Now that the fight was over, he certainly looked paler and weaker than he had outside. Hagerty nodded. We'll need to warn Widowmaker that he might require immediate surgery, as well as decontamination. But why? Jason asked. You said the Krizlaws are symbionts, she explained. But symbionts with what, exactly? Some other species, I guess, he said. The doctor nodded again. Remember the missing Jostrans? Jason blanched as Hagerty's point hit home. You don't really think? She shrugged. Maybe they're not missing after all. We'll let Techley know, Luke said with a sinking feeling in his stomach that was nothing compared to what the stormtrooper would feel if he learned of their suspicions. He filed through the cabin while the others took seats preparatory for launch, his thoughts turning over the whole Krizlaw Jostrin affair. It all seemed to make sense now, as things often did in retrospect. The passage of Zonama Seacoat through the system must have destabilized the local environment enough to encourage a warlike clan or subspecies of Jostrans to take over the Krizlaws, giving them a competitive edge. Zonama Seacoat had been responsible for helping that particular clan, but it had been at the cost of the previous Jostran civilization. The pilot lifted off just as Luke reached the cockpit. He strapped himself in, watching the ground scanner as he did so. Another group of Krizlaw Jostrans was converging on the shuttle, and he silently gave thanks that they were no longer out there fighting. It would only have been a matter of time before they would have fallen to the creatures. Luke was grateful that the shuttle offered no parting shots as it swept a comfortable distance over the heads of the eleven snapping aliens. Once upon a time, the gunners aboard this craft might have strafed them as they launched, but Luke had repeatedly emphasized that their mission was a peaceful one, and that there would be no unnecessary loss of life, human or otherwise. Thus far, 
the Imperials had accepted his terms happily enough, with Captain Yage and Lieutenant Stalgis backing him up. Many of the crew, Stalgis included, had friends or family who were still alive because of the actions of the Galactic Federation of Free Alliances around Orinda. Nevertheless, there was a definite undercurrent of resentment. To some, he would never be anything more than the rebel boy who was responsible for the death of Emperor Palpatine. But regardless of their feelings toward him, he would never let their disrespect undermine his confidence or authority. He turned away from the thoughts, settling back into his seat as the shuttle sped skyward, leaving Manali Mafir behind him. He was relieved to be going home or to the closest thing to whom they had, anyway. Hail Jade Shadow, he instructed the censor officer. To Luke's surprise, Danny Quee took the call. I gather you had some trouble with the locals, the young scientist said. An argument over dinner, that's all. Is Mara there? She's tied up at the moment, but she says not to worry. Can I pass on a message? No, that's okay. But tell Techley to take a shuttle over to Widowmaker. We have a patient for her. Who's injured? She asked quickly. Luke could tell without her having to say anything that she was worried it might be Jason. A stormtrooper, he explained briefly. It's not so much that he's injured. He fought for the right word. He's just... infected, I guess. I'll warn Techley to be ready. Did you learn anything useful about Zonama Seacoat? It's been here, as we thought, but not for many years. Another hit and run? I'm afraid so. If we only knew what it was looking for, it would certainly improve our chances of finding it. It's a big galaxy, Danny agreed. Excuse me, sir, the pilot interrupted. You've got a communication coming in. Sorry, Danny. Got to go. Luke thanked the censor officer and moved forward to where the hollow display rested between the two forward seats. In the display he saw the solid figure of Arian Yage, captain of the Imperial frigate Widowmaker, Jade Shadow's official escort through the unknown regions. Her hair was tied back in its usual severe bun and her expression businesslike. "'We have visitors,' she said, wasting no time on pleasantries. Fifteen minutes ago, a chess corvette and two full squadrons of clawcraft entered the system. They are on a high-powered approach vector, clearly intending to lock onto our orbit. Communications? None as yet, although we hailed them as soon as they appeared on the scopes. I've put the squadron on full alert. How long until they come within range? Approximately thirty minutes. I'll make sure we're back by then, Luke said. Keep an eye on them, Captain, and keep me informed. Yage's image nodded and fizzed out. Then Luke sank wearily back into his seat. Two Chiss squadrons were more than a match for a dozen Imperial TIE fighters. But Jade Shadow with Mara at the controls was worth an entire squadron on its own. If it came to a fight, they would be evenly matched. He just hoped it didn't come to that. The last time he and Mara had entered Chiss space, in Thrawn's day, their dealings had been conducted amicably, if cautiously. Fatigue washed through him, and he tapped the force to sweep it away. He was tired of fighting, yes, but he wasn't about to give up. Besides, there was nothing yet to suggest that the Chiss were looking for a fight. For all he knew, this might be the way they normally approached unidentified vessels found wandering in the unknown regions. The Chiss were efficient and pragmatic, to the point of appearing cold to those unfamiliar with their ways. Until Luke was certain of their intentions, he could do little more than wait. He moved back into the passenger cabin to check on the injured stormtrooper. The man was unconscious. The upper half of his uniform had been removed to enable Stalgis to get at the wound on his shoulder, and there was a sheen to his skin from perspiration. Stalgis was leaning over the stormtrooper, holding a stim shot, a look of concern on his face. He straightened when he saw Luke. He's going down fast, Stalgis said. I don't have the facilities here to check for new poisons, so we're going to need to get him to Widowmaker's medical bay fast. 
Luke motioned Jason to come forward. See if you can hold his vital signs stable. We're moving as quickly as we can, but it might not be enough. His nephew bent down next to the stricken trooper and placed a hand on his forehead. Luke felt waves of healing energy pour off his nephew and into the storm trooper. He placed one hand on Jason's shoulder to lend him strength. Looks like we might have attracted attention to ourselves, Luke whispered to him. What sort of attention? Jason returned equally as softly. Chiss. The trooper's condition worsened steadily as the shuttle roared up toward the orbit occupied by the mission's two central vessels. Luke could feel the man's immune system failing as the invader spread its chemical and genetic tentacles through his body, beating it into submission. Jason didn't suggest using the force to kill it, and Luke knew he wouldn't until the choice between it and the trooper became absolutely clear. Hegarty watched with an expression of concern mixed with intense curiosity. Luke doubted whether the woman could ever not look worried. The lines in her face were permanently etched that way. For the sake of Stalgis, and in case their fear turned out to be unfounded, Luke refrained from asking the doctor if she'd ever seen anything like this before. They'd find out soon enough, or so he hoped anyway. The censor officer stuck his head out of the cockpit. Another communication, sir. Luke returned to the cockpit, leaving Stalgis and Jason to care for the stormtrooper. Gage's hologram was back. We've had a reply, she said. Commander Arolia of the Expansionary Defense Fleet wants to speak to the person in charge. I told her you were on your way back from the surface, but she said she wanted to speak to you immediately. I guess you'd better put me through then, he said. The co-pilot made way for him without having to be asked. Luke straightened his robes as he took the empty seat. Yage's face dissolved from the hollow field in a flicker of static. It was replaced a few seconds later with the image of the upper body of a blue-skinned woman dressed in a burgundy and black uniform. Her eyes were the deep red of her species, and her expression held nothing but blunt authority. Chiss matured quickly, but still Luke was startled by the fact that she looked no older than his niece, Jaina. You are Master Skywalker. Her voice had all the warmth of a droid. Luke nodded curtly and said, I am leader of a peaceful mission from the Galactic Federation of Free Alliances. We are in the middle of an emergency. I lost two of my crew in a ground fight with the natives of the planet below, and a third is seriously injured. If we don't get back to orbit in time, he'll die. Your arrival into this system has put my squadron on full alert, and means our docking procedures will be that much more complicated. If I should lose another because of your interference, I will be extremely— Please do not threaten us, Skywalker. The Chiss woman responded calmly, staring unblinking from the flickering hollow field. Our intention is not to impede your docking procedures, or any other of your procedures. I require only that you meet with me in person at the earliest possible convenience. Of course, Luke said. We'll arrange it as soon as I return to the Widowmaker. When or how you arrange it is irrelevant. Know, however, that I will not remain in this system for long. Comply with my request or face the consequences. The image winked out. Well, you heard the commander? Luke said to the pilot, who had watched the show with interest. I guess we'd better get moving. All X-Wings, came Jaina's voice over the subspace combat channel. Lock S-foils in attack position. Clawcraft, arm and target approaching vessels. Battle plan A-7. Copy that. Jag returned on behalf of Twin Sun's Chiss pilots. Leia watched as the formation of fighters split into three groups, two pairs in a triplet, Galactic Alliance and Chiss fighters flying alongside each other with perfect precision. The calm command in her daughter's voice made her proud. No matter how surprised by the sudden attack Jaina must have been, she didn't let it show. Neither was there any suggestion of concern for the fact that her squadron 
hadn't had any experience in combat against Cyruvi fighters. Any sign of composure that General Panib had displayed earlier now evaporated totally in the face of this abrupt turnabout of events. Please, wait, he urged frantically. There's been a terrible misunderstanding. You bet there has, Han said. One we intend to clear up for you very shortly. Those ships belong to the enemy, and we'll knock them out of your skies if they come anywhere near us. You got that? More launches, Leia said registering fighters coming from Defender. A-wings and B-wings this time, not Cyruk. Han glanced at the scanner board. Those had better be coming to help us, Ponib. Falcon, I beseech you not to order your ships to open fire. All semblance of calm had left the general's voice. Only panic remained. All these ships comprise a peaceful envoy to ensure your safe passage to orbit. All of them? Han snorted. Yeah, right. If entecking humans and using them to fly those fighters heading our way constitutes peaceful behavior, then I don't think we're speaking the same language. Those fighters have precisely thirty seconds to turn around before we start opening fire. Han, look at this, Leia said, studying the display before her. It showed one of the Cyruvi vessels up close. The image was fuzzy, but clear enough to make out some details. Do those engine housings look familiar to you? Han frowned at the image. What about them? They look an awful lot like ion jets to me. So, since when did the Sai Rook start using standard engines on their fighters? What are you saying, Leia? That there's more here than meets the eye, she said. You'll note also that our transmissions are not being jammed. Han's frown deepened as his instincts conflicted with what Leia was suggesting. It has to be a trick, he said, shaking his head. They want us to drop our guard. Leia wasn't convinced. It doesn't add up, Han. If they really wanted to do that, then why not just let us land first and then attack us? She could almost see the thoughts behind his eyes racing through his mind. What if Panib was telling the truth? A mistake could be extremely costly. Then there was the matter of the mysterious intruder on the secure comm channels. He had been silent since the Cyruvi vessels had launched. If their intentions had been to stir things up between Panib and the visitors, in order to ensure the worst possible reception of the alien fighters, then they had certainly succeeded. The pirates of those ships aren't human, Tahiri said breaking into the discussion softly. Leia turned to face the young Jedi. The girl's eyes were still closed, as though meditating. They're definitely alien, and... She hesitated for a second, then her eyes flickered open. Everyone's heard the stories about the Sai Rook, and how awful entechment is. It's supposed to be agony, right? Leia nodded still remembering the look on Luke's face when he had been rescued from the mighty Cyruvi vessel in which he'd been held captive years ago. Exposure to the perverted entechment technology and to the life energy forcibly removed from those taken captive in battle with Bakara had touched him profoundly. Well, these minds aren't suffering, Tahiri said. They're clean. What are they, then? Han asked. I don't know, Tahiri said. I've never touched minds like these before. When Leia stretched out her senses, she, too, could detect no trace of anything malevolent in the approaching fighters. I don't care if their minds are as serene as Alderanian snow, Han growled. They're still attacking us. Are they? Leia asked. It was all too easy to assume. We don't want to start a war by accident. Not if there's an alternative. And what if you're wrong, Leia? I don't want them to end up using Jaina as target practice out there. Nor do I, Han. She touched his hand in reassurance, then spoke on the secure subspace comlink to the squadron. Twin sons, fall back to flank Salonia and Falcon. You are instructed not to fire unless we are fired upon. Understood? Understood, Falcon. Apart from the slight hesitation in Jaina's voice, the order was accepted and acted upon immediately. 
In the face of the rapidly approaching swarm of Cyruvi fighters, the combined Chiss and Galactic Alliance squadron peeled away and swooped back to cover their command vessels. Han squirmed in his seat but didn't say anything more. Leia shifted uneasily in her seat also. She felt reasonably confident that she was doing the right thing, but she couldn't help feeling nervous at the same time. The last time she had come face to face with Cyruvi fighters had been on a war footing. She remembered the strength of the fighters' shields and their maneuverability in dogfights. And perhaps more vividly, she remembered how the alien capital vessels would collect survivors with their trooper scoopers in order to suck out their life energies and hurl them back at their former allies. Gunner standing by, announced Captain Maynon Salonia as the fighters came within range. Leia held her breath. On the scanner board, she saw the alien fighters break formation and scatter to adopt a defensive wall around the incoming vessels, just as an escort would do. No shots were fired, and they stayed a discreet distance from both Falcon and Salonia. When the second contingent of ships arrived, the A-wings and B-wings slotted into the existing pattern with only a small amount of jostling. She exhaled with a heavy sigh. Thank the Maker, C-3PO said from behind her. You can say that again, Goldenrod. Han leaned forward to trim the Falcon's course slightly, a motion designed to disguise the relief he was feeling. Leia knew. We're not out of the woods yet. In case nobody has noticed, we're now effectively caught. But at least we didn't start a war, Leia said. And this way, we just might get some answers. What if we don't like what we hear? her husband asked wryly. Leia shrugged. We'll deal with that as it happens. Han turned to the comm. Panib, who had been frantically trying to attract their attention over the subspace channel, sounded like he was going to sob with relief. Thank you, Falcon. You won't regret this. We'll reserve judgment on that until we hear what's going on, Han said. I understand. The general responded. But first I must once again ask that you state your intentions. Han put a weary hand to his forehead. Leia gave in. We'd like to sit down at Salus Dar, she said, and meet with Prime Minister Kundertal. I'm afraid that won't be possible, Ponib said. The Prime Minister is unable to meet with anyone at the moment. I don't understand, General, Leia said. Why? Bakura is currently operating under martial law, he explained without allowing her to finish her question. I shall be in charge until the crisis is over. Then perhaps we should meet with you, Leia said. Whatever this crisis is, I'm sure we can do something to help you out of it. Your help would indeed be welcome, the general said, although he didn't sound overly enthusiastic. However, Salus Dar is unsafe for you at the moment. Dock with Sentinel and I shall take a shuttle to meet you within the hour. I'll explain everything then. Understood, Han said. Leia noted the look of skepticism on his face. Just don't try and tell us that the Cyruk are now the good guys, though, because I can tell you now we won't believe you. Not the Cyruk, Panib said. The Pwek. Realization dawned, then, for Leia, and from Han's face she could tell it had for him, too. Okay, General, she said. We'll see you within the hour. The calm went dead. The Prek, Tahiri repeated. Weren't they the slaves of the Cyruk? They were indeed, Leia said. But how? I guess that's what we're about to learn, Han said the tension in his posture already easing. He reached forward to punch a new course into the Falcon's command board. In the meantime, let's show these reptoids how to fly. Leia relayed the situation to Captain Maine as Han sent the Falcon streaking toward Sentinel. While she could understand his readiness to accept the immediately obvious explanation, she preferred to reserve judgment until she'd heard what Panib had to say. Nothing she knew, was ever quite as simple as it seemed.
Only by force of will was Jason able to hold on to the contents of his stomach as he watched Tackley operate on the injured stormtrooper. The man lay face down on the operating table, naked to the waist and fed by numerous intravenous drips and tubes. They had barely reached the Widowmaker's medical bay in time. Had it not been for Luke and himself propping up the trooper's defenses with large amounts of the Force, the alien invader would have probably overtaken his immune system completely and effectively killed him. As it was, Saba Sebatine still had to strengthen the stormtrooper while Tekli tried to isolate the organism, carefully cutting through and around delicate tissues with her vibroscalpel. It was difficult and dangerous work, but after almost forty-five minutes of painstaking surgery, Tekli seemed to have finally exposed the problem. The centipede-like creature the stormtrooper had been force-fed on Manlali Mathir had turned out not to be a meal at all, but rather, as Hegarty had suspected, an uninvited guest. The juvenile Jostron had survived the acids in the man's stomach long enough to burrow its way into his abdominal cavity and locate his spine. Once there, it had used the tips of its many legs to infiltrate nerves and tunnel into his spinal column. It had been working its way up to his skull, gradually taking over his body as it went. Techley had caught it at the very top of the man's spine just as it was about to invade his brain pan. Its central body had already sent dozens of hair-like tendrils snaking into delicate neural tissues, and these were making extraction exceedingly difficult. Techley didn't doubt that the creature had numerous defense mechanisms designed to discourage removal. The filaments could physically damage nerve cells during extraction, or they could excrete any number of chemicals designed to kill as much tissue as possible around themselves. Only with the help of Jason was she able, strand by strand, to finally save the stormtrooper from a horrible fate. Jason attuned his mind to that of the Jostron and kept it docile while Techley worked, finding it much easier when it was on its own, rather than in a pack of eleven. Jason couldn't shake the ghastly thought of what might have happened, as Techley scooped up the wriggling body of the alien and dropped it into a tissue sample container. Hair-thin tendrils trailed it like roots from a plant. "'Well done, my friend,' he said. "'Master Silgal would be proud of you.' "'Thank you, Jason,' Techley said, stepping back from the table and removing her gloves, leaving a medical droid to suture the patient's wound. "'But perhaps we should save congratulations until the anesthetic wears off.' The Chadrafan's ears were limp with fatigue, and her fur appeared dull. It was clear that the intense concentration required for the operation had taken a lot out of her. You're exhausted, Jason said. She nodded. I feel as tired as you look. Jason acknowledged the comment with a tight smile. He hadn't had time to change from the gear he'd worn on Manali Mafir. He'd only had time to wash the dirt and sweat off his face and hands. In all, he suspected he looked as exhausted as he felt. They left the patient in the care of Imperial Meditex. Outside the surgery, they met Lieutenant Stalgis, waiting in the narrow corridor. He had removed his helmet, revealing a long, lined face that suggested an age much older than his thirty or so years. But, like Jason, he hadn't had time to fully refresh himself yet. How is he? He's fine, Jason reassured him. He just needs time to recover from the surgery. The thing. The jostron. Stalgis's face contorted into a look of revulsion. Has it... It's been removed. Relief rolled off the lieutenant in waves. I can't tell you how grateful I am. To both of you. Tarl is a friend, as well as a member of my ground team. If he had died... If we hadn't made it back in time... Stalgis gesticulated for lack of words. Jason placed a hand on the armor plating of the man's upper arm. We were glad to help, but I suggest you get some rest now. Your friend is going to need you when he wakes. Stalgis nodded almost formally and strode off up the hallway. Perhaps you should listen to your own advice, Solo. Jason turned to find Danny Quee standing behind him. She was smiling but there was no mistaking the concern underlying it. I'm okay. You're tired, she said, her green eyes flashing at him. 
and don't even try to deny it. A touch on the back of his hand signaled Techley's departure. He sent a wave of gratitude to the Chadrafan through the force, then devoted all his attention to Danny. She stood before him wearing a standard Jedi expeditionary suit with her arms folded across her breasts. Her blonde, curly hair had been cut to her shoulders. It's true, he admitted, stepping closer. I am tired. In fact, I'd give anything right now to be able to curl up on my bunk and sleep for a day or two. Not even an attempted denial, she said. I'm impressed, Jason. Unfortunately, there won't be time for you to sleep. You're wanted on the bridge now. Momentary alarm welled up in him, but he pushed it back down. Is anything wrong? Nothing that can't wait ten minutes for you to clean up. Is it the chiss? he pressed. In ten minutes, you'll have all the answers you need. But if you were to meet Commander Erolio looking like this, it would probably be taken as a declaration of war. She's not letting us proceed? Danny continued to evade his questions. Illegal use of biological weapons is something? At least give me a hint. Cruel and unusual punishment. All right, all right. Smiling and feeling energized by the brief exchange, they walked along the narrow corridor of the Imperial frigate to the cabin he'd been assigned. Tell Uncle Luke I'll be there shortly. That's what comlinks are for. Her expression was mock indignant, but turned into a smile as she turned and headed off for the bridge. The planet is a legend, Commander Erolia said. Her youthful features were set in stubborn, self-assured lines. I cannot believe that finding it is your true objective. I assure you that it's much more than a legend, Master Skywalker said. Saba was amazed at his self-control. She knew that he was exhausted and irritated, but all he allowed his face to display was calm and patience. We have evidence that it once existed. The only question is whether it still exists today. What evidence is this? We were told about Zonama Seacoat by Verger, a Jedi Knight from Verger. Erolia's eyebrows shot up at the name. The same Verger who sabotaged the Alpha Red Initiative. Master Skywalker didn't flinch from the truth. The Verger who prevented genocide the likes of which this galaxy has never seen? Yes. The commander's exhalation had a mocking bite. You expect me to trust her testimony? No one is forcing you to accept anything, Captain Yates said, clearly annoyed by the Chiss commander's mockery. We only want to go about our business, that's all. But what is your business? That's what I am attempting to determine. The meeting was being conducted on Widowmaker's Bridge in full view of the crew. Erolia carried herself as though it was her own ship and her own crew. Her tone and poise displayed nothing but self-assurance. Saba knew that. Should anything happen to the Chiss officer or the small contingent of guards that had escorted her across, then there would be dire consequences for Master Skywalker and his expedition. What's more, Erolia knew that they knew, and that, presumably, was why she was so confident. Saba wasn't an expert on humanoid appearances, but she imagined that the Chiss commander would have been regarded as quite striking among her own people. Her face was narrow and angular, her blue skin smooth and soft-looking. Her wide red eyes contained both character and intelligence, and upon entering the meeting had quickly scanned everyone on the bridge. She didn't doubt that the woman's evaluation of them would have been equally as brisk. All we ask, Luke said, is for the freedom to look. Erolia paced three steps to her left, contemplating his words. This is our territory, she said. You do realize that? We recognize your authority over regions near here, yes. But we weren't aware that the expansionary defense fleet had specifically annexed this system. If I were to tell you that we have, would you leave? We are a peaceful expedition, Luke said. Would you bar a trading mission from your territory? Or a scientific team? The commander laughed. Don't try to fool me, Skywalker. You're no more a traitor than I am. 
And as for your motives being scientific, I ask this of you. Were you to find this planet, what exactly would you do with it? A new voice spoke up from behind them when Luke hesitated. It is our hope that Zonama Seacoat will help us in our war effort, and in doing so save trillions of lives, including your own. Commander Erolia turned her attention to Jason Solo, who had just entered the room. Then your intentions are clearly not scientific, but rather military. So why should we allow you to pursue such objectives when you so readily interfere with our own? Alpha Red wouldn't have won the war, Luke said calmly. It would have turned us all into monsters. That's the war I'm talking about, Jason said, stepping down into the center of the circular bridge to join the others. The war against ourselves. Erolia took a long moment to consider this. It surprises me to see Imperials and the New Republic working alongside each other, she said finally. We are no longer referred to as the New Republic, Luke said. We have a new name now, the Galactic Federation of Free Alliances. And the Empire has freely joined this alliance, Erolia asked, glancing at Yage. It has, the captain said. I suppose the Chiss are welcome to join, too. Luke seemed unfazed by the commander's sarcasm. The decision would be yours. But yes, you would indeed be welcome to join in due course. Irulia snorted derisively, but didn't address the Jedi Master's comment. Instead, she said, What concerns me the most here, I think, is the makeup of your senior crew. Master Skywalker shrugged. I have already explained that the military contingent is purely defensive. That might indeed be true, but the intention lies in its leaders. Mara Jade Skywalker, Luke Skywalker, Jason Solo, all renowned Jedi warriors. Danny Kui is an accomplished scientist, Jason pointed out. Yes, I recognize that name. And Soren Hegarty we know, of course. They fit in with your stated aims. Danny looked both startled and flattered to be recognized. Hegarty, on the other hand, showed no reaction at all. But you also have a Barabel among you, Erolia continued. How does it fit in? Saba stiffened. She is a Jedi Knight, Luke said. Another warrior, then? Not in the sense that you mean. Really? Most reptilian species I've ever met have been aggressive and predatory. Saba's tail thumped the floor. She couldn't help it. Captain Yage took a step forward at this. Tell me, Commander, how would you feel if I were to tell you that most Chiss I've met have been arrogant and condescending? Luke signaled for patience. Saba is life-sensitive. We hope that she will detect Zonama Seacoat by its force emissions when we are near it. Have you had any luck so far in this? Not yet. That's why we need to keep searching. Erolia nodded after some thought. Very well, Master Skywalker. I will agree to this only because we, too, would like to see this war brought to an end. She signaled to her bodyguards, who handed her a flat, rectangular package about the same size as her outstretched hand. This memory disk contains authority codes and routes sufficient to get you to Scylla. They will remain active for one week. In that time you must present yourself in person to obtain permission to travel within our boundaries. Without that permission, any trespass will be regarded as an act of aggression, upon which you will be expelled or destroyed. Do I make myself clear? Luke accepted the disc with a resigned look. Abundantly clear. Then my mission here is complete. Commander Erolia's gaze briefly swept the room. Perhaps we shall all meet again on Scylla. That's all you came here for? Captain Yage asked. To tell us to report to your superiors? Not quite. Erolia answered. I was ordered to give you the disc only if I thought you trustworthy. And if we weren't? 
The chist commander smiled at this, but said nothing in reply. She simply nodded farewell and, with an imperious gesture, ordered her bodyguards to follow her as she strolled from the bridge. Why, that trumped up little again, Luke silenced Captain Yage with a gesture. She's just doing her job, Arian. We can't blame her for that. Nevertheless, I'll be happier when she's off my ship. She turned away to coordinate the disembarkation of the Chiss shuttle. I can understand perfectly where you're coming from, Captain Yage. The hologram broke into static, then cleared to reveal the face of Mara Jade Skywalker at the controls of Jade Shadow. I don't even want that woman on my scopes. You caught all that, Mara? Luke asked, facing the image of his wife in the hollow field. Loud and clear. What gets up my jets, Yage said, is the assumption that we're answerable to them at all. The Empire has been collaborating with the Chiss for years, ever since Thrawn's day. But there's no treaty. We don't owe them anything. Just the idea of having to report our every movement to them makes my hair stand on end. We have to respect that we're in their territory now, Arian, Luke said, and they do things differently than we do. Assuming we are in their territory, Mara said, how about looking at that disc? Jason took it from his uncle and put it into a reader. As Aurelia had promised, it contained roots and security codes, but nothing else. The Chiss were tight-lipped when it came to doling out information. They were lucky to get this much. Thoughts, anyone? Luke asked. Do we plow on regardless, or should we comply with their request and report in? It's your decision, Yage said. Yes, but to reach that decision, I would like to hear everyone's opinion. I don't think there's any great harm in doing what they say, Mara said. Even though it does irk me, I say to the maw with them, Yage put in. They can't tell us what to do. Luke nodded quietly to both women's comments. Jason? We'll need access to their information, his nephew replied. It would make things much simpler. Soren's data is accurate, but doesn't cover more than ten percent of the unknown regions. The xenobiologist had looked slightly bored throughout the political exchange, but seemed to perk up now that she'd been brought into the conversation. The Chiss have been expanding through this section of the galaxy for decades. Irulia clearly knew of the legend of the wandering planet, so it must be common knowledge among her people. I believe access to their data would be invaluable. But would it actually make the difference, do you think? Luke folded his hands in front of him, as he so often did when pondering weighty matters. It certainly might. Hagerty nodded at the map. This small amount of data has already told us something interesting. Note the outer edge of their territory. See how it is held firm against the Yuzhan Vong incursion. They have either developed similar jamming and combat techniques as your own fighters, or the enemy has withdrawn its offensive in order to concentrate on other areas. I would imagine that the answer to this mystery would be of interest to your tacticians back home. There was a general murmur of agreement following that observation. The heads of the Galactic Alliance seemed an awfully long way from the unknown regions, but Hegarty, and Aurelia, was quite right. Luke's mission was military, at least in the sense that any information of military value would immediately be added to the war effort. Even though galaxy-wide communications didn't reach into the unknown regions, subspace transmissions could be relayed through an isolated holocom on the edge of Galactic Alliance space. All communications from the mission were relayed to Calomus immediately. Luke nodded. You might be right. But tell me, Saba, have you detected any sign of Zonama Seacoat in this vicinity? If we are hot on its scent, then we might not need to contact the Chiss at all. Saba straightened, her nostrils flaring involuntarily. I sense nothing. If Zonama Seacoat is here, it is well hidden. I thought as much. It's like looking for a droid in a desert. Something's more likely to find us before we find it. 
he nodded again. I'm of the opinion that we should do as Aurelius says, and check in with the local authorities. As Soren said, it couldn't hurt. And, who knows, it might actually help. He glanced around to everyone, as though waiting to see if there were any objections to his decision. When no one spoke up, he said, Okay, then. I'll leave the details of the course with Mara and Arian to prepare. Those of us who just came back from Monlali Mafir will need a break before we take on anything else. Captain Yage smiled. I'm sure you won't get any argument from Dr. Hegarty on that score. The meeting broke up, then, leaving Mara Jade Skywalker and Captain Yage to discuss the finer points of the Chiss map. Luke motioned to Saba, Jason, and Hegarty, and they joined him for a quiet discussion near the bridge's exit. How did Techley get on with the Jostron? was the first thing he asked his nephew. It was touch and go for a while, the young Jedi replied. Another centimeter, and it would have been too late. But she caught it. That's good, the Jedi Master said with a solemn expression. I would have hated to lose someone else. The reminder of the two stormtroopers killed on Manlali Mafir was sobering. This one has examined the data you gathered, Master, Saba said. There is a correlation with the other regions through which Zonama Seacoat is recorded to have passed. The Jostron Krizla symbionts are not technologically advanced, so they do not pose an immediate threat, but they are aggressive by nature. The living planet seems to have exhibited similar avoidance tactics elsewhere. The Krizlaws are certainly aggressive, Luke agreed. That the Jostrans gave them intelligence only made them worse. I wonder, then, could this be what it's running from? After all, we know Zonama Seacoat has a strong presence in the Force. It might be simply trying to hide itself from anything it associates with violence. It is possible, Saba said. There followed a moment of pensive silence. Saba suspected the silence was due more to weariness than anything else. Her sensitive nostrils could smell the exhaustion emanating from the three humans around her, especially Master Skywalker and his nephew. You must rest, she said to them. You will be no good to anyone if you do not. You're quite right, Saba, Luke said. I was just thinking about Diff Scour. He's obviously told his side of the story to the Chiss. Saba nodded. Scour was the head of New Republic Intelligence. He had worked extensively with the Chiss scientists on the virus Alpha Red, which would have completely wiped out the Yuzhan Vong and all their biotechnology had it been brought into play. That the Jedi had put a stop to the plan irked Scour. He might not be above taking steps to thwart the Master's own plans in return. We'll see what's waiting for us at Scylla, Jason said, his gaze drifting to where Danny Quee stood on the far side of the bridge. Forewarned is forearmed, but forearmed can lead to a foregone conclusion, Luke pointed out. We shouldn't jump ahead of ourselves. The last thing we need now is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Just the usual sort, Saba said, hissing with amusement. But as so often happened when she attempted a witticism, nobody laughed. They just looked at her strangely. The first thing Tahiri noticed as she stepped over the threshold into Sentinel was the tension. It was like an overwhelming odor emanating from everything around her. The air, the walls, the floors, the light fittings, even from the people themselves. She winced. It was more a physical reaction to something she was sensing through the Force. What caused it, however, she couldn't tell. She just knew it was there. The second thing she noticed was the briskness of the salute Princess Leia and Han received as they stepped through the airlock. The guards, dressed in dark green uniforms, fairly jumped to attention like wires snapping taut. She didn't think the reaction came from any Palpatine-style discipline, though. Bakara was a peaceful world, with no history of dictators since the last imperial governor, Nereus, had been overthrown during the Cyruvi crisis. More likely, she thought, the guards were reacting to the same tension in the air that she had detected. 
something was making everyone jumpy. A short, stiff-backed man with thinning red hair and a mustache stepped through the lines of Bakarin security guards. Grel Panib, he said by way of introduction, bowing sharply first to Leia, then Han. The rest of the party, herself, Jaina, C-3PO, Leia's Nogri bodyguards, and a small honor guard from Pride of Salonia, were acknowledged with a curt nod. Welcome to Bakara. It's been a while, Han said dryly. You served under Paterthanus, didn't you? Princess Leia didn't miss anything. A glimpse of sadness passed across General Panib's face. You have a fine memory, Princess. We barely met. It was a memorable trip. She smiled as though at some private joke, then introduced the rest of the party. Thank you all for— Panib began, but a commotion from behind the security guards interrupted him. There was the sound of scuffling as someone pushed forward. I told you to wait for me to call you. Not someone, Tahiri thought, her heart suddenly pounding, as, through the tangle of people, she glimpsed a reptilian creature bounding toward them. Something. She instantly drew her lightsaber as the memory of her dreams lifted to emphasize her fears. Tahiri, Tahiri, Tahiri. The godlike lizard creature from her dreams beckoned her. She blinked once, twice, to clear her head as her lightsaber crackled in front of her. A trap, Jaina shouted. She, too, withdrew her lightsaber. At the same time, the stormtroopers raised their blasters and the Nogri guards stepped forward to protect the princess. No. Panib quickly put himself between the reptilian creature and their weapons. His intentions are not hostile. The creature emerged from the line of security guards, its claws skittering piercingly on the corridor floor as it came to a halt behind the general. The alien was a beaked reptile with a long, muscular tail. Its scales were a dull brown, and beneath prominent ridges its golden eyes danced alarmingly. It wore a leathery harness to which were strapped numerous items that could have been either tools or badges of rank. This is Luathin, General Panib said, clearly unsettled by the visitor's reaction. I assure you that— A sudden burst of piercing tones from the creature interrupted him. When it was over, Han pretended to clean out his ear. Did anyone catch that? I did, sir, C-3PO answered, oblivious to the fact that it had been a rhetorical question. He says that he is the advance leader of the Prec Emancipation Movement— and that he welcomes us. He refers to us as allies of the free. Tahiri felt the uncertainty of those around her as more loud fluting sounded from the creature. I mean you no harm, 3PO translated. Well, that makes me feel a whole lot easier, Han said in a tone that suggested the exact opposite. I do apologize for this, Panib said. The Prek are unaccustomed to advanced protocol, human or otherwise. They've only recently thrown off their shackles and started speaking for themselves, as it were. Leia called for everyone to put their weapons away as she eased past the Nogri bodyguards, who parted for her without protest. She stepped up to Luathan, wearing a thin, perhaps nervous, smile. Trepio, tell Luathan that we are pleased to meet him. She instructed the protocol droid. If indeed he is a him. He assures us that he is, Panib said. And there is no need for your droid to act as mediator in your dialogue with him either. He can understand what you're saying perfectly well. We don't like using droids much here, so if you prefer we can supply you with earpiece translators that will do the job equally as well. 3PO bristled at the suggestion that his talents might be unnecessary, or even distasteful. With all due respect, sir, I was designed for precisely this kind of situation. I am fluent in over six million languages, and— What he's saying, General, Leia interrupted, is that we'll get by. Rothen's nostril tongues tasted the air as he followed the exchange. The prek was smaller than an average Cyru 
although not by much. But he was still bigger than the average human. Muscles bunched under his leathery skin, and his thick tail swished back and forth in a regular, easy rhythm. It was an alarming presence, made all the more unsettling when Tahiri looked up into the creature's face to find his three-lidded amber eyes staring out at her, almost as if reading her reservations. She knew that Leia had instructed everyone to lower their weapons, but Tahiri found her thumb still hovering over the activation stud of her lightsaber. You bring Jedi Knights, Lothan sang through C-3PO. I had hoped to meet one. The lightsaber is a delightful weapon, an elegant blend of life energy and material design. Our divergent technologies become one in such devices. Leia's cautious attitude became markedly frostier. You still use entackment? Panib stepped forward again. I don't think this is either the time or the place for such involved discussions. Perhaps we should move to surroundings more comfortable for all species. Yes? We're not going anywhere until Leia gets an answer, Han said, his hand back on his blaster. I'm not about to have my life energy sucked out of me while my guard is down. Rothen danced agitatedly on the spot, fluting urgently to C-3PO. He assures us that the process is not the same as you remember it, the golden droid informed them. It has been refined considerably. The Pweck come in peace, he says, not war. Han looked around suspiciously. Leia? As uncomfortable as I am about all of this, Leia said, I don't see the point in turning back now. She faced Panib. But understand this. The Galactic Federation of Free Alliances will never sanction any form of alliance with a government that exploits the life energy of its subjects, no matter who they are or were. You think the Pweck are getting back at their old masters? Panib said. I can assure you that's not the case. No one is intact against their will any more, C-3PO continued to interpret. If you let us, we will explain. Leia nodded solemnly. I'd like to hear that. And then maybe you can also explain what's happened to Prime Minister Kundertal. Panid bowed, and Wathen jigged on the spot. Please follow me, General Panib said. Han came up alongside Leia and gently put an arm about her, and together they walked in the general's footsteps as he led them deeper into the sentinel. Jaina and Tahiri followed, C-3PO between them and the Galactic Alliance guards behind. Jaina was a picture of controlled energy, eyes glancing all around, except at Tahiri. It was as if she was deliberately avoiding her eyes. That hurt Tahiri. Jaina had exchanged barely a monosyllable with her since Galantos, and Jagfell was no better. Every now and then, she felt as though they were watching her from afar. They hadn't had to say anything. She could feel their distrust in her, and that hurt her more than any words could ever hope to. As they walked off together, Tahiri felt the scars on her forehead itching. She felt the urge to scratch. She felt self-conscious about them as it was without drawing any more attention to the unsightly markings. The self-inflicted ones on her arm had all but healed and remained hidden beneath the sleeve of her tunic. She had considered getting rid of them, but had decided to keep them, for now. Out of an instinct she didn't entirely understand and didn't want to think about too closely. There were far more important things to dwell upon. Sentinel boasted a large meeting hall on an outer level, with a transparent ceiling that afforded a magnificent viewport to the stars. During combat, Steel Creek shields would slide shut over the top for protection, but during more tranquil times, it offered a wonderful view of Baccarat. The green-blue world hung like a fat moon above a ring-shaped conference table that floated on a bed of repulsors. There were enough seats for everyone who had entered the hall, but only those who'd be involved in the discussions were invited to sit around the table. Jaina stood directly behind her parents, her hand on the hilt of her lightsaber. She didn't like being so far away from reinforcements in such an unknown situation, and having her weapon within constant reach 
went a long way toward easing her apprehensions. Everyone knew that the Sairuk were adept at mental coercion. Who was to say that General Panib wasn't a brainwashed slave, intending to deliver the delegates from the Galactic Alliance to his masters at the first opportunity? The presence of the Prek didn't particularly reassure her, either. In fact, when two more of the creatures had joined Lothan, Jaina's misgivings had intensified immediately. She assumed them to be bodyguards by the way they took up position behind Lothan, although she had to admit they didn't look any different in appearance from their superior. They wore odd-looking weapons, fastened to their harnesses. Flat discs with business-like snouts protruding from one end. Paddle beamers, she assumed. The energy beams of such weapons couldn't be deflected by lightsabers, but they could certainly be bent a little. Lothan himself did not have a physique that allowed him to sit on chairs like the others present, so he was sprawled out on an assortment of cushions at his appointed place around the table. This didn't detract in any way from his intimidating mien. Blaine Harris, the Deputy Prime Minister, is on his way from Salus Dar, Panab said by way of preamble. But we shall begin without him. I wouldn't say we're a captive audience, Han said, sitting restlessly at Leia's side, but we're prepared to hear you out. You've come at a very awkward time for us. I hardly know where to begin. You could start with integment, Leia said. We know that you think it an abomination, Lothan said through C-3PO, and I can sympathize with your feelings. My species has been exploited by it for thousands of years. We know it's past evil. Be that as it may, Han said. I've seen plenty of slaves point the same weapons at their masters once they'd won their freedom. I'll admit the temptation was strong, Lothan said, his beak clicking together at the end of the short phrase. But perhaps I should tell you the story of how we came to be here. Maybe then you will understand us better. Jaina saw her mother nod for him to continue, then settled back into the large, upright chair to listen. It has been almost thirty years since the Cyruvi Imperium waged war in this section of the galaxy. He began. Jaina knew the story. Initially courted by Emperor Palpatine, the Cyruvi Imperium had expanded aggressively into imperial territories, starting with Bakara. Unfortunately for the Cyruk, that advance had been immediately repelled by the local imperial government, with the unlikely help of the Repel Alliance. Further incursions into the galaxy were discouraged by the New Republic, which forced the Imperium back to its homeworlds. Nothing had been heard from them since. Jaina gathered that everyone assumed they either had learned the error of their ways, or were gradually stockpiling for a more determined surge. Just like the Avitha, she thought. In fact, Lothan said, our former masters were assessing more than just their tactics in the wake of their defeat. Cyruvi society was strictly clan-based, he explained with each clan designated by the color of their scales. The absolute ruler was the Shreef Tut, assisted by the Elders' Council and the Conclave. The Conclave advised the Shreef Tut on spiritual matters. Another aspect of life considered very important by the Sairuk. Their belief system taught that the spirit of any Sairu, who died away from a consecrated world, would be lost forever. It was for that reason that the Cyruk preferred to use combat droids powered by the intact souls of captives to fight their enemies, rather than risk their own lives in battle. And Tecmet had served our masters well for many centuries. They had never seen any reason to change. The abhorrence with which you greeted the technology came as a complete surprise to them. They had assumed that all cultures would employ the same techniques that you didn't only underscored the novelty of the technology you did use, that of fusion and ordinary matter. Clearly, the Rebel Alliance beat our former masters for more reasons than different technology, but that was one aspect they could focus on. 
they had seen Imperial and Rebel Alliance vessels in action above and around Bakara. They knew enough material physics to back-engineer the technology and recreate it in their laboratories. Within ten standard years, they possessed prototype hybrid vessels that employed your technology for shields and engines, but were directed by intact mines. With a significantly reduced drain on their life forces, such pilots existed much longer and in less agony than before. But they were still intact, Han interrupted. Yes. The mind of every prototype droid fighter consisted of a soul stolen from the body of a Pwek. The fact that their suffering had been lessened was balanced by the fact that they suffered longer. The situation was still undeniably wrong. Into this time, the Kiramak was born. A new note entered the Pwek's voice. It might have been fear, Jaina thought, or maybe awe. What is this Kiramak? Leia asked. It is hard to explain in terms that you might understand. You know that those of the Cyruk with blue scales ruled the Cyruvi Imperium, and that the gold scales were our priests. Yellow scales studied the sciences of matter and energy. Those with russet scales were our warriors, while those with green scales were workers. Below them, barely above my own species, were those resulting from a mixed or unsuccessful breeding, the brown scales. Some suspected them of being the progenitors of the Prek in ages past. Regarded as dim-witted and brutish, they were fit only for the most menial of lives. Many, especially those born of a forbidden union, were destroyed at birth. That was the world into which the Kiramak was born. It is important to understand this because the Kiramak should not exist. One of a brood of brown-scale Cyruk, the Kiramak alone possessed color. But it does not just have one color. The Kiramak has all colors. That is what makes it unique among the Cyruk. Dwothan performed a complicated gesture, involving the muscles of his tail and spine, as though shrugging his entire body. That the Kiramak was a sport, a deviant birth was clear. It had no clear gender, and its size was anomalous, but that was irrelevant. Its birth sent shock waves through the Cyruk. They place a great value on spiritual matters, as you know, and such a birth had been prophesied for millennia. The Kiramak, the birth of many colors, would be the one to take the oppressed and make them lords. The Kiramak would make the weak strong. What you're saying, Han said, is that the Cyruk embraced the Kiramak because they thought it would lead them to victory over us, right? That is correct, Rothen said. They raised it like a king, with every privilege and opportunity to learn and grow. The Kiramak soon proved to be exceptional in all respects, strong, intelligent, wise. It argued with the Shreef Tut over the limitations of power. It challenged the conclave on matters of theology. And it rivaled the Elders' Council when it came to minor points of law. But ultimately, it was the Kiramak's compassion that was its greatest point, as well as the Cyruk's undoing. It shows you over them? Leia asked. The Kiramak was the one who led us to victory over our former masters. It conceived our revolt and consolidated the aftermath. Within a year, Thwek was ours, and the Cyruvi Imperium a thing of the past. And now, five years on, the Kiramak still guides our destiny. Impressive, Leia said. Throwing off an oppressor is only the beginning of a long and difficult journey. Jaina nodded, knowing that her mother spoke from experience. In the wake of our liberation, we have continued research into entechment, Dwathan said through C-3PO. We have found ways to nourish the stored mines we claimed during our revolution. 
the life energy distilled from concentrated banks of algae and other primitive life forms, can prevent the decay common to previous soul captures. It also goes a long way toward staving off the discomfort many feel when intact. Now that we have diverted much of the life-draining work to your forms of technology and reduced the strain on the intact soul, we have reversed many of the wrongs forced upon captives and slaves in the past. The droid fighters you saw today are piloted by those intact in the last days of the Imperium. Rothen's triple eyelids blinked in a complicated manner. Although we do continue to offer intactment as a form of military service, there are few who willingly sacrifice their physical lives. There's no way back, of course. Such a decision is not lightly made. I'm sure it wouldn't be, Leia said as she faced General Ponib. From the tone of her mother's voice, coupled with the set of her shoulders, and the way she sat in the chair before her, Jaina could tell she wasn't entirely convinced by Luathan's lengthy explanation, even though it did concur with the odd force readings they'd had from the droid fighters. General Ponib, have you seen anything to contradict Luathan's statement, that no one has been intact against his or her will? None of us have been intact, if that's what you're getting at, the general said. In fact, there have been no aggressive moves made against us whatsoever. Although... What? Han prompted, leaning forward slightly in his chair. Well, that's something else we will need to talk about. Why you've come at such a bad time. The Pwek arrived here two weeks ago, offering a treaty. Prime Minister Kundertal and the Senate deliberated for days before arriving at the decision to accept the offer. The Prime Minister's announcement caused a few riots. It's hard to explain to the general population that we haven't sold them out. I can understand that, Han muttered. We thought the people were coming around, Panib went on. The defense advantages of joining with the Pwek are obvious, given the Yuzhan Vong's gradual drift this way. And we had a lot to be grateful to them for, since they did get rid of the Cyruvi threat. Panev fidgeted uneasily. But there are complications, and conditions. Such as? Leia asked. Rothen has mentioned religion. The Pwek are like the Cyruk, in that they share some of the same traditions. In order to make them comfortable, there are details we have to attend to. Kundertal wanted this Kiramak of theirs to come to Bakara to sign the treaty in person, but he, it, wouldn't come unless Bakara was consecrated. You see, it believes, like the rest of the Cyruk, that if it dies away from one of the sacred worlds, then its soul will be lost forever. And the fact is, assassination isn't out of the question, especially given the volatile temperament of some of the public right now. His glance to Lwathen was filled with apology. We are neighbors. We must learn to trade and fight side by side. If Bakra and the Pwek are to work together, then we have to consider all our religious beliefs. We'd like them to feel safe enough to visit here. Toward this end, Kundertal managed to find a compromise. The Kiramak would come to Bakra to perform the consecration in person. The ceremony was planned for two days from now. That's where things stood when, when Prime Minister Kundertal disappeared, interrupted a voice from the entrance to the chamber. Jaina's grip on her lightsaber tightened instinctively as she turned to see a tall, aging man in a scarlet robe approach the table. His face was long and angular, the bones beneath clearly showing. Two Bakaran guards closely shadowed him, rifles held firmly across their chests. Deputy Prime Minister Harris, Ponib said, standing. He sounded relieved. Thank you for joining us. Harris indicated for Ponib to return to his seat, then nodded to everyone else around the table by way of greeting. Princess Leia, Captain Solon, it's a pleasure to meet you again. And of course you, Rothen. 
An attendant brought up a chair, and he sat between the Puek and Leia. I apologize for the delay, he said to Panib, but there was a bomb threat at the main spaceport, and I had to take a shuttle from Lesser Grace. As you can see, he explained to the rest of the table, we are suffering from a pronounced civil unrest, not on behalf of the majority, I imagine, but rather a violent and unprincipled minority who think they know what's best for Bakra. This minority has decided that the Puek are no different from the Syruk, and the Kiramax visit here is nothing more than an elaborate ruse that will result in the entanglement of everyone. Once an enemy, always an enemy, is their maxim. There is simply no room for negotiation. He clenched his fists helplessly on the table. His gaze fell upon Leia and Han. I understand you have experienced interference from them already. A secure transmission was interrupted by someone warning us away, Leia said. Whoever it was had access to comm channels that should have been restricted. They are everywhere, Harris said sourly. As the consecration looms, their desperation increases. They have been behind at least five disruptions to subspace communications in the last fortnight. Kidnapping Moliere Kundertal was an act of suicidal bravado. It is strange, but while I have to condemn their methods, I can't help admire their spirit. He shook his head sadly. Nevertheless, we will never negotiate with terrorists. What about Kundertal? Han asked. Any idea where he's being kept? We'll find out soon enough, especially now that we have the terrorist leader in our hands. General Panib was clearly taken aback by this news. Since when? She was taken into custody shortly before I left to come here. We have her in a security holding cell, awaiting interrogation. Is she? Panib hesitated. Who we suspected she was? Melinza Thanis, Harris answered with a smug smile. Yes. The surprise in the room was palpable. Jaina knew the name. Melinza Thanis was the daughter of people her parents and Uncle Luke had met on Bakara the first time they'd visited. When Melinza's parents had died, Luke and Mara had taken her on as a sponsor child, visiting her a couple of times. She'd heard nothing about the girl being a terrorist leader, however. Melinza? Leia asked. Are you certain of this? There's no doubt, Harris stated. She admits it herself. She admits she kidnapped the Prime Minister? Panab asked. Not yet, but it's only a matter of time. When you say interrogation, I don't mean to imply torture, Princess, Harris said. We are a civilized people, and it would take more than a little civil unrest to reduce us to savages. This doesn't add up. Han was shaking his head. Whoever we spoke to when we arrived warned us away because they thought we were after your ships. They implied that the Puek were your allies. But that contradicts what you've just told us about the terrorists. If they're anti-Puek, they wouldn't want any association with them at all. What can I say? They are confused and directionless. Their aim is unclear even to themselves. Harris shrugged dismissively. We have suffered at the hands of such isolationist groups ever since the overthrow of the Empire. There are indeed those who resent the intrusion of the New Republic into our affairs. Some of these may have allied themselves with the anti puek movement to gain the illusion of numbers. Such people won't be happy until Bakara stands alone against the rest of the galaxy, and inevitably 
falls alone too. So what now? Ponib asked. The first thing, General, is to put our house in order. While we look for the Prime Minister, I suggest we end martial law and begin preparations for the consecration. The treaty depends on it. The Prime Minister would not want it delayed for anything. With your permission, I shall convene the Senate and get things moving. Of course. The General's relief was obvious. There's not much time and a lot to be done. Rothen spoke up. We understand that this is a difficult time for you, C-3PO translated, and we are grateful for your continued efforts to bring our governments together. The Quek's beak snapped emphatically. I will convey my assurances to the Kiramak that all is in order, and the ceremony will go ahead as planned. Thank you, my friend. Blaine Harris inclined his head in the direction of the Quek ambassador. And you, of course, he added to Han and Leia, are very welcome to attend also. I'm sure it will be a fascinating glimpse into a culture we've theorized about for many years, but never had the opportunity to see with our own eyes. We'd be honored, Leia said. The Galactic Federation of Free Alliances will be very interested to observe the ceremony. General Ponib stood, and the others around the table followed suit. I hope you won't be offended if I call this meeting to an end, but I have urgent matters to discuss with the Deputy Prime Minister. Of course. Leia accepted the explanation with her usual diplomatic aplomb. And thank you for taking the time to explain the situation here. There are still some aspects I'd like to discuss in more detail at a later date, if possible. It would be my pleasure to accommodate you, the general said. He spoke and moved with a confidence that had been lacking before the Deputy Prime Minister's news. And I shall ensure that Salis Dar Spaceport is secured for your arrival. Hopefully, with Thanus in custody, the situation will cool down a little now. Leia bowed in acknowledgment. The Deputy Prime Minister bowed also as Leia and Han's party filed toward the exit. Luothan and his two bodyguards followed close behind, and although he made no effort to come too close, Jaina still made sure to position herself carefully between her parents and the powerful Saurian. Once outside, the Pwek fluted in his loud, melodic way. Luothan says that this is a pivotal time for all our species, C-3PO interpreted. More fluting and gesturing followed. He also says that he is glad that you will be attending the ceremony. The Kiramak will be pleased when it hears the news. Without waiting for a response, the Pwek headed off down the corridor, bodyguards in tow. Chirpy fellow, ain't he? Han said. Something's not adding up here, Jaina said. She was glad the meeting was over, and she was once again able to be involved in discussions. How can the Bakaran resistance be everywhere and yet still be a minority? Maximum disruption, Leia said, for minimum effort. We could be seeing the Peace Brigade at work here. What's left of them, Han muttered. It's like getting a dent out of a deflector grill, even after a leisure. At least we're not too late this time, Gina said, the destruction of Nazoth still fresh in her mind. That's assuming, of course, Leia said, that we have the full story. The story, you shall. Tell us the story, whispered the acolytes, crowding the darkened audience hall. Tell us about the Jedi. The prophet gazed down at them from his throne his expression hidden behind a mask of truly horrific proportions. A maze of scars and tattoos, it was barely recognizable as a face. Who asks? He demanded in accordance with the service. We do, Yusha. 
the pilgrims responded with a unified bowing of their heads. We are the shamed ones, and we come to you for wisdom. The prophet nodded, satisfied by the formal response. Warders outside the hall had carefully instructed the audience on how and when to speak. The being on the inside of the mask smiled to himself, knowing that these conventions were nothing more than a sham to encourage obedience to him and, ultimately, rebellion against his enemies. Lomanor rose from his seat on the throne and removed the mask. The hideous creation was meant to represent Shimra and the gods, while its removal symbolized the casting off of the old ways. He had devised every detail of the ceremony with the help of Shun Mai and Kunra, his chief acolytes. But no matter how many times he did it, it still felt clumsy. Only the reactions of the converts convinced him that it was working. The acolytes looked wonderingly up at Nomanor's real face, not aware that this was just another mask, an Uglith masker designed to make him look like a member of the shamed caste. The gods have granted me a vision, he announced. It is a vision of a galaxy of beautiful worlds, worlds in which all Yuzhan Vong can live in peace as well as in glory. Free of shame, and with everything their hearts and souls desire. In recent weeks, Nomanor had learned to become more animated and expressive when addressing the groups that came to hear him speak. At first, he had just sat there and spoken, but he soon found the attention of the shamed ones would drift beneath his dull monotones. So he'd adopted some of the techniques he had observed in Vurok Ipan a storyteller from the group of shamed ones that had first taken him in during his initial exile to Yuzhan Tar's underworld. Nomanor clearly recalled how Ipan had told the story of Vuarapung, and how those gathered had listened intently, hanging from his every word, even though they had heard the tale so many times before. But as I gazed upon this vision, Nomanor went on with dramatic flair, a dark shadow came between my hungry eyes and the sight of the worlds that should be ours. The huge black shadow had rainbows that shined from its eyes. Its mighty hands were darkened from bloodstains. The congregation listened spellbound, just as Ipan's audience had once listened to him. Nomanor raised a hand to demand silence, an unnecessary gesture since the silence was already profound but one that served to reinforce his command over the gathering. The gods opposed the great shadow, the rainbow-eyed one, and they brought forth their holy warriors to strike it down. He stared down at the crowd. You know the name of these warriors. The whisper surrounded him. Jedi. He nodded his approval and leaned forward as though to impart a great secret. And it was a great secret, for uttering it could easily mean the death of everyone in the room. Yes. The gods sent the Jedi to drive away the rainbow-eyed enemy. For weeks and months they fought. The shadow killed many of the holy warriors and kept the rest at bay. Night fell across the galaxy, and it seemed as though the war was hopelessly lost. Our home had been taken from us. The Yuzhan Vong were no longer favored by the gods, for we had debased ourselves on the altar of the shadow. No, moaned one in the congregation, shaking his head. Even from his place at the front of the congregation, Nomanor could smell the rank odor of the shamed one's decaying arm. He smiled inwardly. It was all too easy to work his will over the loose-knit congregations of heretics that infested the capital. Their members were weak and desperate, while he was strong and resourceful. No, indeed, he said. Even as despair overcame me at the defeat of the Jedi, even as it seemed as though the rainbow-eyed one would never be stopped, the gods gave me hope. For just when all was dark, I saw the grasses of the field turn against the shadow. 
I saw them rise and wrap around the feet of the rainbow-eyed one. The enemy stumbled and fell, and then the grasses rose to bind the shadow's mighty limbs. The grasses held this foe of the gods to the ground, wrapping themselves around his throat and squeezing the very life from him, removing the influence of his black heart from the land. By themselves, each blade of grass was weak, but together they were mighty. The congregation sighed with relief and joy at the exclamation. Let us be as the grass and twine about the feet of our adversary to bring him crashing down. For individually we may be weak, but like the grass, together we can be strong. The congregation hissed its appreciation, and Nomanor basked in their approval. In all the years he'd served as an executor, he had never had such an audience. It had been impossible to speak honestly or openly for fear of offending the war master or the priests, or, through them, the gods. Now he had the attention of hundreds, and they would listen to anything he said. He was wise enough to realize, though, that such attention would last only as long as they approved of his message. They devoured the nonsense about the Jedi, along with his message of self-empowerment, and while he had no great belief in the former, he was very much in favor of the latter. The shamed ones were his ride back to the surface. He was happy to give them the means, so he could achieve the end. The allure of the means wasn't lost on him. As an executor, he hadn't properly appreciated the need and strength of the lower castes. The shamed ones were indeed weak individually, as he taught in his sermons. But this was easily made up for with their overwhelming numbers. The majority had belonged to the worker caste before their shaming, but some had been of higher rank. Moreover, it wasn't just the shamed ones who answered his call. Converts to his Jedi cult were increasingly drawn from junior members of the unshamed, from the workers, the shapers, the warriors, the priests, and the intendants. The shapers knew the tools of their trade. The priests and intendants knew how to organize, and the warriors knew how to fight. Anyone who descended upon one of these meetings to make arrests was in for a nasty surprise. Although it was hard to remember sometimes, those in his audience weren't particularly gullible. They weren't uneducated. They weren't stupid. They just wanted authority, and he would give it to them. When the muttering died away, he returned to the throne and motioned the audience to gather around him. In reality, the chamber was just a large basement hundreds of meters below the spires of Ujantar, and his throne was just a chair coated in moss of different shades to make it look better than it really was. It didn't matter. The congregation saw what it wanted to see, just as it heard what it wanted to hear. Numanor leaned forward to talk to them, with less ceremony. It was time to give them the message. How many here have met the Jedi face to face? he asked. How many have heard the message from their own lips, in their own tongue? He waited for someone to answer in the affirmative, but, as always, no one did. In all the sermons he'd given, not one of the shamed ones who came to him had ever met or even seen a single example of the ones they venerated and looked to for liberation. I have met the Jedi, he said. I have gazed upon the twins and seen their power. I have wondered at the Jedi who was shaped. I witnessed the death of perhaps the greatest of them all, the one called Anakin Solo, who gave his life so that the ones he loved might live. And I have spoken to their elders and heard their message with my own ears. That I have done all these things and am here before you now attests to the truth of what I have told you. If what I say is not the truth, then may the gods strike me down here and now where I stand, and erase this blasphemy from the heart of the galaxy. 
The manor could feel the congregation holding its collective breath, and he hid another a smile as he dragged out the pause a little longer than was strictly necessary. He wanted the acolytes to realize that they were still afraid of the old gods, that old habits died hard. He never grew tired of seeing the impact his words had upon the shamed ones. It never failed to amuse him how he could manipulate their emotions. Strictly speaking, Numanor's claims weren't lies. He had met a lot of Jedi in the course of his duty, just not in the capacity of an ally. Nor had he ever stopped to listen to their philosophy. They'd usually been on the receiving end of one of his schemes to betray and destroy them, or he'd been doing his level best to survive when those schemes went wrong. When the silence was as taut as a stretched ligament, he began to tell them the story of Vurarapun, the shamed one who had found redemption in the actions of the Jedi Knight called Anakin Solo. They had all heard it before, of course. None of them would have made it this far had they not been able to give at least a rough outline of the story, thereby demonstrating that someone thought them trustworthy. But this was the official version, as taught by the Prophet. It contained all the correct details in the right order, and was consistent with the known facts. It conveyed precisely the right message at exactly the right time. So Nomanor intended it anyway. Again, lacking true belief, he could only judge by the reactions of those who came to hear him speak. They listened rapturously and left enlivened, empowered to spread the message. All knew that being associated in any way with the prophet would mean torture and death. The keepers of the old gods were jealous and did not tolerate challengers to their beliefs. How far knowledge of the existence of the cult had spread was hard to say. Did Shimra lose concentration during his nightly flagellations as he pondered the spreading rot? No manor could only hope so. And there the Jedi heresy might have ended, had it not been witnessed by the shamed ones watching from the edge of the battle, by the shapers Damutek. They spread the message, and to this day the message continues to spread from mouth to ear among those like us. There is another way, a way that leads to acceptance, and a new word for hope. Jedi. Nomanor paused at the end of the tale to sip from a drink bulb that Shun Mai had ensured was at hand before the acolytes had filed into the room. The ending of the tale was identical to the ending he had first heard from Ipan. He told it this way to remind himself both of the story's origins and of Ipan's fate. Ipan's death at the hands of a band of warriors that had come searching for stolen provisions, thefts Ipan had conducted with Nomanor in order to keep their small band of outlaws alive, had galvanized Nomanor into action. Without that to motivate him, he might have still been living in anonymity, waiting for his luck to run out instead of making his own. I shall answer your questions now, he said after a moment. There were always questions. Did Yun Yuzhan create the Jedi? was the first, shouted by a female near the front. Yun Yuzhan created all things, he answered, the Jedi included. They are as much a part of his plan as we are. This will probably seem confusing to some, but you must remember that we should never assume to know Yun Yuzhan's plan in its entirety. We are as gazakal worms before him. Would such a worm understand even the most menial task you perform? Are they aspects of Yun Shuno, then? A male cried out from the back. As with all beings, different ones appeal to different gods. The twin Jedi, Jin and Jason Solo, are often associated with the twin gods Yun Shin and Yun Ka. Jaina is also associated with Yun Harla, the trickster. All the Jedi are disciplined warriors, so they fight with the favor of Yun Yamka, the Slayer. They revere life as does Yun Neshel, the Modeler. Self-sacrifice for the greater good is part of their teaching, as it is with Yun Yuzhan. And yes, they have acted as intercessors for the Shamed Ones in the fashion of Yun Shuno. But in essence, 
they are beings like us. They are not themselves gods any more than Shimra is. They are mortal. They can be killed. I know this because I have seen them die with my own eyes. There are even stories of Jedi who wreak destruction instead of good, so we know that they have flaws like us. It is their teaching we must follow, so we can be strong like them, so we can be accepted as equals again. Yusha, what is the force? Nomanor pretended to ponder this question before he answered. In reality, he had already given it a great deal of thought. He had seen firsthand the effects of the Force, but he had never understood it. Unlike those he had once served, however, he refused to dismiss that failure to understand as a failure on behalf of the Jedi. That was absurd. He simply could not hide from the fact that the Jedi Knights had access to something that the Yuzhan Vong clearly did not. It became worse the more he thought about it. If, as the Jedi claimed, the Yuzhan Vong truly didn't possess the mystical life force or energy field that filled, or fueled, the galaxy they had invaded, did that mean, then, that the Yuzhan Vong and all their works, and their gods, were as empty and lifeless as the machines they despised? There were two obvious solutions to this problem, as far as Numanur could see. One was to embrace the teachings of the Jedi, in order to learn more about what had gone wrong, and maybe save themselves from a pointless non-life. The other was to find evidence, somehow, that the Yuzhan Vong weren't entirely closed to this ubiquitous force, but somewhere inside them existed the same spark of life that burned in the Jedi. His answer to the question attempted to address both solutions in a way that left neither resolved. The Force is an aspect of creation, the same as matter and energy. It may even be an aspect of the creation, the primordial sacrifice that brought forth all things from Yun Yuzhan. We are taught that Yun Yuzhan is the source of all life, the overlord who, through great pain to himself, created the lesser gods and thus, by connection, the Yuzhan Vong. We assume that his sacrifice was of his body, as his followers might sacrifice an arm or a thousand captives in his honor. But why should that be so? Why do we limit Yun Yuzhan's generosity only to that which we can see and touch? Just as the wind is invisible to our eyes, there are many more things in the universe than we can sense with our corporeal bodies, and all these things spring ultimately from Yun Yuzhan. The Force is part of that, too. But what is it exactly? Nomanor shook his head. I cannot address that question, my friends, because I simply do not have the answer. On this matter, I am as ignorant as all of you. The Force is a mystery, one that may haunt us forever. All we can do is grope in the darkness for that thing we know is missing, in the hope that we might somehow stumble across it by chance. Nomanor leaned forward again, dropping his voice to a whisper, so they were forced to listen closely to his words. So far in my groping, I have discovered two things that I want you to consider. The first is that our way and the way of the Jedi are not necessarily at odds with each other. I'm not suggesting, as some have proposed, that we replace our pantheon with that of the Jedi and the Force but that we are both prophets of a new way. He paused again, but not long enough for anyone to voice another question. The other thing is no more than speculation, really, but I offer it to you anyway, for you to consider. I mentioned before that Yun Yuzhan's sacrifice might have been of more than just his body, that he might have offered up things in order to bring the universe into being things that the likes of you and I can neither see nor sense. We see aspects of him reflected in everything around us. So is it not possible that the Force, in all its mystery and wonder, is what remains of Yun Yuzhan's soul? Numanor leaned back into the throne, 
leaving them to ponder that thought for a moment. He honestly didn't know if it meant anything or not, but the audience seemed to think it profound. He let himself relax while they contemplated the notion. These were the toughest questions, and he was glad to get them out of the way early, but they were also the ones he had prepared for the most. From here on, if the acolytes followed the usual patterns, the questions would be relatively trivial. "'Who are you, Yusha?' asked a disfigured warrior from off to one side of the gathering. He dodged the answer with rhetoric, in much the same way he might have once deflected thudbugs with his amphistaff. I am one of you, anonymous in servitude, remarkable only for my willingness to speak out against those who would have us defiled. Where did you come from? Like you, like all of you. I was born and raised on one of the many world ships that crossed the gulfs between galaxies, following our ancestors' vision of a promised land. It was the truth, of course, just not the whole truth. Nomanor had acted as an advance scout, arriving many years before the main body of the migration. His mission had been to gather information about the governments and species occupying the worlds ahead. He had prepared the way for later agents, exploring pressure points and sowing seeds of dissent. Those seeds had flowered into rebellions and counter-rebellions, destabilizing the New Republic and widening the cracks that had ultimately led to its downfall. During the war, he had helped found the Peace Brigade that had so jeopardized the Jedi cause, and set many other schemes into motion. But there was no way he was going to let them know that. "'Is the war wrong?' asked one from the front, his eyes wide and hungry for answers. That was a difficult question. Being pro-Jedi didn't necessarily mean that the galaxy wasn't intended to be the Yuzhan Vong's new home. It didn't mean that it was wrong to fight the Galactic Alliance, since it wasn't ruled by Jedi and didn't openly advocate Jedi values. It was perfectly reasonable to be soundly pro-Jedi, and yet at the same time fanatically opposed to any suggestion that the war should be ended. The trouble was, Nomanor suspected that the Yuzhan Vong were now losing the war. He had no confidence in Shimra's ability to restore the situation. He understood the bankruptcy of the Supreme Overlord's regime. He knew of the lies, the betrayals, the desperate search for an antidote in the form of the Eighth Cortex. Without a radical change in direction or fortune, the Galactic Alliance was going to win. For the worshippers of Yunyamka, the god of carnage, there was no such thing as losing. There was only winning or dying. A failure to defeat the Galactic Alliance would inevitably mean a fight to the end and the destruction of all that Nomanor held dear. His only hope, therefore, was to change the direction of the war from beneath, by muddying the waters for the enemy. Would the Jedi be so keen to attack when they had supporters in the Yuzhan Vong ranks? He suspected not. They were warriors, but they were also guilty of compassion. The war is an aberration, he said offering the reply he always used when fielding this kind of question. It is a lie. We should never have been fighting the Jedi in the first place, since they are the only ones who will speak up for those without voices, those like us. Nor should we be fighting those who call the Jedi allies, either, since alone the Jedi are insufficient to destroy the Supreme Overlord. We should be fighting the ones who pit like against like, who use fear and betrayal to keep the powerless in their place, who would strike down Yun Yuzhan himself in order to satisfy their greed. It is never wrong to fight for what is ours, but you must make certain that you do so for the right reasons. Be clear who your enemy is. It is shame. But together, like the grass, we can bring an end to this shame once and for all. The audience responded enthusiastically to his words, and this time Nomanor did smile. They were his now, would do anything for him. He had led them to the noose, and they had happily put their heads through of their own accord. What do we do now, Prophet? Nomanor sought out the questioner and recognized him 
as the one with the severely decayed arm. The acolyte's ice axe were a deep, intense blue, almost visibly pulsing with blood. His stare was the kind Omanor had seen many times before, before and since he had formed the cult. For some, belief was so much more than just a guide to living. It became life itself. That was understandable, he thought, when they had so little else to live for. You are among the first to receive the message, he said, addressing the whole room. Your duty now is to spread it to others so that they, too, will come to understand it. Some of these may choose to come here and receive further instruction, themselves to become messengers. The message will spread like a flood, washing our shame away. A murmur of approval rolled around the gathering, punctuated by the nodding of many heads. There will, of course, be those who will hear the message but do nothing with it. Nomanor went on. They will keep it in their hearts, secrete it away from others as though it were some rare spore they have found. For these individuals I feel nothing but pity. The message can only be of value if it is heard. For that, and that alone, is its purpose. Remaining silent after you hear the message is akin to giving approval of the way you have been treated, of being complicit with the enemy. He let the sentence trail off, then sighed. The time had come to end the audience. He had said everything he needed to say. My friends, I fear for all of you. Although we have right on our side, we are still fledglings who must confront hostility at every corner. Should word of our existence and identities ever reach the higher ranks, then every one of us involved will be hunted down and killed. Therefore, I ask you all to take every precaution as you spread the message and recruit for our cause. A whisper will spread, but a shout would most surely be silenced. With patience and perseverance, we will prevail. I ask you to go now in the strength and knowledge that the spirit of freedom is with us. Nomanor stood and opened his arms, as though to embrace them all. At the signal, the doors at the back of the cellar opened, allowing the newly recruited acolytes to file out. He smiled beneficently as they left, radiating goodwill and trust. It was very different from how he had once dealt with underlings. There was a time when he would have sent them off with curses and threats, trusting in fear to keep them loyal. But this wouldn't work on the shamed ones. Threatening them with punishment would only demonstrate that he was no different from the rest of their masters. If he had learned one thing from his disguise, it was that when fear was a way of life and there was nothing left to lose, the only incentive remaining was reward. When they were gone, he collapsed back into the throne. Go now, in the knowledge that you are the instruments of my authority and the means by which I shall attain the glory I deserve. A good audience, you shall. He looked up. The shamed warrior Kumra, who acted as his bodyguard and occasional conscience, had entered the room, closely followed by Nomanor's truest believer, Shunmai Esh. Shunmai wore the robes of a priest, though without the insignia of any of the Yuzhan Vong deities. Kunra wore no armor, belying the cowardice that had caused his fall from grace. Knowing their two selves, Nomanor thought them a pathetic entourage for any would-be revolutionary. But he had to admit that the converts responded well to them. Nothing special, he said in his usual rough voice. There was no need to soliloquize with these two. What we are gaining in quantity, we are losing in quality. A couple of them looked like they were about to die on their feet. I apologize, Master. Shunmai made fawning motions with his gnarled hands. I did not feel it my place to turn anyone with need aside. Soon you will have to, Shunmai. Beneath his tiredness and irritation, Nomanor felt an abiding satisfaction at the way the movement was growing. Every day brought more penitence to their door, seeking the truth of the message spreading around Yuzhantar. 
Perhaps it is time to start training the select. You have the list? Chunmai nodded vigorously, eager to please. I have identified seventeen who qualify. Loyal without being blind, Nomanor said, going over the prerequisites for those chosen. Quick thinkers, but not too intelligent, yes? Yes, master. Then call them to me. He glanced around at his surroundings. The sooner the better, for I grow weary of the stench down here. Shunmai inclined his head. They will stand before you tomorrow, master, he said, making to leave. Before he had gone five steps, Nomanor stopped him. Shunmai, he called. The shamed one turned to face him. I could not have done this without you. I want you to know that. The highest of Nomanor's acolytes beamed with pride as he scurried off to do his duty. The self-styled prophet buried a flash of irritation. Although part of him wished he had killed the fool when he'd had the chance, he had to acknowledge Shunmai's usefulness. He was dedicated and resourceful, and Nomanor felt he owed it to Shunmai's sister, Nirit, one of the first true believers of the message, not to kill him. Kunra would be sure to remind him if he tried, he was sure. That wasn't the most irritating thing, though. Shunmai's willingness to work for nothing but praise stuck in Nomanor's throat like a bone. The ex-warrior stood in silence by the door, watching him. Nomanor had come to know Kunra well enough to realize when he had something on his mind. What is it? You'd better see for yourself. Kunra turned and walked through the hall's main entrance and into the antechamber. From there, he led Nomanor along a short corridor to the small cell in which Kunra slept. There, immobilized by blorash jelly, lay a female dressed in rags. Her cheek was heavily bruised, but her eyes were open and filled with defiance. She was carrying this, Kunra said, offering Nomanor the remains of a small, larva-like creature. Its leathery shell had been crushed and would have been barely recognizable had not Nomanor seen such things many times before. It was a villip. The female had obviously intended to bring it into the meeting so that the person on the other end could watch the prophet in action. That in itself was not necessarily sinister. Some of the acolytes had attempted to spread the message via Villops before, or so they had claimed. Numanor knew, however, that he couldn't afford to take the chance. Does Shunmai know? he asked, keeping his stare fixed on the female. No. I make sure to check all acolytes before they reach him. This one came alone and was out of the way before he had a chance to suspect anything. Nomanor nodded his approval. It made things much simpler. I want the name of the person holding her master, Villop, he said coldly. Find out how much she knows about us while you're at it. Get the information any way you have to. Then kill her. Kunra didn't argue. I understand. The female started to struggle, her protests muffled by the gag in her mouth. Nomanor ignored her. I shall explain to Shunmai that we have to relocate again. He won't like it. He faced Kunra. I'm sure he'd prefer it to dying. Without a further glance at the prisoner, he turned and walked away. Part 2 Destination The freighter came out of nowhere from hyperspace far too close to Bakara, and going into an instant spin. Its drive units stuttered at random, which wasn't helping the freighter situation, while its subspace was transmitting nothing but static, which to Jag fell sounded a lot like the buzzing of angry insects. He had spent a lot of time at effort, memorizing the manufacturers and model names of both Republic and Imperial vessels, but he was having difficulty identifying this one. Its distinctive asymmetric design suggested something from the Corellian Engineering Corporation, possibly somewhere between the YT-1300 and the YT-2400, although he couldn't be 100% certain. Either way, it was in poor shape, and that wasn't likely to improve in a hurry. 
He would have happily ignored it, had it not been for the fact that whoever was flying it was coming dangerously close to where Pride of Salonia was stationed. Flight Spleen C, stand by. Jag switched to a commercial channel. Unidentified freighter, you are infringing upon our space. Change course immediately, or we will be forced to take action. More static was his only reply. He swung his clawcraft away from Salonia in order to meet the incoming vessel. His wingmate followed, as foils opening smoothly on her X-wing. Bakara Orbital Control, he conned on local channels. Has anybody given this freighter approval to occupy our orbit? Negative, Twin One, came the instant reply. This flight is unauthorized, but we've certainly seen her before. You have a registration listed? Oh, yeah. She goes by the name of Jaunty Cavalier and is owned by a Wookiee called Rufar. In fact, I'm surprised to see him return here. He left owing me some credits. Not your usual Wookiee, then, Jag thought as he watched the freighter tumble toward him. And not your usual approach, either. I think he's got more to worry about at the moment, Jag sent, requesting permission to nudge her out of harm's way. As long as you promise not to be too gentle, orbital control quipped. Do what you have to, Twin One, added Captain Maine from Salonia. Just make sure she gives us a wide berth. Jaunty Cavalier, he tried again. You have ten seconds to comply with my instructions, or you will be intercepted. Please respond. Still nothing but crackling over the comm. Okay, we're going in. He applied power to his thrusters and brought his clawcraft alongside the tumbling freighter. Flight B, come closer and add your shields to mine. We're going to try to give her a little push. Two X-wings and another clawcraft joined him and his wingmate. With half of twin suns all working simultaneously, the freighter's heading gradually began to change. But it required a redirection of all available power to both engines and shields from all ships. Jag kept a wary eye on the freighter, just in case she tried anything. Five degrees would do it, he decided. That would take the freighter well past Salonia and clear of Bakara's atmosphere. He caught a flash out of the corner of his eye. At that exact moment, a dozen instruments on his console spiked, and he realized that a spray of neutrinos had just washed over him. Did anyone else catch that? Affirmative, Twin One. The leader of Flight B replied. Look at the drive units. Jag craned to look out the rear of his cockpit's transparent canopy. The freighter's engines were stuttering furiously now, thrust ebbing and fading in wildly erratic energy swings. I don't like the look of this, he mumbled under his breath. The words had barely left his lips when the drive units emitted a particularly bright flash, then died completely. Break off, he called over the comm. All fighters disengage immediately. He was already wrenching the controls of his clawcraft up and away from the stricken freighter. Full power to aft shields. Put everything you've got between us and that thing. She's going to... There was a blinding white flash from behind him. Then something picked up his clawcraft and spun it like a top around all axes. He clutched at the sides of his flight seat, hearing nothing but the scream of tortured matter over the comm. Then the rough ride was over, and the stars reappeared. Jag damped down his spin and checked on the four other starfighters. He was relieved to find them all present, if a little shaken by the experience. All that remained of Jaunty Cavalier was a jagged chunk of wreckage, possibly a section of the forward structural chassis. The rest had been blown to atoms by the drive failure. Bakara orbital control, he said solemnly into his comm. I think you can kiss your credits goodbye. Don't write it off just yet, Twin One, came the voice of Captain Maine. We registered a launch from Jaunty Cavalier just before the detonation. It looked like a small pot of some kind. This surprised Jag. An escape pod? Are you sure? I didn't see anything. I'm positive, Maine returned. It was on the opposite side of the ship from you which was probably why you didn't see it. Heading for Bakara, you mean. Jag was still slightly disoriented from the shockwave, but he knew his up from his down. Every spacer did in a gravity well. 
Does it have thrusters? They're firing, but it's not enough. Re-entry will be too steep. Want to go fetch it, or should we hand it over to Bakura OC? Negative on that, orbital control said over the open line. We wouldn't be able to get there in time. Sorry, Twin One, but it's going to have to be you or no one at all. Understood, Jag said, silently hoping there'd be no more surprises in store for him. He sent his clawcraft swooping around the growing cloud of wreckage, his engines on maximum burn. The pod appeared on his scope a second later, streaking downward. Its velocity was increasing, but it was no match for a clawcraft at full throttle. He decelerated cautiously alongside as it loomed large in his scopes. There were no obvious booby traps or triggers, just the blinking of an emergency beacon, bright and repetitive on the subspace channels. Jag didn't know exactly what sort of communications capacities the Karelian Engineering Corporation provided its escape capsules, but he didn't imagine they'd be much. Before locking onto the pod, he scanned the subspace channels looking for any transmissions from the kind of local comlink the occupant, if there was one, would probably be using. He picked up various low-power transmissions, including just about every navigational beacon for a light month, before finally locking onto a faint voice, calling stridently, mm, Emergency! Someone answer me, please! I'm in need of assistance! Can anyone hear this? I'm... This is Colonel Jag Fell calling the occupant of Life Pod. He checked the ident number, visible on the stubby cylinder as it rotated into view. One one two V. Can you hear this? Yes. The reply was immediate and drenched with relief. Yes, I can. Thank the balance you found me. I was beginning to think my escape had all been for nothing. Jag fine-tuned his trim preparatory to coming in closer. The voice clearly did not belong to the Wookiee captain of the destroyed freighter. Want to tell me what happened back there? The drive failed in mid-jump, and I didn't know what to do to fix it. The Navi computer died in the energy surge following the engine failure. I was lucky that bucket of bolts made it as far as she did. Are there any other survivors there with you? Just me. The crew is dead, and good riddance to them as far as I'm concerned. Murderous fiends, every one of them. Jag hesitated. You killed them? Only in self-defense. The voice took on a more commanding tone. Look, are you here to rescue me, or ask questions? I'm trying to ascertain whom I'm rescuing, that's all. And what kind of monster you are, he added to himself. You want to know who I am? I'm Prime Minister Cundertall, that's who. And I'm ordering you to pull me up this instant. After all I've been through, I'm not going to let some rookie pilot fumble my rescue. You put me through to orbital control this instant, or so help me. I'll have your license faster than you can— I apologize, Prime Minister, Jack cut in, biting down on the reply he would have preferred to give. Bringing you up now. He pulled his clawcraft in closer to the pod. Magnetic clamps engaged, and he fired his thrusters only slightly more roughly than was necessary to bring the escape pod out of its headlong descent into the atmosphere. The roar of thrusters prevented further communication between Jag and his unlikely pillion rider, let alone orbital control. The Prime Minister was forced to ride out the long burn in silence, in whatever passed for acceleration straps among Corellian engineers. Although he probably had every reason to be impatient, if his use of words like escape and murderers was any indication of what he'd been through, Jag wasn't going to let him off easily. Rookie indeed. Seven of them, four humans, two Rodians, and that wretched Wookiee captain of theirs. I resisted, of course, but they took me by surprise. Once they'd smuggled me out of the Bakaran Senate complex, it was just a matter of getting me to the spaceport. No one stopped to question a group of traders carrying a crate of records, and not one person thought to scan the crate to make sure it contained what they said it did. The Prime Minister shook his head gravely. Someone's head will roll for this, mark my words. Prime Minister Cundertall was a big, solid man with thinning blonde hair and a pink hue to his skin. He held his age well, overpowering any hint of frailty with bluster and exaggerated gestures. Safely recovered from the escape pod, he was sitting on a bench outside Pride of Salonia's medical bay. Jag and Captain Maine sat with him. 
mane as tall as Cundertal, but half the weight, sat opposite him, her narrow features frozen in concentration. Only Jag, standing to one side, could see the tick pulsing in the skin beneath her shaved scalp. Go on, Prime Minister, he encouraged. What happened next? They took me aboard their ship and knocked me out. That's what happened next. Despite his outrage, it was obvious that Cundertal was enjoying relating the tale. When I woke up, we were in hyperspace. I had no idea where they were taking me. They'd stuck me away in an aft hold. Every now and then I would hear them talking, and it quickly became apparent that I wasn't, in fact, a hostage at all, as I had first suspected. From the little I could glean from the snatches of their conversations, I was to be taken somewhere and interrogated. Then I was to be disposed of. Luckily, though, they hadn't fastened my bindings properly, so with a bit of effort I managed to work my hands free. Did your captors say whom they were working for? Maine asked. Not in so many words. Whenever they referred to him, it was only ever as the boss, or her, of course, he added darkly. Well, Maine said, you should be pleased to know that your people made an arrest in your absence. Yesterday, Melinza Thanus was taken into custody and has been charged with conspiracy in disturbing the peace. It looks like your law enforcers could add attempted murder to those charges once we get you home, and you can tell them your story. Melinza? For a moment, Cundertal was nonplussed. Charged? No, I don't believe it. It's true, Jag said. Deputy Harris announced it himself. The Prime Minister retreated into his thoughts, clearly stunned by the news. So you freed yourself, Jag prompted after a moment. What then? Huh? Cundertal snapped out of his musings with a questioning look in his eyes. Then he said, Oh, my escape. Well, eventually one of them came back to check on me. I overpowered him and took his blaster. I left him trussed up in the binders they'd failed to secure on me. Then I crept forward to confront the others. There were three in the main cabin. They were surprised to see me up and about, as you can imagine. I confined them to a corner as two others arrived from the cockpit, leaving just the pilot in control of the vessel. It was five against one. Not good odds, even for someone who trained with the special Bakaran troops. Cundertal's chest puffed up in pride at this. I demanded to be returned, but was told that nothing could be done until the freighter had come out of its jump. I argued that they could cancel the jump and turn back immediately, but they continued to prevaricate with ridiculous excuses. It was obvious they were playing for time, though there was little I could do about it short of shooting one of them to let them know I was serious. But then that would have made me just as bad as them, right? He faced both Jag and Captain Maine in turn looking for approval. They nodded in response, but neither said anything. Anyway, Cundertal continued, we argued for a few minutes until the Wookiee tried to jump me, and I was forced to fire upon them. I had no choice. If I let them take me, then I was as good as dead. It was either kill or be killed. So I killed them. The Prime Minister looked down at his big hands as if disbelieving what they'd done. You did what you had to do, sir, Jag said after a moment. No one can blame you for that. Jag's reassuring words received a vague nod in reply, but it wasn't convincing. I didn't kill all of them, of course, Cundertal said, just the five who attacked me. The one I'd trussed up, he was still in the hold, and the pilot had stayed in the cockpit until the fighting was over. I tied him up, too, when he refused to do as I told him. From there it was just a matter of turning the ship around and coming home. All would have gone well, had the wreck not developed a raging case of system rot and fallen apart on me. When it came time to ditch it, the life support had failed in the aft holds, killing the two I'd tied up. Otherwise I would have brought them with me to stand trial. They got off lightly in the end. Death was too good for them. Far too good. Cundertal ground his teeth as if in frustration. He was clearly bitter, and rightfully so as far as Jag was concerned. From the entrance to the base, Salonia's chief meditech was listening closely to the tale. When it became apparent that the Prime Minister had finished, she stepped forward and said, Are you sure you're not hurt, sir? 
We really should examine you to see I'm fine, he interrupted, irritably waving her off. It takes more than a scuffle to put me down. The Meditech backed away with a bony shrug. Have you found any evidence in the wreckage? Kundertal asked Maine. None, I'm afraid. There was very little left of the craft. That's a shame, he muttered, because I want whoever was behind this to pay dearly. If the Kiramak has been deterred by my kidnapping, or worse, the consecration is cancelled entirely, but I don't know where that will leave us. We can't afford tension with the Puek, not with the Yuzhan Vong approaching us from the other side. Our defense fleet is stretched as it is without adding to our enemies. Do you know where your kidnappers were taking you? Jag asked. Because if we knew that, then we might— I'm sorry, young man, the Prime Minister said brusquely. But you must appreciate that I had more important things to worry about at the time, such as staying alive. I didn't have the luxury of sitting them down and interrogating them, as you seem to be doing to me right now. Jag felt himself flush at the accusation. Sir, I never meant in any way to— Cundertal cut off the apology with a grunt. When's that shuttle coming, he demanded, glancing at his chronometer. Soon, Prime Minister. Maine said pleasantly. General Panib is giving you a full military escort to avoid any further attempts on your life. In the meantime, you're safest here with us. Better safe than sorry, eh? The Prime Minister sniffed as he looked around at the cramped corridors of the frigate. I'm just glad to be alive. Something about the way Cundertal spoke those words told Jag that, perhaps for the first time since he'd been rescued, he was telling the whole truth. The Millennium Falcon, with Gina flying as escort, had left orbit barely an hour before the appearance of Jaunty Cavalier, heading planetside for a formal meeting with the Senate. The news of Cundertal's rescue and the destruction of the freighter came as they landed safely at Salis Dar spaceport. Tahiri watched over Hans and Leia's shoulders as Jaina climbed out of her starfighter to inspect security before anyone else disembarked. Leia frowned. You're saying he single-handedly overpowered a crew of seven? That's certainly not the Senator Cundertal I remember. I'm skeptical, too, Jag said from orbit, but I suppose it's not completely impossible. He's fit, and he had the element of surprise. One thing that really bothers me— is that he did it without taking any cuts or bruises. You're sure about that? Leia asked. I'm telling you, I stood right beside him as he told his story, and there wasn't a scratch on the man. Ever known anyone to come out of a fist fight without so much as a fat lip or a grazed knuckle? He's got a point, Han said. His posture indicated that he was devoting at least as much attention to Jaina's gesticulating at local security forces outside— as he was to Jag. But have you got anything else? Anything substantial? Nothing. He refused a medical exam. Todra's chief medico is a Duros, though, right? And if I recall, Kundertal is pro-human, through and through. Right, Leia? Definitely more than just a hint of empire, Jag. Leia confirmed. He could have simply wanted to avoid contact with an alien. Yet he signed an alliance with the Puek? He'd sign an alliance with an Arachnor if he thought it politically expedient, Leia said. Jag was silent for a second, then added, This might not mean anything either, then. But Cundertal was as surprised about Melinza Thanus's arrest as you were. That it was her, or that they'd caught her? I can't be positive, but I think the former. Well— Harris certainly seemed convinced of her guilt. It's possible my paranoia and suspicions are just getting the better of me, Jag conceded. But one thing I am sure of. Cundertal certainly isn't someone I'd want to spend any more time with than I have to. I was quite happy to leave him with Captain Maine until the Bakarin escort arrived. They've just left, so I'm happy to report he'll be all yours real soon. Outside the ship, Jaina made a great show of exasperation, then turned and headed to the Falcon, signing a surreptitious all-clear as she came, keeping the locals on their toes, Tahiri imagined. Okay, then, 
Han said as he brought the ship's systems one by one offline. Apart from the fact that you're suspicious of the Prime Minister, do you have anything more substantial to add? I guess not. And everything's under control up there now. The wreckage has been cleared, and our orbit corridor is clear. Good. Call us if anything else comes up. I think there's a meet-and-greet finally calling our name. Han killed the comlink and turned to face his wife, who was shaking her head. What? he asked, brow furrowed. I just find it amusing that someone who has navigated through his entire life on hunches could be so critical of someone else's. Han pulled an indignant face. Hey, I listened to what he had to say. It's just that I didn't think he gave us anything solid to go on, that's all. Is that the only reason? Tahiri couldn't see Leia's expression, but she imagined the princess to be smiling. Or could it be that you're feeling a little put out at the idea of Jaina having a boyfriend whose instincts are as sharp as yours? An performed a double-take that would have been amusing to watch had not Tahiri been acutely aware that she was listening in on a personal conversation. I'm going to leave the two of you to talk, Tahiri said, climbing from her seat. As she stepped from the cockpit, she heard the two start up again. As usual, there was no real malice in their argument. Beneath the words, Tahiri could always detect the affection that the two obviously held for each other. Outside the Falcon, the air was heavy with moisture and pollen. It was about mid-morning local time, and the temperature was rising. Within a minute, Tahiri could feel herself beginning to sweat, so she called on her Jedi training to regulate her temperature. The last thing she wanted to present to any official she met was a sweaty palm, either metaphorically or literally. A few minutes later, Han and Leia also emerged from the Falcon, judging by the way the princess was walking ahead of her husband and shaking her head. Tahiri guessed their friendly squabble was still taking place. At least he's got good taste, she heard Han say to Leia as they reached the base of the freighter's landing ramp. Any response Leia might have had to this went unheard, however, because at that moment Jaina stepped over to greet her mother and father. They exchanged a few words together, but the combination of the distance and their hushed voices made it impossible for Tahiri to hear what was being said, although she presumed it to be about the current situation as Jaina saw it. Whatever, it was clearly something they didn't feel concerned her, so Tahiri decided not to intrude upon the discussion. Instead, she checked out the docking bay they'd been assigned. Apart from the Falcon and Jaina's X-Wing, it was completely empty, as requested by the Princess, and had only the one exit in the far corner. Through the transparasteel door of this exit, Tahiri could make out a small collection of dignitaries and guards. For some reason, the sight of their drab green uniforms all in a row made her feel uncomfortable, and one of the three scars on her temple began to itch. When she caught herself scratching at it, she quickly stopped, self-consciously lowering her hand and placing it behind her back. She still didn't know why this happened, but it bothered her that it did. It brought back memories. Brought back dreams. She turned away from the sight of the dignitaries beyond the transparasteel doors, and as she did so, caught sight of a technician approaching the Millennium Falcon, a long black cable clutched in one hand. He was moving furtively, coming up behind where Jaina and her parents stood. At least Tahiri assumed it was a he. The oversuit that the tech wore was designed to protect its wearer from hostile environments, and as such was too heavy and bulky to reveal the being's gender or even species. She knew that Han hadn't authorized any maintenance on his ship while they were docked, though, so she stepped forward to intercept the tech before he could get any closer. Hey, she called. You're not supposed to be here. The suited figure hesitated, then changed direction to head toward Tahiri. She stopped in her tracks, the grip on her lightsaber instinctively tightening. Hold it right there, she warned. I bring a message, the figure said. The voice issuing from inside his helmet was distorted like a stormtrooper's. Tahiri's brow creased with suspicion. What kind of message? And who's it for? Han Solo, the technician said. I need to tell him to be careful. Things here are not as they seem. Things rarely are these days, she returned. 
Her grip on the lightsaber eased slightly. The precise form of the person inside the suit was hidden, but her instincts were clear. You're a Rian, aren't you? The figure seemed slightly taken aback. How did you— I met one of you on Galantos, she explained. More confident now, she took another two steps forward. He was the one who suggested we come here, actually. He told us that— She stopped in mid-sentence when the helmet shook. Now is not the time, the Rin said, glancing around. I shall contact you again later. For now, though, please pass on my message to Captain Solo. Tahiri nodded. Okay, but you're not really telling him anything new. He's always careful, and I think he's already guessed that something strange is going on here. The Rin didn't seem to be listening. He glanced around as though fearful he might be seen talking to her out in the open. I must go, he said. You've been allocated quarters, should you wish to stay longer than today. I urge you to take them. You'll find what you need there. Without another word, the Rin turned and made his way back the way he'd come. Tahiri stood watching him. She was finding herself becoming increasingly intrigued by the Rin and their guarded hints. Trouble, Tahiri? She jumped at Han's voice so close to her shoulder. She shook her head conscious of the security guards watching them closely from the edge of the landing field. Han glowered at the Rin's retreating back. There'd better not be, he said. What did he say, anyway? Tahiri lowered her voice. That was our contact, the Rin. He said to tell you that things here aren't what they seem. Han rolled his eyes. When are they ever? Tahiri smiled nervously. That's just what I said. Anything else? She repeated what the Rin had told her about accepting an offer of accommodation. Han nodded, casting one final glance at the Rin as if tempted to follow him. Okay. He put an arm about her shoulder and guided her back to where the others stood waiting. It's nothing, he called to them. Let's get on with it. Jaina gave Tahiri a penetrating once-over as she joined the group but nothing further was said. Together they walked to where the security guards awaited them. As the uniformed guards surrounded them to escort them through the doors, Tahiri found herself filled with misgivings. It felt like they'd done all this before. The harsh white light of reflected sunlight belied the cold heart of Scylla. The briefest orbital scan of the ice-bound world revealed dozens of glaciers around the equator as well as solid ice shelves that covered vast expanses of the planet. It made other frozen worlds like Hoth look positively temperate. And yet, incredibly, it was inhabited. Huge cities skated the glacial fields like Moon Calamari water skimmers, riding the near-geologic flow of ice. Others buried themselves deep under the cold, tunneling into bedrock in search of geothermal warmth far below. Chilly, Jason said, staring in muted awe out at the swarms of clawcraft that silently flanked Jade Shadow as she arrived in orbit. Images of the Chiss home planet had previously been non-existent. Luke and Mars' last expedition to Chiss space, years earlier, had taken them nowhere near the heart of the alien empire. You talking about the planet or this reception? Danny asked. Jason smiled at the quip. You'd think with the pick of any of the worlds in the unknown regions that they'd have chosen one a bit more agreeable than this one. I mean, why stay here when there are so many warmer climates nearby? Sheer obstinacy, Mara answered from her position in Jade Shadow's pilot seat. You've seen how Jag and his pilots operate. Well, multiply that by ten, and you might come up with something that approximates your average chiss. Remember, Vanguard Squadron represents the imaginative, risk-taking extreme. The everyday stubbornness you'll find on Scylla would even make the huts look accommodating. A brisk voice advised the incoming delegation from the Galactic Alliance of their allotted orbit. You will not deviate from this vector, they were warned, unless instructed to do so. We understand, Mara replied, unable to hold the irritation from her voice. But is there someone who can 
Commander Erolia is the intermediary you have been allocated. She will attend you on this frequency and address any queries or concerns you may have at this time. With that, the line went dead. Looks like our friend Commander Erolia beat us here, Mara said. Well, at least it'll be a familiar voice, Jason said. Ask for her, Luke said from the navigator's chair. Tell her we want permission to send a landing party. Are you sure that's a good idea? Which, landing or asking? Luke smiled fleetingly. Then soberly he added, Listen, Mara, if it's not safe to deal with the Chiss now, with Imperials on our side, I fear it never will be. Mara acquiesced without further comment, and Jason leaned back in his seat to listen to the conversation. It was brief, as expected. Erolia replied to Mara's request with a briskness suggesting that she had anticipated it days ago. She gave them a window and uploaded a re-entry corridor to R2-D2's navigation banks. The stubby droid whistled to indicate that he'd received it, and that was that. Do you require the shuttle? Captain Yage asked over the command frequency. I think we'll take Shadow down this time, Luke said. Instruct Hagerty to gear up and, actually, Soren Hagerty won't be going along on this trip, Gage cut in. The incident on Manlali Mafir proved a little too much for the doctor. She's opted to stay aboard and sit this one out, if that's all right. Jason could see his uncle's disappointment. Since leaving on this mission, the doctor and Lieutenant Stalgis had assisted Luke and his party on a number of occasions. His uncle was thankful for this, as it reflected cooperation between the Empire and the Galactic Federation of Free Alliances. And the more this could be seen happening, the easier it would be to sway the cynics in the Alliance. Her decision to sit this mission out would no doubt start rumors among those cynics. Okay, he said, nodding. Can you organize us a ground party? That window's in an hour, so we'll need to move quickly. Testing our metal, Gage said, almost audibly grinding her teeth. We're more than a match for that trumped-up power princess. Luke smiled at his wife as Gage closed the line. I think Aurelia might have won herself an enemy. Not hard, Mara agreed. After all, the commander isn't particularly trying to make any friends. A thought struck Jason then. Do you think she's been sent to us deliberately? Luke turned in his seat. To see how we'll react? He thought for a moment. Could be that someone much higher up than Erolia is testing us. Don't worry, Mara said. Arian is right. We're more than ready for the Chiss. I've no doubt about that, Luke said. He faced the front again. But it's not Chiss I'm worried about. Jade Shadow came in low over the western arm of what would have been a crescent-shaped continent on a more temperate planet. Deep surface radar revealed scoured rock two kilometers down, buckled and split by the weight of the ice above. Milk channels and refreezing fissures had created a fiendishly complicated network of caves and tunnels throughout the ice, and it was in these tunnels that the Chiss had built the city of Axiel. Above the ice shelf, all that was visible was an equilateral triangle consisting of three craterous spaceports linked by lines of towers that could have been massive observation antenna and weapons installations. Or perhaps, Jason thought, just there to intimidate. The wind howled like a lovelorn wampa, tearing at the hull of Jade Shadow as Mara brought her down to the spaceport they'd been allocated. Her hands moved deftly over the controls, guiding the ship with natural ease. Back in the passenger bay, Jason waited with the rest of the landing party. Outside, heat differentials whipped the storms into a fury creating an illusion of dynamic processes that might eventually lead to life. But the ice always won out in the end. Where water froze, only the meanest organisms could evolve, and only the toughest survive. 
The Chiss clearly fit into the latter category, clinging to their world tooth and claw, no matter how much it tried to freeze them out. Danny followed Jason to the airlock when they had touched down. Ready when you are, she said as the airlock hissed open. Together they stepped outside. He had expected to find himself in the middle of an icy storm, but instead the air was warm and still. They had landed inside a large docking bay that was sealed against the elements by a flickering force field high above. The ferrocrete platform beneath his feet was clean and dry, and sloped down to where a small welcoming party waited for them. Seven officers dressed in purple and black uniforms stood to attention, their blue skins looking like marble under the arc lights. Jason couldn't tell if Commander Erolia was one of them, but he offered a small wave of acknowledgment anyway. There was no response. Nothing untoward, he sent to Mara and Luke via comlink. Moments later they joined him and Danny outside Jade Shadow. Luke came first, followed by Lieutenant Stalgis and Mara. A second stormtrooper would stay with Jade Shadow along with Tekli and Saba. The airlock sealed behind them. There was a brief pause during which nothing happened. They simply stood awkwardly by the airlock, waiting. You know, I expected the Chiss to be more punctual, Luke said. Jason caught the wink that his uncle sent Mara. Perhaps we caught them with their pants down, he put in. At that moment the formation of guards dissolved. Two people walked through the entrance behind them and up the ramp to where Jade Shadow had settled. One of them was Commander Erolia, her expression as steely as her hair was black. The other was a human, a solid muscular man of about Luke's height, completely bald, he had a thin mouth, deep-set eyes, and a nose, large enough to rival a Toydarian's. When he spoke, he made no pretense of welcome. "'I am Chief Navigator Pyta Abe,' he said, his voice as sharp as the creases in his uniform. He came to a halt before them, his cold gaze touching each of them in turn. "'We have made arrangements for you to meet with the necessary authorities.' "'Wouldn't you like to know who we are?' Luke asked. Abe's attention settled on the Jedi Master, with an expression that suggested he was making the best of a bad situation. That isn't necessary. Commander Erolia has ensured that we have the relevant information. If you will come this way. Abe turned to lead them across the docking bay. Wait a second, Mara said. I'd like to know more about you first. You're human. He didn't attempt to hide his annoyance as he swung around. And that troubles you. No, of course not. It's just that apart from Admiral Park and Sunter Fell, I wasn't aware that any others had joined the Chiss. Many would have, but few were accepted. Abe's frosty facade melted for a moment, allowing a glimpse of burning pride beneath. I serve Assistant Syndic Fell in his absence. My origins are not important. He turned and continued down the ramp. Erolia waited to ensure that they followed, then did the same. Assistant Syndic Fell? Jason thought as they followed the Chiss officer. The Baron must have been promoted. Whether that was a good thing, though, he couldn't decide. A cheery lot, aren't they? Danny mumbled as they walked. Be that as it may, Jason replied. I'd sooner deal with them than the Kriz laws any day. As they passed through the exit from the docking area, the seven guards standing there fell in line behind them. Where are we going? Mara asked. I have already told you, Abe said gruffly. You told us that we were going to meet the necessary authorities, but you haven't told us who they are or where we're being taken to meet with them. Abe strode a few more paces before speaking again. Is that really important at this time? Mara rolled her eyes at Luke, clearly annoyed with the evasive responses. You tell me. Is it? Surprisingly, it was Arolia who answered Mara's initial question. You are being taken, 
to meet representatives of the four families and Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet. Mara half turned to face the woman as they walked. There we will discuss the role the Chiss will play in your mission. You work for the Nuruodo family, Mara said. That's military and foreign affairs, right? Irulia didn't answer. She didn't need to. The Chiss didn't give anything away, but the broad structure of their government was common knowledge. Jason knew that four families dominated public affairs. Nuruodo, Shapla, Inrokini, and Sabasen. The Shapla oversaw resource distribution, agriculture, and other colonial affairs. Industry, science, and communications were the concern of the Inrokini. The Sabasen ensured that justice, health, and education services were maintained equitably across the colonies. Which of the families do you work for, Chief Navigator Abe? Jason asked. I work for none of them, their stiff-backed guide said without so much as a glance in Jason's direction. I am employed by the CEDF. The fleet is always in need of those with experience outside the inhabited territories. Incursions from the Cyruvian Imperium and the Yuzhan Vong, Iroli explained. Plus our experience with Grand Admiral Thrawn taught us that insularity could be a weakness as well as a strength. It's not enough to be strong. A truly successful culture needs to be flexible as well. And in order to be flexible, we must look beyond what we consider familiar. We must come to know our neighbors as well as we know ourselves. Most governments would open diplomatic ties, Mara said. Either that or just send in spies. Those are methods we have certainly tried, and indeed, to an extent, still employ. After all, we are talking to you now, are we not? Her smile flickered briefly. However, sometimes we find that integration is the optimal way to achieve our goals. Your former emperor accepted Thrawn as an ally because he was a brilliant strategist, despite his non-human origins. So, too, are we prepared to accept non-chis into our fold. Would you accept a Cyru into the fold? Or perhaps a Yuzhan Vong? Irolia didn't miss a step. She regarded Luke, who had offered the challenge, with not the slightest change in expression. If they were exceptionally talented and trustworthy, she said, then yes, of course. Jason was unsettled by the response and he sensed the others were too. It wasn't hard to understand. The pain of loss was still fresh in the hearts and minds of everyone around him. Lieutenant Stalgis had lost many troopers and friends on Bastion. Danny had seen her colleagues die on Belkaden, right at the start of the war, and had probably seen more death and mayhem as a result of the Yuzhan Vong than anyone Jason knew. Mara had almost lost her infant son Ben on Coruscant, and Jason himself still felt the terrible absence of his brother Anakin in his heart. His uncle's feelings were kept carefully hidden, and Jason wondered what he was thinking. Intellectually, he knew that at some point loss had to be put aside to make room for hope. Clinging to the past only made the future that much harder to achieve, and it was only in the future, ultimately, that peace lay. With Erolia's comment having effectively killed any further discussion, the party continued along in gloomy silence. In the absence of any conversation, Jason studied their surroundings, his curiosity piqued by the strange, translucent substance that made up the walls. It appeared to be ice, but when he reached out to touch it, he found it warm and dry. Visible in the substance every meter or so was a frame of silver metal that seemed to define the box-like corridors, each possessing a green light that flickered on as they approached, and then switched off after they had passed. At first glance he could see no discernible reason for the frame's existence, although he had no doubt that they performed some function. The chist didn't seem the types to enjoy decoration for its own sake. Danny noticed his interest. 
Field generators, she whispered. He frowned, momentarily puzzled. Field generators? Why should they need field generators to hold their corridors together? Surely the power drain would outweigh any possible security benefit. Then it hit him. The walls really were made of ice. The field generators provided a boundary between the bubble of warm air in which they walked and the slippery surface beneath their feet. They also kept the cold at bay and stopped the ice from melting. The generators switched on as they approached and switched off as they passed, meaning that the power drain on each unit was minimized. Overall, the cost would be much less than sealing and heating every single cubic meter of the tunnels, especially when the cost of manufacturing and laying insulated materials around the tunnels was factored in. It was an elegant solution to a tricky problem, particularly in areas that weren't frequently traveled. Jason was impressed. Eventually, they came to an area that was insulated and sealed with more conventional materials. His ears popped as they passed the last of the field generators, and the heated bubble dissolved around him. A smell of flowers struck him, and he found himself in a wide, tiered space that was thick with vegetation. The ceiling hung at least twenty meters above, with a bright tube that ran its length, lighting the area. The atmosphere was peaceful and serene, and Jason's first impression was that it was a residential space, perhaps an underground park for the public. However, he soon dismissed the idea when he realized that, apart from themselves, there was no one else present. For that matter, he hadn't seen anyone other than their escort since they'd arrived at Axio. All the corridors they'd walked down had been empty. Whatever the reason for this was, he didn't have time to ponder it. Chief Navigator Abe had led them to one of three doors on the far side of the garden-like area, and was now impatiently trying to hurry them through. Jason and the others complied, filing into a relatively small and circular room, containing a dozen black chairs set around an equally circular table. The walls, floor, and ceiling were black also, while tiny globes floating high above stabbed beams of light through the room's shadows to give prominence to the chairs around the table below. On the far side of the chamber, opposite where they'd entered, was another door. Taking the seat nearest to him, Abe indicated for the others to sit also. They did so, occupying a semicircle of chairs opposite him. All except Stalgis, that is, who opted to remain at the door with Erolia. Guarding the guard, perhaps, Jason thought. The door behind Abe slid open without a sound, and four figures entered the room. Their faces were hidden by hoods, and each of their head-to-foot robes was a different color. Bronze, rust-red, silver-gray, and copper-green. Without a word, they took seats at seemingly random positions around the circle, spreading themselves out on either side of Abe. An awkward silence followed, only broken when Mara asked, So, do we find out now who we're talking to? No, said the hooded figure in bronze, a woman with a rich contralto voice. Just as our families are defined by their function in society, so are we defined by our roles as representatives of those families. We are here before you not as people, but as the beginning and end points of a decision-making process. No names? Mara asked, not attempting to hide her annoyance. No names, agreed the green-robed figure. This one was a male, and young by the sound of his voice. But you know who we are. As is our right, Bronze said. After all, it is you who come to us for help. You do not need to know who acts on behalf of the Chiss. We represent everyone. You must tell us what it is you want, said the figure in rust red. Gray nodded in agreement. Then we can give you our decision. We do not decide lightly, Copper Green added. But our decision will be final, Bronze concluded. Do you agree to these conditions? 
What if we don't? Mara asked, resting back in her seat and folding her arms defiantly across her chest. Then you will be asked to leave, Abe said. His tone left no doubt that asked to leave was a euphemism. Our request is simple, Luke said, heading off a protest from Mara. We are looking for the living planet, Sonama Seacoat. We have reason to believe that it might be hiding in what we refer to as the Unknown Regions. As the major power in these regions, you have every right to question our presence here. It is my hope that you will assist us, either passively by permitting us to cross your borders unhindered, or actively by allowing us access to any information you have on the subject. That is all? Gray asked, possibly surprised by the simplicity of the request. Luke nodded. That is all. And what have you achieved in your quest so far? Bronze asked. Luke explained where their mission had taken them, outlining the numerous systems they'd surveyed on the inner edge of the unknown regions, the various civilizations they had briefly touched upon, the hints of Zonama Seacoat they had received. Invariably, the clues came to them in the form of a story told by grandparents or a dimly recalled memory. Their efforts had been frustrated by the absence of solid evidence. Since the planet had a tendency to avoid systems containing any sort of advanced civilization, there were no actual physical records to prove that it had ever really been anywhere. It was as if they were chasing a ghost that had vanished decades ago. And yet despite this, you seem confident of success, Copper Green said. We would not have taken on the mission in the first place had we not believed it achievable, Luke said and we will do what we must to ensure its success. And why must you do this exactly? Rust, the second woman of the four, sounded genuinely puzzled. Commander Erodia is uncertain on this point. Although she believes that you are trustworthy, your goal seems incredible and your motives are obscure. You cannot blame us for being cautious. Luke sighed. No, I cannot. And if I were you, I would be wary too. I can only say that we are willing to take any steps you require in order to demonstrate our veracity in this matter. Except discontinue your quest, Gray said. Except that, yes. We will continue to search for Zonama Seacoat with or without your help. There was a moment's silence in which Jason sensed that the Chiss representatives were conferring behind their hoods, but he couldn't read exactly what it was they were saying. Strong-willed people were notoriously hard to read, and the Chiss were about as strong-willed as a race could be. What of this new alliance of yours? Bronze asked. Are we required to join it? No, Luke said although the fact that we have common enemies suggests that there might be advantages in doing so someday. Indeed, there might be, Rust said, nodding slowly. On the matter of your presence within our borders, Copper Green said, it is an issue upon which we find ourselves somewhat divided. Two of our number are willing to allow you free access to Chiss territories, Gray said, on the grounds that... There is little you will find here that either we do not already know or will do us harm. If Zonama Seacoat truly existed within our borders, Bronze added, we would surely know about it already. On the other hand, Copper Green said, the vagueness of your motives calls into question the true purpose of your mission. It can be argued that the issue of Zonama Seacoat is a cover for something more sinister. Well, it is true. Rust said, that we have as yet seen no evidence of hostile intent. Your presumption to come here without first asking questions is arrogance of the First Order, and should not be encouraged. So we find ourselves at an impasse, Bronze said. A tie, Copper Green said. Gray inclined his head. This is not an uncommon situation, given the diversity of our needs. As in all such situations, 
we turn to the expansionary defense fleet to cast the deciding vote. Rust turned to her left. Chief Navigator Abe? Jason inwardly groaned. There was no way Abe was going to vote in their favor. The ex-imperial looked superciliously down his nose at Luke and the others seated before him. The case seems quite clear to me, he said. We cannot allow intruders to travel unchecked through our territory, for that would betray the trust of the Chis people. There have been numerous incursions of late by the Yuzhan Vong, and any relaxation of security now will only encourage such problems to go unnoticed. From the position of internal as well as external security, I advise that we do not give permission for this expedition to freely wander Chis space. Both Luke and Mara moved simultaneously, as though each was about to protest the decision. However, Abe went on, raising a hand to cut off whatever it was they'd been about to say. I am reasonably certain that the Skywalker's intentions are honorable, and it is not in the Chiss nature to turn away those genuinely in need. Therefore, in the interest of good relations— and the hope that something may actually come of this quest, I would like to suggest a compromise. The thing the Skywalkers need, more than freedom of access, is information. No single mission could cover the entire unknown regions in a practical amount of time, even with the records of the Imperial Remnant as a guide. I propose that the Skywalkers and their allies be given full access to the Expeditionary Library here on Scylla, in order that they might conduct their search in safety. Mara sank uncertainly into her seat, while Luke beside her could only lift his eyebrows in surprise. Jason had to admit that Abe's suggestion did make a kind of sense, although exactly for whom it was safer remained unclear. Was the chief navigator referring to the crews of Jade Shadow and Widowmaker? Or was he implying that Chiss space would be better off without these ships roaming through it? Either way, Jason was as surprised as his uncle that the ex-imperial officer had actually suggested it at all. There is one condition, Abe said. Ah, Jason thought, here comes the catch. I would not want the Galactic Federation of Free Alliances to mistake our intentions. Abe continued. This offer should be open for a strictly limited period. If the Skywalkers and their companions have failed to find what they require within that time, then the offer will be rescinded, and they will be required to immediately leave Chiss space. How long do you think will be necessary? Copper Green asked. Two standard days should be sufficient. Abe replied. After all, how hard can it be to search for a living planet that appears and disappears across the galaxy? There are only so many legends one can trace, and our library is second to none. The four-robed figures nodded in unified agreement. We regard this as an acceptable compromise, Bronn said. Master Skywalker? Luke straightened his shoulders and rose to his feet. I accept the terms of your offer. Jason sensed Mara begging to differ, but outwardly she agreed. Then you are free to begin whenever you wish, Bronze said. All four representatives rose from their seats in unison, but it was Gray who spoke. A guide from the Enrokini family will be assigned to instruct you on the use of the library. If you are ready, Chief Navigator Abe and Commander Erolia will take you there now. Thank you. Luke said, bowing. That concludes our business, Rust said. Without another word, she and the others turned and walked from the room. That's it? Mara said, watching their backs disappear through the far door. What more do you want? Abe asked. We have been generous with our time, and we will continue to be generous with our resources. There is no obligation to help you hanging over our head. You should be... He stopped and shook his head. I was about to say grateful, but that would be incorrect. 
Gratitude is an emotional response, not necessarily contingent on what has been offered. Appropriately honored might be closer to what I meant to say. We are, Luke said, and we are also keen to start work as soon as possible. He indicated the door. May we? Abe nodded as he made for the door, saying, I'm glad to see at least one of you appreciates the way of the chiss. The doors opened into the garden-like hall, and Aurelia and Abe led the party through. They had barely traveled half the hall's length when a tall figure stepped out of a small niche to intercept the group. Broad-shouldered and as solid as a wall, he stood in front of them as though daring them to try to get past him. A black patch covered one eye, matching his uniform. Iron streaked his black hair and goatee. Mara Jade, he said, we meet again. She moved forward a step while Jason and the others stopped. That's Mara Jade Skywalker, Suntir Fell, she replied. Fell nodded in acknowledgment, but made no effort to correct himself. Chief Navigator Abe had led us to believe that you were absent, Mara commented. That is patently not the case. So were you just avoiding us earlier? Avoiding the decision-making process, yes. Fell's voice was gravelly but strong. Jason could see where Jagged Fell inherited his father's presence, if not his width. My thoughts were not unclouded by emotions over this issue. I recalled offering you an alliance some time ago. Mara nodded. The irony wasn't lost on me, either. You didn't take it then, yet you expect us to take yours now. The enormous frame of the man who had once been the Empire's greatest TIE fighter pilot shifted minutely. It might have been a shrug, Jason thought. It is the way of the chiss, he went on, to stand down and let another decide when one is unable to be impartial. I trusted Pyta to view with clarity what I could not. Fell's gaze was as cold and sharp as an ice dagger. Jason didn't understand where the man's hostility came from. It was one thing to be old enemies, but that didn't explain the passion that so obviously burned behind the man's gaze. Luke moved to stand beside his wife. I believe we reached a satisfactory conclusion. He held out his hand. Under other circumstances, perhaps it'd be a pleasure, soon dear. Fell hesitated, then returned the gesture, gripping Luke's hand in his enormous fist. We're not allies yet, Skywalker. But we're not enemies either. Surely that counts for something. Mara made a show of glancing at her chronometer. We should really be going, she said. Those two days aren't going to stick around forever. Indeed, Fell said. His dark gaze swept the group gathered behind the Skywalkers. The Expeditionary Library is some distance from here, in another enclave. Rather than move your ship, I suggest you allow me to provide your transport. The resources at my disposal are more secure than even those the Chiss normally offer. Luke hesitated, and Jason could sense his uncle conferring with Mara. He was sure that Luke's concerns reflected his own reservations. Abe's decision to allow them access to the library had surprised him, but Jason could see how it might be a ploy to separate them from the ship, and he knew Mara wouldn't want to be any farther from Jade's shadow than was absolutely necessary. But did they dare risk offending Fell by refusing his offer? Or could they afford the time it would take to move their own ship when a convenient alternative was available? After all, as Mara had said, two days wasn't a lot of time to play with. Thank you, Luke said in the end. Your offer would certainly save us some time. But if you try anything soon here, Mara let the threat go unstated but there was no mistaking it in her tone or body language. Fell almost smiled. Believe me, 
If I had wanted to try something, I would have done so long before now. He turned away. Time is wasting. We cannot afford to be standing here chatting like fools. If you're going to come with me, then I suggest you do so now, because the deadline is not going to change. You'll make sure of that, will you? Mara asked. He fixed her with another steely gaze. You can count on it, Mara Jade Skywalker. Gina was exhausted by the time they returned to their quarters after the first day on Bakara. The meeting with the Senate had been postponed so Prime Minister Kundertal could attend, leaving them stuck with junior officials and restless flunkies. When the time finally came, the presence of the Galactic Alliance delegation was completely swamped by Kundertal's triumphant appearance and the banquet that followed. His long, somewhat rambling and self-congratulatory speech was greeted with cheers from the Senate and the press galleries, but left her agreeing with Jag's impression. The Prime Minister of Bakara was a good-looking figurehead, but a little too obsessed with his own interests to be a good statesperson. Nevertheless, the banquet hadn't been too bad. Men and women in formal attire had provided attentive service, rather than droids, making Jaina feel very out of place in her expedition uniform. The food had been excellent, and she'd had the chance to sample some of the Namana nectar she'd heard so much about, a liqueur the Bakarans were particularly proud of. And rightfully so, she had to admit. Orange in color, it caressed her taste buds like a slow, burning ray of sunlight. She'd only taken a sip, However, she didn't want her reflexes dulled. Judging by its effects on the people around her, her decision had been a wise one. Two people who had also stayed resolutely sober were Kundertal and his deputy, Blaine Harris. She wondered if that explained her impression that, despite the seemingly friendly and polite exchanges between them, underneath the surface simmered a powerful tension. It might have been a mutual dislike of each other, but... Why that should be exactly, Jaina wasn't sure. They were political running mates, after all. It could have been nothing more than the fact that both were powerful personalities and dominating men. Working together in such close but clearly defined roles would undoubtedly chafe. Still, it made her curious. She wondered how Harris had felt upon receiving the news of Kundertal's kidnapping. She imagined that part of him would have been secretly relieved to be rid of him. If the Prime Minister died or disappeared, his deputy would be the natural successor. The question of whether Harris had been involved in the kidnapping itself, therefore, had to be asked. And if he had, then Melinda Thanis's arrest would have been little more than a deliberate attempt by Harris to find a scapegoat. Really, though, there was nothing she could pin down to justify either Jag's nebulous suspicions or her own. Kundertal's force presence was strong and clear. He was who he said he was, and his thoughts were his own. Even Lawthon, the Preck advance leader, seemed nothing but pleased at Kundertal's return. A little relieved, perhaps, but that was understandable, given that the consecration of Bakara was due to take place the very next day. With Kundertal back and the popular leader of the resistance behind bars, there was no reason for the Kiramak to further delay its arrival. The dull-scaled Saurian hadn't partaken of the local delicacies, preferring instead to stick to a dish of fft, a multi-legged lizard that had been imported from Olhuek especially for the occasion. Throughout the banquet, he seemed to be carefully observing the people and the goings-on around him, and although Jaina's eyes met his on several occasions, she found his golden gaze completely unreadable. Anyone else feel like we're the odd ones out? Han asked collapsing onto a floating couch. Their rooms weren't as finely appointed as the ones they'd had on Galantos, but that suited Jaina just fine. Too much hospitality only made her edgy. They're just caught up in their own affairs. As was often the case, Leia's input on the matter was in opposition to her husband's, but to show she wasn't being argumentative, she sat on the couch beside Han and took his hand in hers. She didn't mean to be contrary. She simply wanted to make sure that every situation was properly viewed from all angles. It had taken Jaina a long time to understand the way her mother's mind worked. 
something her twin brother seemed to have picked up instinctively a long time ago. They'll get around to us when they have reason to. Perhaps they should be reminded of those reasons, Jana said, talking over her shoulder as she set up the same anti-bugging equipment they'd used on Galantos. They've got problems a simple treaty isn't going to fix, because if that illegal transmission we received is anything to go by, then the resistance infiltrators are high up the command chain. Locking Melinza Thanus away isn't going to magically erase that fact. If anything, it could make it worse. In the corner of her eye she noticed Tahiri moving restlessly through the rooms, as if searching for something, and wondered what the younger Jedi was doing. It depends on what they want, Leia was saying. One group seems in favor of an alliance with the Puek as opposed to an alliance with us. Another wants nothing to do with the Puek. She shrugged. If our being here exposes the cracks in the underground, then that might be a good thing. Instead of one concentrated assault on the local government, their objectives may fragment, resulting in a number of small and relatively ineffectual attacks. Scattershot might be inaccurate, Han said, absently playing with Leia's fingers in his hand. But it usually hits something. Personally, I'd rather be on the receiving end of a single sniper than a dozen people spraying wildly. At least with a sniper, you know when the threat is. He stopped mid-sentence, his attention also caught by Tahiri's unusual behavior. Now she was inspecting the underside of an antique drink cabinet. Tahiri, Leia said, what are you... Aha! Tahiri stood bolt upright, brandishing a small object in her outstretched hand. This is it! Jaina and her parents exchanged confused looks. This is what? Jaina asked. Tahiri brought the thing closer for the others to see. Jaina leaned in to examine the object and found it to be a metallic capsule no larger than a baby's tooth. The Rin said we'd find what we needed here, Tahiri said. This has to be it. The Rin? Leia repeated. Han quickly outlined what he had learned about Tahiri's encounter with the Rin on the landing field. Did he say anything else? Leia asked Tahiri. Only that... He thought you should be careful, Tahiri told her. But he couldn't talk properly there, so he said he'd contact us later. Perhaps that's what this is, a note of some kind. She fiddled with the capsule, turning it over in her hands and picking at a seam around its middle. Nothing happened until she squeezed it between two fingers. Then one end clicked, and there was a brief but intense flash of light. Jaina blinked in surprise, waiting for something else to happen. But nothing did. The capsule was inert again, and no matter how much Tahiri poked at the thing, she couldn't get it to repeat the flash of light. That can't be right, the young Jedi muttered. You'd think he'd make sure it worked before leaving it for us. Excuse me, Mistress Leia, C-3PO said. But... Han raised a hand to motion him to be quiet. Hang on, Goldenrod. We're busy right now trying to figure out how this thing works. But, sir, the droid said, I already know how it works. All four stopped what they were doing and turned to C-3PO. Well? Han asked after almost fifteen seconds. Come on. It would seem, sir, C-3PO said, that the flash of light contained a compressed message a holographic page of writing, to be precise. My photoreceptors were able to collect the data and store it in my memory banks. A note? Tahiri asked excitedly. What does it say? It appears to be written in an obscure given code. But can you translate it? The droid bristled at the very idea he might not be able to. Of course. The message reads... Melinza Thanus has information you will need. She is being held in cell 1217 of the Salus Dar Penitentiary. You can gain access through rear entrance 23 at midnight tonight. The code word is Fringe Dweller. I will try to contact you properly tomorrow. 
Gina committed the details to memory. Is that all? I'm afraid so, Mistress Gina. It's not much, is it? Tahiri put in, disappointed. It's enough for now, Leia said. I'll go and find out what Melinza has to say as soon as the time is right. Jaina shook her head. Let me go, she said. You'll be missed. They'll expect you to stay to investigate the situation with the Pwack. If you sent me or Dad in your place, they'll wonder why. Will Melinza listen to you, though? Leia asked. Right now she has no more reason to trust you than we have to trust her. I'll just have to use my winning ways, I guess. Besides, it's not as if she's going to find many willing ears in prison. This could be the last chance she gets. Okay. Leia stood and put a hand on her daughter's shoulder. But be careful, won't you? Gina smiled, then brushed off her mother's concern, sweet though it was, and went to her room to prepare. Halt! The image of a guard appeared in the stolen villip. Nomanor watched as the shamed one carrying the villip, cunningly concealed in a dead and hollowed Casnell vase, unhesitatingly obeyed the warrior's command, as would be expected of a member of the lowest social class who had just wandered into Lord Shimra's antechambers. The guard advanced slowly upon the shamed one, his face set in a sneer. In your haste to rejoin Yun Shuno, you have forgotten that no one enters these chambers without permission from the Supreme Overlord himself. He stopped a couple of paces from the shamed one, his grotesque visage thrust into close focus. Explain why it is that your vile presence now dirties these floors. I... I was sent by High Priest Jakan, stammered Nomanor's spy. She had practiced the excuse many times before leaving on her mission, but it had never before sounded so unconvincing. He or ordered me to present this offering. Lies! The warrior's amphistaff uncurled from around his uniformed waist, snapping into an attack position. You'll tell me what it is you are doing here, and then, for your transgressions, you'll feel the wrath of Lord Shimra's palace guard. As the warrior took another step closer, the shamed one dropped to her knees, clutching the Casnell vase and the villip within to her chest. Please. Numanor couldn't see her face, but he could imagine her fear. Your begging is an affront to all you, Jean Vong, the warrior growled as he raised his amphistaff. Prepare to die. Gee, die. The shamed one screeched suddenly, her tone no longer obsequious and sniveling. As was planned, she triggered the patch at the base of the casnel with the palm of her hand. Ganner! The image died with the villip and the shamed one a split second before the amphistaff came crashing down. The last thing Nomanor saw of the antechamber was the twisted and hateful snarl of the warrior. She wasn't supposed to say anything about the Jedi, he said using the infidel pronunciation he had become accustomed to during years of undercover work. A rising tide of anger was hard to contain. They had been so close. Atraoth was devoted to the cause, Shun Mai said. He stood to one side of Nomanor's new throne, situated in a hiding place that was far removed from the last one. The former shamed one was clearly uneasy in the aftermath of their failed attempt to infiltrate Shimra's chambers. She went willingly, knowing that she might die. But whether she died the right way remains to be seen, Kunra said. Will she be captured and tortured? Will they learn about us? No. Shunmai seemed shocked by the suggestion. She would have taken the appropriate precautions. Nomanora was certain his highest acolyte was correct. The appropriate precautions meant, in this case, breaking the false tooth at the back of her mouth and swallowing the irkish poison they had provided her with. It would have killed her instantly. Her fanatical loyalty to the cause guaranteed that she would have obeyed that last command. 
But even suicide might not be sufficient to avoid disaster, Namanor thought. The spy had openly declared her allegiance to the Jedi heresy, so Shimra would certainly be alerted now to attempts to infiltrate his walls. It would be even harder to get in next time, and riskier. That didn't mean he'd give up trying, though. He didn't care how many acolytes died in the attempt. Information on his enemy's activities was vital. Any campaign, covert or overt, depended on intelligence, which meant he needed to get someone on the inside of those walls. And soon. If he couldn't, then he wouldn't know what measures were being taken against him, and that left him unacceptably vulnerable. We did well just to get this far, Kunra said. It was a desperate attempt to make good out of a bad situation, but there was no hiding his weariness. Atroth made it farther than any of the others. I believe I even heard voices, Shunmai said. Numanor nodded. He had heard voices, too, from within the chamber on the far side of the threshold the spy had attempted to cross. He was sure that those voices had belonged to High Prefect Drothul, High Priest Jakan, and Lord Shimra's abominable puppet, Onimi. Someone had been arguing with them, one of the warriors, perhaps. The argument had been too faint to discern any actual words, but it had been close. Had Atraoth made it just a few steps closer? He growled an ancient oath under his breath. Mistakes risked the ruin of everything he was trying to achieve. The heretical movement was still too weak to survive a concerted purge. We have to try again, he said shortly. We need access to those chambers. Frustration boiled inside him like a magnetic storm. He missed his old networks, his chain of informers, the many spies who had fed him information. Bloated on data, he had not known how fortunate he'd been before his fall. Starved, weakened by ignorance, he longed for a return to those glory days. If we can't get a villip inside, then we will need an informer. But who? Shunmai asked. And how? Our numbers are increasing, Kunra said by way of reply. Word is rising up the ranks. It's only a matter of time before we infiltrate the upper echelons. I cannot wait that long, Numanor snapped. The closer we get to the top, the riskier it becomes for us. Without knowing what Shimra knows, we are like one of his sacrifices, on our knees with a kufi at our throats, waiting for the killing blow to finish us off. He shrugged under his robes. Lately in his dreams he found himself fleeing a band of warriors bent on his destruction. He never saw them, but he could always sense them close behind, and could always hear them. In his dreams he was nothing more than an animal being hunted. He shook his head. The waking hours were no time to waste on nightmares. I will not die down here, he said. I will not become like the corridor ghouls, blind and vulnerable to anyone with light. It will not happen, Master, Shunmai said lamely. We would let no such thing happen to you. Shunmai's attempts to reassure him were like those he would use on a child, and no manor brushed them aside with the contempt they deserved. Enough! He stalked back to the throne and collapsed into it. Find me another volunteer. We will try again. We will keep trying until we have achieved our goal. We must crack Shimra's security before he cracks ours. It's either that or perish. Shunmai swallowed and backed away, bowing. He didn't know anything about the spy they'd captured at their last headquarters, but he understood the reality of their situation. They were heretics, anathema to Shimra and the priests, a contamination to be purged, a rust, Nomanor thought, remembering his musing on the rotting of iron he had observed in the belly of Yuzhan Tar before adopting the mantle of prophet. It will be done, master. Make... Certain of it, Numanor said. His glare fell upon Kunra, also. Both of you. Kunra nodded grimly, 
not needing to say that there were only so many volunteers left to be wasted on such hopeless missions. The more that failed, the fewer there were to choose from next time. Sacrifice needed a point to be noble. But he, too, understood the harsh reality of the situation. It was either kill or be killed. If the most the shamed ones could gain was to choose the manner of their passing, then that, at least, was something. It was certainly more than Shimra had ever offered them. Jaina crouched behind a stone balustrade on the roof of a warehouse across the road from the penitentiary. She kept herself low to avoid being spotted by the powerful floodlights sweeping the area. Regular patrols around the perimeter of the prison she had expected. But the Rin hadn't warned them about the swarm of G-2RD sentry droids that accompanied them, and she hadn't anticipated them. The Bakarin's usual dislike of droids had obviously been overcome by pragmatism in this case. Surveillance of the area was frequent and random, making it difficult to predict when sweeps would next take place. Worst of all, she had tripped some sort of concealed alarm when she dared make her first dash for the rear entrance. The entire compound was now on full alert, ready and waiting for someone to break in. Half an hour's careful observation convinced her that it was unlikely she could sneak in unobserved. And if the security on the inside was as stringent as that on the outside, then she wasn't going to last a minute in there, let alone reach the cell she needed. No, she was going to have to try another way. Slipping out from her hiding space, she crossed the roof of the warehouse and descended a narrow ladder fixed to the far wall. The laneway at its base was cluttered with rubbish, suggesting it was rarely used. Following it to its end, she allowed a trio of deep and calming breaths to fill her with a sense of control and authority. I am not a covert agent, she told herself. I am the representative of visiting dignitaries, and the people here are our allies. With a brisk, measured pace, she walked around the corner and into full view of the security droids. A spotlight instantly hit her full in the face, but she didn't break step. The slightest hesitation could destroy the illusion she was trying to create. Two G-2RD droids swooped from emplacements in the high ferrocrete wall that was the rear of the prison. Floating spheres equipped with several means to inflict discomfort, they converged on her, buzzing furiously like agitated insects. Halt! exclaimed one. She couldn't tell which. She stopped within three meters of the rear entrance, radiating patient obedience. "'State your name and purpose here,' ordered the other, its voice a nasal whine probably designed to irritate. "'My name is Jaina Solo,' she replied easily. "'I'm here to speak with Melinza Thanus.' Both droids buzzed as they performed a quick check on her clearance. After a couple of seconds, one of the droids advanced with its stun prod crackling. No such visitation has been authorized. Please don't threaten me, she said, sending the small droid into a spin with a push from the force. I really don't take too kindly to things like that. The second droid emitted a piercing wail that Jaina was quick to cut short. She reached deep into the droid's circuitry with the force and fused its vocabulator. More droids and spotlights converged on her. She couldn't have drawn more attention to herself if she'd wanted to. Nevertheless, she maintained her calm exterior and kept her hands well away from her lightsaber. "'I am here to speak with Melinza Thanus,' she repeated patiently and firmly. "'Please let me through.' The first droid recovered from its spin and faced her again, this time speaking with a different voice, that of a guard from within the compound, obviously watching through the droid's sensors. I'm sorry, but we cannot allow visitors without authorization. She folded her arms in front of her. Then I suggest you get it, because I'm not going anywhere until I've seen Melinza, and I have no intention of leaving quietly. I'll give you one minute to comply. The droid buzzed, bobbing up and down as though itching to be given the okay to attack her. She watched it warily while counting from one to sixty in her head. At the end of the minute, she heard hurried footsteps coming toward her from around the nearest corner. "'I can't wait all night, you know,' she said. 
brushing the droids easily aside and taking three more paces toward the rear door that the Rin had specified in his message. There she spoke the code word she'd been given. Fringe dweller. The door instantly hissed open, lifting sharply up into the ceiling. She strode through into a glowing white corridor that led as straight as a beam of light into the heart of the building. A chorus of buzzing from the droids followed her. A new voice issued from the nearest droids casing. This is a flagrant disregard for regulations. There was no disguising the guard's annoyance. Whoever you are, I must insist that— As I have already explained, she said, my name is Jaina Solo, and I'd appreciate it if you could make up your minds as to whether you intend to assist me or arrest me. I really have no desire to fight you, but if you force my hand, then I— You can't expect to just walk in here and see any prisoner you like. Ever heard of protocol? You ever heard of a diplomatic incident? She shot back. Because that's what you're going to get if I don't get to see Melinda Thanus. The pause was longer this time, and she sensed the droids backing off slightly. A squad of guards had appeared behind them, and waited uncertainly to see what she would do next. Well, she prompted after a while, what's it to be? Please wait where you are. The voice seemed more cowed than it had been a moment before, and Jaina suspected the guards had been instructed by their superiors to let her through. An escort will arrive shortly. No sooner had this been said than four Bakaran security guards came hurrying around the corner, their weapons, she noted, carefully holstered. Come with us, ordered the one nearest to her. He spoke firmly, gruffly, but there was no escaping the fact that he was a little uneasy. Gina allowed herself a slight smile at this. They weren't as good at hiding their nervousness as she was. She didn't move. Not until I know where you're taking me. You're to be taken to see the prisoner, he replied, as requested. There was derision in his tone, but it was all bluster and show. He knew that Jaina had the upper hand in this situation. Her smile widened. It never hurt to boost respect for Jedi on outlying worlds, and respect wasn't always earned at the end of a lightsaber. She offered a polite bow of her head in the direction of the droids, knowing that whoever had authorized her would no doubt be watching. There would be no further need for any aggressive posturing this evening. Not unless she was provoked, of course. I apologize for this inconvenience. The sooner I can see Melinda Thanus, the sooner I can be out of your hair. Her senses finally attuned for any sign of deception, she let herself be shepherded by the four guards deep into the heart of the penitentiary. The high security wing was identical to the regular wings, except for G2 RD droids, stationed at every junction. They hummed menacingly when she passed, as though warning her not to try the same trick she had employed on their fellow sentries. She tried to memorize every turn and corridor she went, but it wasn't easy. They all looked the same to her and the cell numbers didn't seem to follow any particular pattern. Finally, they arrived at cell 1217. The door looked like all the others they'd passed along the way, sterile white with no window or openings. One of the lead guards keyed a short code into a keypad, then stepped back as the cell door slid open with a dull grinding sound. Inside, on a narrow cot, sat a thin, dark-haired girl of about fifteen years. Despite the gray prison uniform and the bruises to her face and arms, she still had a defiant look about her. But there was also exhaustion behind that defiance. What now? the girl asked. A visitor, the first guard said, motioning Jaina to enter. He indicated a green touchpad by the door. When you're done, just hit the call button. Kind of late for visitors, isn't it? Melinda said, looking Jaina over suspiciously. Jaina stepped into the brightly lit cell. My name is Jaina Solo, she said as the door closed behind her. She examined the girl quickly, wondering what sort of treatment she'd been subjected to. Melinda's sharply defined face tilted upward. She studied Jaina for a moment before nodding. Uncle Luke has spoken about you. He once showed me a hollow of you and Jason when you were little. 
Jana felt an unaccountable stab of jealousy at the girl's words. Uncle? Luke? Who was this girl she'd never met, claiming Jana's uncle as her own? Indignation quickly gave way to understanding, however, when she remembered that Melinza was Luke's sponsor daughter. With both her parents dead, Gariel Captison, former Prime Minister of Bakra, had sacrificed her life to destroy a large chunk of the troublesome Sikoran Triad, while Paterthanus died of Notes disease some years earlier. Luke Skywalker was probably the closest thing she had to family. What right did Jaina have to deny the girl that? I wish we could have met under better circumstances, she said, moving deeper into the small room, close to the girl. She gestured to the bunk. May I? You sure picked a bad time to visit, Melinza said as she moved to make room for Jaina to sit down. Want to tell me about it? Melinza studied Jaina with a maturity that was at odds with her age. Her gaze was piercing, made even more disconcerting by the fact that her eyes were different colors. Her left iris was green, her right gray. Just as her mother's had been, Jaina thought. For a long moment it seemed as though Melinza wasn't ever going to reply to Jaina's question. You know why I'm in here, she said after a while. You've been charged with kidnapping the Prime Minister. Actually, the official charge is disturbing the peace and conspiracy. Doesn't it amount to the same thing? Melinza shook her head. The difference is an important one, actually. Why? Now that Kundertal has returned, I had nothing to do with him. Melinza interrupted. But the rest is true enough. Sorry. But I find it hard to picture you as a disturber of the peace. Melinza smiled faintly at Jaina's comment as she held out her arms to display the bruises. Look at me, she said. If they wanted to beat me, there are ways they could have done it without leaving any marks. I earned these while resisting arrest. It took three of them, as well as two droids, to bring me down. Her expression held a burning pride, but it failed to hide the terrible weariness that Jaina recognized all too clearly. She remembered that feeling from when Anakin had died, of there being nothing left to lose, of desperation, of despair. It was so easy to mistake the signs of self-destruction for battle scars. What are you fighting for? Jaina asked. That's the strange thing. A week ago I wasn't fighting at all. Melinza's defiance dissolved altogether then and became a look of genuine bemusement. You've no idea what you've just stepped into. I tell you it's crazy around here. In what way, Melinza? Gina leaned in closer to encourage a feeling of trust. The girl chuckled. That I'd even think about telling you is probably the craziest thing of all. She said, slumping back against the wall. If anyone here is the enemy, it's you. Gina frowned but said nothing sensing that there was no point pushing. It would come, or it wouldn't. After more than a dozen heartbeats, Melinza sighed. Whatever. It's not as if I haven't tried to tell everyone here already. They don't believe you? Why else do you think I'm in here? The girl pointed at where a security cam watched them. I guess it couldn't hurt for them to hear it one more time. And who knows? They might even listen this time. And even if they don't, Jaina said, you can be assured that I will. Melinza smiled and nodded. Okay, she said, leaning forward again to begin her story. About a month ago, I was in charge of a cell of activists, capitalizing on my parents' reputations to get our message heard. There were sixteen of us in all. At first we just organized protests, spread the word. But it's grown much more over time. We called ourselves Freedom. She rolled her eyes. It's lame, I know, but it gets the point across. And what point is that? That we're tired of kowtowing to imperial doctrines, of course. It's time for us to throw off our shackles and govern ourselves. Imperial? Gina echoed, confused. It had been almost thirty years since the imperial presence had been repelled from Bakara. 
Not the Empire, Malinza explained. The thing that took its place, the New Republic. Don't you know that nature abhors a vacuum? Especially a power vacuum? No sooner had we won our freedom than we held out our wrists to be shackled again. We offered ourselves up to the New Republic like pets begging for a scrap of affection. And that's all we got, too. Scraps. Jaina winced at the description of the government her parents had helped create. Of course, you don't call it the New Republic anymore, do you? It's been given a new name ever since it lost its war against the Yuzhan Vong. Melinza snorted derisively. No one wants to be associated with losers, do they? Therefore, your only hope of fighting back was to pretend to be something else. But cratch droppings by any other name still stink, don't you think? She shook her head and looked away. If you do beat the Yuzhan Vong, you'll just chain everyone up like before. And if you lose, you'll drag everyone else down with you. It's not like that, no. You'll probably tell me that we'll all die unless we band together to defeat the common enemy. But there's always a common enemy, Jaina. Oppressive regimes don't function without them. The Empire had its rebel alliance. Once... We had the Sairuk, and right now you have the Yuzhan Vong. Who will it be next time you feel the cracks spreading? I'll be happy just to reach the next time, Jaina said. But tell me, Melinza, what would happen if we did lose this war? What would you do if the Yuzhan Vong turned up on your doorstep and we weren't there to help you, like we did with the Sairuk? We'd fight them, of course, the girl said simply. And yes... We would probably all die in the process. But it would be our decision, not one made by some faceless bureaucrat on the other side of the galaxy. Is that really the issue, Melinza? Does it really boil down to who controls you? Or who makes the decisions for you? Of course it does. I don't recall the New Republic ever demanding anything of Bakara. You were always asked. And we always said yes. I know that. That galls me more than you could possibly understand. While we abased ourselves before the New Republic, it was happy in return to steal our defense fleet, our families. Melinza stopped there, leaning back heavily against the wall with a troubled, weary sigh. Gina was relieved to see tears in the girl's eyes. She had already guessed what lay at the heart of Melinza's dislike of the New Republic no matter how she dressed it up in rhetoric. Behind her stoic defiance, she was still just a fifteen-year-old girl, one pushed into defying a government she regarded as being oppressive, forced to learn skills no teenager should have had to know, but still only fifteen. That she had risen above that disadvantage spoke volumes about her ability and her determination. She had taken the example of her adopted uncle to heart, it seemed. Jaina herself hadn't been much older when the war with the Yuzhan Vong had broken out. People were capable of extraordinary things when circumstances demanded it, she reflected. I'm sorry about your mother, Melinza, Jaina said, putting a hand on the girl's shoulder. It wasn't pushed away. I met her briefly at center point before she died. But I was just a kid then. I know Uncle Luke held her in very high regard. I barely remember her, Melinza said, trying to be casual as she knuckled away the tears she was fighting. I recall her leaving, and my aunt trying to explain what had happened when she didn't come back, but I was only four years old, and I never really understood. I just knew who had taken her from us. The New Republic dragged her into a war she wasn't part of, and she gave her life to save others. She did a very good thing and I suffered because of it. She shrugged helplessly. I guess the universe found its balance, as it always does. It's just that, in this instance, I was on the receiving end, that's all. Balance? asked Jaina. What do you mean? Cosmic balance. The wheel of fate, you know? She shifted her position on the bunk, so she was facing Jaina fully. 
every action causes a reaction. A great force for good can't exist without there also being a counterbalancing force for evil somewhere. In the same way, good works lead to evil results for someone else, quite unintentionally. It's just how the universe works, and the force, too. Save someone on Baccarat today, and you might kill another later. That's why I don't want this alliance of yours here. It's too dangerous. I have no desire to see my home get caught in friendly fire. So, you want no part in the Galactic Alliance and the war against the Yuzhan Vong. Is that what you're saying? Don't get me wrong, Jaina. I have nothing against Uncle Luke. Apart from Aunt Lara, who raised me after Mom died, he's the only family I have left. Dad died not long after I was born, so I never got to know him. If I should side with anyone, it would be you. It's only my fear of the backlash from the balance that stops me. So how does kidnapping Kundertal help you, then? He's all for an alliance with the Pwack. They'd make viable alternatives to the Galactic Alliance and give you a fighting chance of defending Bakura against a Yuzhan Vong attack. Exactly, she said. That's why it makes no sense for me to have kidnapped Kundertal in the first place. But you could have ordered it. No. Melinza cut in firmly. I didn't. Just because I'm young doesn't make me automatically stupid. I'm not saying maybe not. But you're still listening to what they're telling you. And they're telling you that I'm stupid. A humorless laugh broke her somber mood. Then again... To have attempted to stunt like that, perhaps they're right. You're not stupid, Melinza. Jaina tried to reassure her, but the girl didn't seem to hear. I keep trying to explain that the goal of freedom is to simply kick the New Republic off Bakara. We don't use violence, and we certainly don't kidnap people. Call us idealistic if you want, but we do have principles. The last thing we want to see is the old regime replaced with one equally as bad. Jaina's mind boggled at the thought of sixteen people attempting to take on a galactic civilization. It smacked of either madness or incredible bravery. How did you ever hope to succeed? Ah, uh, well, there's the thing, Melinza answered with a half-smile. You see, we had some funding from private sources, and with that money we were able to dig deep into the infrastructure looking for things that might assist us. Evidence of corruption, brutality, nepotism, and so on. You'd be surprised what we turned up. Jaina seriously doubted that. She'd heard plenty about dodgy politicians over the years from her mother. Who funded you? They would consider that private, I'm sure, Melinda said firmly, especially where you are concerned. Jaina respected Melinza's reticence on the matter, but quietly suspected that the Peace Brigade might have been involved at some point in the past. Such an underground organization would be just the thing for stirring up dissent. You say you're not into violence, Melinza, but what about the others? None of the sixteen core members of Freedom was into violence. It wasn't our style, but... But... Well, there were others who joined us, she said, and it's possible that they might have had violent intentions. In fact, with some of them I'd have to say that violence was high on their agenda, but we didn't encourage them to stay. So who else would join? All sorts, really. Not all of Freedom's actions were covert. We had a recruiting front, and our policies were well known. This is a democracy, right? or it's supposed to be. Some of our members were bored with their everyday lives and were looking for excitement. Sometimes we'd get people coming over from similar underground movements. She shrugged. Ever since the Pweck arrived, we've attracted all sorts of malcontents. Why is that? Well, for one thing, my involvement in freedom was never a secret, and I have some sort of profile with the media because my mother was once prime minister. We've had cranks trying to come along for the ride since we started, but they've always been easy to weed out. 
until recently, anyway. She looked down at her lap. It was getting hard to control, to be honest. The anti preck movement made it clear that if we weren't with them, then we were against them. As I said, I'm not a xenophobe. I think the preck could be a good thing for Bakara. I don't want to be against anyone, really, because that makes them against me. The balance kicks back just as hard as we lash out, and trust me, I have no desire to get kicked again. I think I'm starting to understand that, Jaina said. And she was. She didn't necessarily believe everything Melinza had said, but she also didn't believe that the girl was the sort to order kidnappings and murders to further her cause. So why do you really think you're in here, then? She added. We were too good at what we did, Melinza said. We were making too many inroads. We uncovered some dirt on a few senators and threatened to go public with the information. Blackmail? Is it blackmail if you're acting in the public's best interests? Melinza shrugged. Whatever. They were getting nervous, but they couldn't put us away without whipping up an even bigger storm. We hadn't done anything really wrong, you see. It would have been difficult for them to incarcerate us for very long, because once we made their secrets known, then public sympathy would have been on our side. So we reached a kind of impasse, I guess. It was only a matter of waiting to see who snapped first. During which time you kept digging for more dirt, I presume, Jaina said. Which means that if they don't genuinely think you kidnapped Kundertal, then you must have uncovered something new that they very much wanted kept quiet. If we did, then I honestly have no idea what it could have been. Melinza shook her head again. We were tracing some financial deal that went through just after the Peck arrived. An awful lot of money went off-world, but we couldn't work out who was behind it or where it was going. It looked like some sort of commercial transaction, and may well have been just that. The fact that the endpoints had been obscured made us wonder. She looked at Jaina, eyes narrowed slightly. Your Galactic Alliance isn't looking for money now, is it? No. Not from Bakara, anyway. Taking money from Bakara would have been like taking small change from a child in order to finance a starship purchase. It could have been legit, as you say. Melinza nodded, taking in the confines of the cell with one sweeping gesture. Nevertheless, here I am. She paused, fixing Jaina with a sober stare. I'm not responsible for Kundertal's kidnapping, I swear. But that's not going to stop the people behind this. They never let the truth get in the way of what they want. If you didn't do it, they won't be able to make the charges stick. Melinza laughed. They're assuming I'm going to get a fair trial. She shook her head. There's bound to be circumstantial evidence. Perhaps the young woman was right, Jaina thought, recalling Blaine Harris's certainty over Melinza's guilt on announcing the news of her capture. On the other hand, though, there was also Cundertal's reaction on hearing the news to consider. Clearly, he hadn't been as convinced as Harris had. The Prime Minister's testimony will count for something, she said by way of reassuring Melinza. He was there, after all. If he doesn't think it was you then I doubt they'd ever be able to convict. Maybe, Melinza said faintly. Some of the fire had gone out of her. She looked more than ever like a lonely, frightened teenager caught out of her depth. I just have to have faith in the balance. If a wrong is done to me now, then some good will come of it another day. That's some comfort, at least. A very lonely one, Jaina thought. But then... Perhaps Melinza's belief in the balance was no less lonely than Jaina's own faith in the Force. She stood, glancing at her chronometer. It was well past midnight, and her parents would be starting to get worried. I should go now. But you haven't told me why you're here yet, Melinza protested. I'm just doing my job, Jaina said with a smile. You know what Jedi are like. 
were always getting in the way, as well as always getting their way. The smile was half-heartedly returned. Then it was lost altogether. I have to admit, I would be glad to be out of here. Jana nodded sympathetically. I'll see what I can do about that. She palmed the green call button and faced Melinda one last time. Maybe we can apply some pressure to get your hearing processed more quickly and... She broke off. The door had opened onto an empty corridor. That's strange, she muttered. Melinda peered past her. What is? The guard said they'd escort me out of here. Jana stepped cautiously out of the cell, every nerve screaming, trap. But there's no one. Not even so much as a droid. Melinda joined her outside the cell. Jana could tell from the girl's expression that she was as surprised as Jana, the no siren sounded when she did this. Surprise soon became excitement, though. It's Viram, she said. It has to be. Who? He's one of Freedom's core members, Melinda said. In fact, he's what you'd call the brains behind the group. If anyone could slice into the system and get me out of here, it would be him. I don't know, Melinda, Jana said, glancing around uneasily. This doesn't feel right to me. That's easy for you to say. You get to walk out of here no matter what happens. Melinda straightened until they were almost eye to eye. I'm going for it. Jana grabbed her sleeve as she went up the corridor. Wait, that's the wrong direction. She was unable to shake her suspicions. Something told her that what she was about to do was what someone wanted her to do. Nevertheless, her options were limited. At least let me show you the way. Melinda's grin was both appreciative and mischievous. I thought you'd never offer, she said. Tahiri moved through the canyon, tired and weary, every muscle in her body aching terribly. It felt as though she'd been running for years. Fifty meters away on either side of her were mighty, craggy walls curving up and around her, making her feel as though she were walking in the palm of some impossibly immense fist. She paused for a moment to look up and saw the stars twinkling overhead. No, not stars. These glistening specks were too close for that. They were no more stars than the blackness that held them was the night sky. A sudden howl and a cry reminded her that her pursuers weren't far behind. Across the vast and empty plain she could make out nothing but varying degrees of darkness. There was no sign of the thing with her face or the lizard creature. But they were out there somewhere. She knew that without a doubt. And if she ever stopped moving— stopped running. Then they would catch up with her and— She pushed the thought down, turning back to the task of continuing through the darkness in search of the light. However, where moments before there had been nothing but barren ground, now trees crowded around her from every side. For a moment she felt strangely comforted by this, believing that nothing could possibly find her amid such a tangle of branches, limbs, and trunks. But this comfort was short-lived. Her pursuers didn't need to see it, she realized. They could smell her. That's how they'd been able to follow her all this time, and how they would continue to follow her until she finally relented and surrendered to their hunger. The howl of the lizard beast rang out through the spindly foliage. Its cry carried on a wind that rustled the dagger-like leaves hanging down from the trees around her. She moved faster wincing as each leaf she brushed aside, cut into her arms and hands. The bitter forest gave way to a rock face that rose sharply into the dark. For a moment, she panicked that she had nowhere left to run. But then, off to her right, she noticed a small crevice in the rock. Tahiri. The voice came as a whisper on the breeze. It seemed far away, but not so far off that she could afford to relax. Sucking in her stomach and bringing her arms in close to her side, she managed to make herself small enough to be able to squeeze through the narrow opening, 
the mildew covering the rocks, expediting her movement. She closed her eyes, forcing out the disquieting thought of being swallowed as she wriggled between stone. Better that, she thought, than face what was following her. The narrow crack widened around her. It had brought her safely out on the far side. She opened her eyes and her heart sank at what she saw. The path ahead was narrow and straight and lined with trees filled with Isola Miri. She climbed out of the crack and stood trembling for the longest time, too scared to move or even breathe. But her fear came not from the idea of passing between the trees, but rather from what she thought she could make out in the distance beyond them. A dark, reptilian figure, silhouetted against the sky. Tahiri. Crying out in fright, she spun around to see the thing with her face glaring through the crevice in the mossy rock. Its arm was reaching out to her. Its bloodied fingers clawed for a touch of her sweat-soaked skin. You can't leave me here, Tahiri. Tahiri woke with a half-formed cry on her lips. Her hand was halfway to her lightsaber before she realized where she was. Bakara. She sighed in relief. It wasn't the world ship orbiting Mirkur. She was safe. Safe? Was she really safe? She groped in the darkness for the light panel, relaxing as a yellow ambience filled the room. The bed rocked beneath her as she sat up and swung her legs over the edge. Almost everything on Bakara floated. Wherever repulsors could possibly be included, they were lifting chairs, counters of food, almost everything, it seemed. As unsettling as it was to have things floating around her, it wasn't this that troubled her most right now. Neither was it the tension suffocating her like a thick fog. No, the discomfort she felt now was like a tingling at the back of her mind, a suspicion that those around her, the family, that Jason had assured her she was a part of back on Moon Calamari, were conspiring against her. Jaina had talked to her mother before going off to find Melinza. Leia had gone into Jaina's room to stir her daughter from a Jedi trance and hadn't emerged for some time. When she had, she had carried in her eyes a stare that was both wary and distant. Leia was seeing something that troubled her. Something in Tahiri. Tahiri felt it keenly, like ice water trickling down her spine. No matter how she tried to ignore it, the feeling simply wouldn't go away. Feeling like she was still dreaming, she stood up and crossed the room to the doorway. Opening it, she crept into the hallway, linking their rooms. Unlike on Galantos, where they had five rooms all opening onto a central common area, on Bakara they occupied rooms designed as though in a hotel. Hananlea's was the largest, with an adjoining area that could be used as a common room. Tahiri and Jaina were up the hall, adjacent but not connecting. Tahiri stopped outside Jaina's room, pressing her ear against the door to listen. There was no sound whatsoever. Jaina must still be out on her mission, even though it was well past midnight. A distant concern for Jaina's well-being penetrated the fog, but not for long. Jaina was one of the ones who suspected her, who constantly watched her for any sign of what? What was it Jaina searched for when she looked at Tahiri? The truth, perhaps, of who she really was? The thought hit her like a blow from behind. No. She performed a mental forward somersault, rolling with the punch and coming up fighting. That's not who I am. In her mind, she slashed at the thought with her lightsaber, cutting the notion to ribbons. You can't make me be someone I'm not. Then the terrible moment of clarity faded, and the fog fell around her once again. She embraced the vague dream state, letting it dissolve her concerns and reduce her anxieties to just one. She could still feel it tugging at her, as though a hook had pierced her soul and some dreadful angler was reeling her in. It had to stop. She didn't know how much more of this she could take before she snapped, or something altogether worse happened. She moved from Jaina's door, 
silently walking the short distance to Han and Leia's room. There she repeated the same process, pressing her ear against the door to listen for any movements. She couldn't hear anything. Keying the access code into the lock, Tahiri eased open the door. It surprised her that Leia's Nogri bodyguards were nowhere to be seen. But she didn't have time to dwell on it. The fact was, they wouldn't be too far away, and if they returned now, they'd be sure to question her late-night activities in the princess's room. From the darkness inside, C-3PO's glowing photoreceptor eyes turned toward her. She raised a finger to her lips. Not a word, 3PO, she whispered. I just need to get something from the other room, okay? As you wish, Mistress Tahiri, the droid replied, making no effort to speak in a voice lower than he normally would. But shouldn't you— Shh! she insisted with a hiss. I promise not to be long. C-3PO nodded uncertainly in the gloom as Tahiri continued through to Han and Leia's bedroom. They were asleep when she entered their restful breathing the only sound. She stood there motionless, extending herself into the shadows, feeling for the thing that called to her. And there it was. She could feel it, pulling her ever closer. I must destroy the evidence, she breathed to herself. Destroy it, and the problem will go away. Using the force to guide her through the darkened bedroom, she made her way to a small table containing a bowl of flowers and a glass of water. There was something else there, too. Something that the force couldn't reveal to her. Now that she was closer, she could see it. The small object caught in a fine sliver of moonlight from the open window. And just as on Galantos, when she'd first found it, every one of her physical senses was tingling from the echoes emanating from the small pendant. She reached out with her hand to pick up the silver totem molded into the likeness of Yun Yamka, the slayer. At the very moment her fingers touched it, a hand reached out of the blackness to grab her wrist, and a voice called out her name in a language that disgusted her. If the voice said anything else, she never heard it, as darkness suddenly swirled around her and swallowed her senses. Here we are, said the librarian a thin, short-haired woman whose name was Triss. She had brought them to two broad, solid doors, deep in a secure installation buried deep under the ice in an isolated sector of the Chiss homeworld. Suntir Fell had ferried them there on the back of a large, black ice barge, an armored craft that used powerful repulsors to sweep across the icy planetary crust. It was big enough to hold fifty people— but the passengers had consisted solely of Luke and his entourage, Commander Erolia, Chief Navigator Pita Abe, and Fell himself. There appeared to be neither pilots nor any security staff, so either they were keeping carefully out of sight, or Fell had supreme faith in automatics. Upon arrival, they had been introduced to their guide from the Enrokini family, who had whisked them deep underground via a turbo-lift that seemed to take forever, while Fell and the others went off on official business. "'We're here at last?' Jason asked. Like the others, he was restless from the long journey and keen to get started on the search for Zonama Seacoat. Their guide nodded and pushed open the doors with a dramatic sweep. "'Welcome to the Expeditionary Library.' You are among the very few non chis to step through these doors. She waved them through. Jason and the others, mindful of the honor, moved respectfully forward into the giant chamber. It took him a second to grasp the scale. Vast and rectangular, with lines sharply defined, the library space was as large as a docking bay. There were four levels of walkways surrounding the walls, with steep stairwells leading to each and endless rows of rectangular dividers subdividing the floor. Yellow lights hung suspended from the ceiling on long cables, casting a warm glow across the space. The air was still, warm, and fresh. A deep silence filled the space, as though the enormous volume of air was soaking up every sound. Nice! Mara said, her long red hair waving as she turned to look around her. We'll have lots of elbow room, at least, if you show us to the hollow screens, 
We'll get started. Triss frowned. Hollow screens? There are no hollow screens here. Then how do we get at the data? I'll show you. The librarian led them across the floor of the giant chamber, along a path between two long shelves. Jason idly studied the contents of the shelves as he walked, wondering what they were. They looked like bricks of some kind, and he wondered if they were some sort of data storage device. A high-security installation such as this one would, he assumed, have a highly sophisticated means of keeping its data safe. Perhaps the bricks had to be fed by hand into some kind of reader, which would then display its contents. Each of the memory bricks could hold vast volumes of data, safely sealed away. Triss turned right at the end of the shelves and took them down to another aisle. Here are the exploration notes for the world you visited last, when Lali Mafir translated into basic for permanent record. She reached up to the top shelf and selected one of the bricks. Everything here is meticulously catalogued. It may take you a while to get the hang of our system, but I am here to assist you in that task. She handed the brick to Mara, who hefted it uncertainly, then gave it to Jason. It was heavier than he had expected, and there were no obvious jack-in ports. The front and back were made of the same material as one side of the thing, a deep red material with gold writing in basic. The other three sides were curiously rough and soft. Seeing this puzzlement, Triss took it back from him and opened it. The top folded back like the lid of a box only the interior wasn't empty. It was full all the way through, full of text. Only then did Jason understand. He felt like an idiot for not getting it sooner, but judging by the gasp of surprise from Danny, he knew he wasn't the only one. Not a brick. The object in Triss's hand was a book. You're kidding, Mara said, her eyebrows rising. It was Triss's turn to look puzzled. The Chiss have always stored sensitive information in this fashion. It is safe, secure, and permanent. We have lost too much data in ice storms to trust other more complicated forms of storage. But how are we going to find anything? Danny asked. We can't do keyword searches through... This? There are ways to search, and I am here to assist you. Triss seemed serenely confident, but Jason's mind balked at the thought of pouring through the millions, maybe billions of pages contained on the shelves around them. The library was full of mission reports, xenobiology tracts, anthropological assays, and contact histories from the Chiss Expeditionary Defense Fleet's exploration of the unknown regions. And that exploration had been ongoing for centuries. How hard can this be, he told himself. If I can fly an X-wing with my eyes shut, then surely I can leaf through a few books. Something similar must have been going through Saba's mind. We wish to search for references to Zonama Seacoat, the Saurian Jedi Knight said. Please assist us in that. Of course. The librarian put the book back in its proper place and walked briskly through the aisles, humming softly to herself. Follow me. Luke exchanged glances with Jason and Mara, then followed. It was a huge pit, easily thirty meters deep and almost a kilometer across. Mighty columns stretched up into the sky, reaching for the planet that hung in the blackness like an overripe fruit about to fall. Around her on the ground were a number of ships, some secured in their berthing bays by restraining carapaces, others just lying on the ground in various stages of disrepair and decay. She knew the place to be an old spaceport, one that was both comfortingly familiar and disconcertingly alien. She wanted to climb into one of the derelict spaceships and fly off to the planet up above, for she knew that here, at least, she might be safe. But the dilapidated condition of the ships told her that this simply wasn't an option. The spaceport and all its craft had lain unused for many years. It was abandoned, just like the world beneath her feet, as abandoned as she felt herself to be. Someone was standing behind her. She turned, 
startled, and found herself staring at a distant reflection of herself. Only it wasn't her at all. This person had scars across her forehead. Reaching up, she realized she didn't carry any such scars. The only scars she carried were the ones on her arms, and they felt completely different. Her reflection's scars stood out boldly, proudly, and had been carved into the flesh with purpose. Hers, on the other hand, were a product of anger and an intense desire to remove something she'd thought she had seen lurking beneath her skin. There's nowhere left to run, the ghostly reflection said. In the distance came the howl of the lizard beast. Not for you either, she pointed out. Despite obvious effort to hide it, there was fear behind the reflection's gaze. Why do you want to hurt me? she asked it. Because you want to hurt me. I want to be left alone. I want only to be free, as do I. But I belong here. The reflection surveyed their surroundings, then faced her again. As do I. The howl of the creature sounded again, louder this time and closer. It can smell us, the reflection said. It can smell my fear, and it can smell your guilt. I have nothing to feel guilty for. No, you don't. And yet, there it is, nonetheless. She looked into herself, then, and saw the guilt of which the reflection spoke. It had always been there, she knew. She just hadn't wanted to see it. But now the amorphous and neglected emotion took shape, forming into words that rose in her thoughts, in her throat, finally demanding release. Why am I alive when the one I love is dead? And with this came a deafening roar from the lizard creature. It was a roar of anger, of remorse, and of regret. It was a bellow whose echo called back to her out of the dark over and over again, fading each time until it became little more than a far-off whisper, a distant speck in the dark. Tahiri. Tahiri. Tahiri? The hand shaking her shoulder did more to dispel the dream than the sound of her own name being spoken. She blinked, then looked around vaguely at her surroundings. The walls so close around her seemed small in comparison to the dreamscape she'd just left, so much more restricting. Come on, kid. Snap out of it. An's voice was rough and hard, like the hands shaking her. She looked at him through tear-stained eyes and saw his worried and fatigued expression. Leia stepped between them, her gentle features smiling reassuringly at Tahiri. Are you okay? she asked. I'm awake, the girl mumbled hazily. Then realizing she hadn't answered the question, she nodded and added, I think I'm all right. Her head was pounding, and the harsh light felt like a naked sun burning into her eyes. She winced, blinking back more tears as she tried to sit up. She felt strange, confused. And this confusion was only magnified when she saw where she was, lying on the bed in Han and Leia's suite. What happened? she asked. Even as she spoke the words, she knew the answer. The same thing that happened before on Galantos and elsewhere. The illusion of ignorance was her only defense. What am I doing here? You don't remember? Leia asked. Both of Anakin's parents were standing over her, dressed in their night robes. I... She started. How could she tell them the truth when she herself wasn't even sure what it was? I was looking for something. Leia held out the silver pendant. Its many-tentacled, snarling visage seemed to mock her from its cradle of soft human flesh. You were looking for this, weren't you? Tahiri nodded, embarrassed. It... it calls to me. It reminds me of... She trailed off, unable to put what she was feeling into words. Of who you are, Leia suggested. 
The words seemed to stab a sharp pain in her mind, to which she responded with anger. I know who I am. I'm Tahiri Vela. Leia crouched down beside the bed to look up into the girl's face. Tahiri didn't want to meet her eyes, but the princess was hard to resist. Are you? she asked in a low, searching tone. You don't seem like the Tahiri I once knew. What are you talking about, Leia? Han said, looking equal parts exasperated and tired. What exactly is going on here? Sometimes I think we forget what happened to her on Yavin 4, Han. Leia kept her warm, reassuring eyes on Tahiri as she spoke. Then she stood and addressed her husband fully. The Yuzhan Vong did something terrible to her while she was in their hands. Something we can't even begin to understand. They tried to turn her into something other than human. You don't just get over that easily. It takes time. But I thought she was given the okay. Wasn't that why she was invited to join us on this mission? The two kept talking, but Tahiri had stopped listening. Although he probably didn't mean it, there was a suggestion of mistrust in Han's words that were hurtful to her and for a brief moment she felt overwhelmed by grief, a grief that was exacerbated by the way Anakin's parents kept talking about her in the third person, as if she weren't even there. It made her feel strangely removed from what was taking place around her. I wasn't asleep, Leia was saying to Han in response to something he'd said. Jaina told me what Jag found on Galantos. I was expecting Tahiri to come for it. That's why I instructed Cockmane and Miwal to stay out of sight, to let Tahiri come for the pendant. As she said this, Leia gestured off to one side, and for the first time Tahiri noticed the princess's Nogri guards standing there. Han sighed. I still would have preferred it if you'd told me what was going on. There was no need, Han. I wanted to see what would happen. So what's causing this, he asked. You think it might be Anakin? Leia shook her head. It's more than that. Much more. She's hiding something. From herself as well as everyone else. The accusation stabbed at Tahiri's heart, making her jump to her feet. How can you say that? She cried, taking a step forward. But a single step was all she managed before Cockmane moved to stop her taking Tahiri by the shoulders to hold her back from Leia. She wriggled in his slender hands, but couldn't break free. I would never hurt either of you. You're— She stopped, remembering Jason's note back on Moon Calamari. You're my family. Han stepped over to her, then, taking her hands. Hey, take it easy, kid. He wiped at the fresh tears on her cheek with the back of his hand. No one's accusing you of anything, Tahiri. Just relax, okay? She did so, feeling oddly calmed by the large man's rough but friendly voice. She saw Leia motion to her Nogri guard, who immediately released Tahiri and retreated to the shadows. Leia came forward. I'm sorry, Tahiri. I didn't mean to upset you. Tahiri didn't know what to say. She felt foolish and ashamed at her outburst, so in the end just nodded her acceptance of the princess's apology and said nothing. Tell me, though, Tahiri, Leia said, do you have any idea what's been going on in your head these last couple of years? I... I... Sometimes I black out, Tahiri stammered awkwardly. I have these... dreams that... They tell you you're somebody else? Leia offered. This brought her up defensive again. My name is Tahiri Vela. That's who I am. Leia took Tahiri's shoulders in her hands and looked the girl in the face with her penetrating brown eyes. I know this isn't easy, Tahiri, but you must try to understand. I want you to think back to just before you blacked out. Do you remember what I said to you? Tahiri thought about this. You called my name. Leia looked over to Han. What? 
Tahiri said, angered by the almost conspiratorial looks being exchanged between them. You did call my name. I heard you. Sympathy shimmered in Leia's eyes. I didn't call you by your name, Tahiri. I called you Rena. A feeling as cold as ice spread across Tahiri's shoulders and ran down her back in a horrible, clammy rush. At the same time, a terrible blackness rose up in her mind, threatening to engulf her. No, she mumbled, shaking her head slowly and fighting the feeling. That's not true. It is true, Tahiri. Before, when you blacked out, you were shouting at me in Yuzhan Vong. You were calling me something that not even 3PO could understand. You weren't Tahiri then. She paused uncomfortably before pronouncing the terrible truth. You were Rena of Domain Quad, the personality that Mejon Quad tried to turn you into. Somehow, the Rena personality is still inside you. Tahiri shook her head again, more vigorously this time, wanting to deny the spreading darkness as much as the words themselves. It... it can't be true. It just can't be. It is, Tahiri, Leia said. Believe me. And the sooner you accept that, the sooner we can start doing... No! Tahiri screamed in a pitch that surprised herself as much as it obviously did Leia, who took a step back at the outburst. As though a dam had burst, she was suddenly in motion. With the full strength of the force flowing through her, fueled by her desperation and her need to escape, she snatched the pendant as she pushed past Leia and Han and headed for the door, too quick for even Cockmane to grab her. C-3PO was standing on the other side of the door when she went through, but she didn't even give him time to utter a single word of objection. She just shoved him aside as hard as she could, throwing the golden droid clean off his feet and into the wall. Then she was through the door and out of the suite, running as if her very life depended on it. She saw nothing but corridors flashing by, and could feel nothing but the cool pendant of Yunyamka against her palm, grinning in vile satisfaction. And somewhere beyond the sound of her own sobbing she could hear a name being called. That she couldn't be sure the name even belonged to her made her cry that much harder and run that much faster. Jag listened intently as Han and Leia detailed the incident with Tahiri over the secure subspace channel. The two sounded exhausted, which was hardly surprising, given what they'd just been through, and the fact that it was still the middle of the night where they were probably wasn't helping either. She didn't hurt anyone, did she? Jag asked. No, Leia said, and I don't believe she would have either. What about the Rena personality? There was some hesitation from the other end. We're more concerned about what she'll do to herself than what she might do to others, Leia said firmly. So where is she now? She ran off, Leia said. And we haven't heard from her since, Han put in wearily. Poor kid was in quite a state when she left. Jag acknowledged his frustration at being too far away to be of any direct help with a sigh. Have you notified security on the ground? And tell them what, Han asked. That there's a lone Jedi on the loose who's possibly under the control of a Yuzhan Vong mind? That'll really go down well with the authorities. They'd probably lock the lot of us up, Leia said. Anyway, it's not an option. But she does need to be found. And soon. I don't like the idea of her being alone while she's trying to deal with this. She needs our help right now. Jag shook his head. I just don't understand how this could have happened. From what I understood, she was over her experiences on Yavin 4. So we all thought, Leia said. But her conditioning went deep. She could speak the Yuzhan Vong language and fly their ships. And there were moments when Anakin himself said that she acted strangely. But outwardly she seemed okay. She appeared to be holding herself together. But then Anakin died, Han said, and that must have changed everything. Jag could hear the echoes of the still painful grief in Han's words. He seemed to steel himself against the emotion as he carried on with, And if this Rena personality is still with the kid, then we have to do something about it. 
Jag agreed, but he knew it wasn't going to be easy. Tahiri could have been anywhere by now, and if she was as panicked as Han and Leia said she was, then she probably wasn't going to want to be found in a hurry. While Leia was probably right in that Tahiri wouldn't hurt anyone, Tahiri might see things differently. Without any control over when the Rena personality emerges, she may see herself as being a threat to her friends and want to keep away for fear of causing them any harm. What bothers me, though, Jag, Leia went on, is that you and Jaina suspected something was wrong, and yet you kept it to yourselves. Jag swallowed, wishing it were Jaina, not him, fielding the question. Leia had every right to be upset, of course. After he had shown Jaina the pendant that Tahiri had found back on Galantos, the two of them had discussed what they should do about the young girl. Clearly she was finely attuned to anything Eugene Vaughn, and just as clearly there were moments when the alien personality rose up and tried to take over. However, the girl was a trained Jedi, and they felt she should be given the chance to solve the problem on her own. It had never been their intention to keep Han and Leia out of the loop indefinitely, and neither had imagined that anything could go wrong as long as one of them was close at hand to keep an eye on her. I'm sorry, he said shortly, but we really didn't expect anything like this to happen. Well, it did, Han said, and if Leia hadn't suspected that something was up, things could have gotten quite ugly down here. Well, again, I'm sorry, Jag said. Where is Jaina? She was supposed to be looking out for Tahiri while you were all down on Bakara. Jaina hasn't returned yet from interviewing Melinza Thanis, Leia replied. If there was any concern for her daughter, the princess was hiding it well. She still hasn't reported in? Jag had been apprised of Jaina's mission when he'd first come on duty. But it's hours past midnight down there. She should have been back by now. We know, Han said. Jag felt his fists clench at this news. He wished again that he were down on the surface, where he could do more good. Maybe I should ask Captain Maine to send a shuttle with backup and— No, Leia interrupted. I have faith in Jaina. If she needs assistance, then she'll be in touch. Wherever she is, I'm sure— An alarm sounded from the console, cutting off the last part of her sentence. Hang on a second, Jag said. I have another call coming through on a separate channel. He flipped a switch to hear the incoming message. Go ahead. Colonel Fell, we have contacts emerging from hyperspace in Sector 11. The voice belonged to Selwyn Marcota, pride of Salonia's second-in-command. Jag forced the problems on Bakara to the back of his mind. His duty as squadron leader took precedence for the moment over his concerns for Jaina and Tahiri. How many? Thirty, with more on the way. At least two capital vessels so far. It looks like a fleet. Have they contacted Bakara? They're being hailed now. I'll patch you into the defense fleet net. Copy that. Jag flicked back to the secure channel. I'm sorry, Leia, Han, but I have to go. We just got the call, too, Leia responded crisply. We'll let you know if anything changes. Flights A and B, Jag said on the twin sun frequencies. Stay here and mind the big bird. See, you're with me. He peeled out of formation and was followed by two X-wings and a claw craft. On the scanner before him, the ships emerging from hyperspace stood out like a nebula in the deep void. The number of contacts now stood at forty, with still more coming. This is Barker and Defense Fleet, called the local traffic control. Please identify yourself and state your intentions. The response came in the form of a warbling, dissonant fluting. Jag had been briefed. He knew enough to recognize the language. The fleet had originated from Olhuek. But who was commanding it? The Cyruk or the Puek? The voice of C-3PO came over the comm. The message says... I come in peace, people of Bakara, to consecrate this world and bond our two cultures in alliance. Another voice spoke from Bakara in response to this. Jag recognized it as belonging to Prime Minister Kundertal. 
We welcome the Kiramak to Bakara in the hope that this new friendship will bring prosperity and enlightenment to all. The sickly sentiment made Jag roll his eyes. Luckily, the speeches didn't last any longer than that. Kiramak entourage, please assume the following orbits, the first voice from Bakara said. There followed a long list of requests designed to minimize the disruption caused by the many new arrivals, at the end of which there came a brief burst of alien song, which C-3PO interpreted to mean simply understood. Jag turned his interception flight into a sweeping, exploratory cruise, examining the alien vessels with a critical eye. The Chiss had fought the Sai Rook on several occasions, contributing behind the scenes to the Imperium's retreat at the advance of the New Republic. He himself, though, had never seen one outside of a simulation. While their battle droids consisted of simple, angular pyramids with weapon and sensor arrays at each corner, the larger ships possessed a smoothly organic appearance. Great, sweeping hulls with relatively few breaks formed bulbous, shell-like structures that bulged in odd but beautiful ways. He spotted two ovoid Schneer-class planetary assault carriers, accompanied by various Fossen-class picket ships. The assault carriers were crewed by more than 500 Pwek, plus over 300 intact droids if they were still used, and were nearly 750 meters long. Overall, given their structure, they displaced a greater volume than a Victory-class Star Destroyer. It seemed an awful lot of hardware to accompany a diplomatic mission. But then, he supposed, the Pwek were probably just as nervous of the Bakarans as the Bakarans were of them. With their freedom only recently attained, they wouldn't be keen to send their leader into the middle of a potentially difficult situation without sufficient backup. At least they weren't shy about sharing their battle data, though. On the screen before him, names rapidly appeared next to all the major Prek vessels. The cruiser in the middle of the formation was called the Firenry, while the one lagging slightly behind was designated the Erenunca. He didn't even bother to attempt to remember the names of the picket ships. As he watched, the last of the stragglers arrived, and the formation broke in three to assume the orbits given them by the Bakaran defense fleet. The maneuver was accomplished smoothly and without fuss, and that spoke loudly of the discipline and flexibility of the Pwek fleet. One thing was for certain. They might be new to the idea of being in charge of their own destiny, but the Prek had been exhaustively trained by their Sai Ruvi masters, to fly battleships. It showed. He hung around the main chunk of the fleet long enough to follow security negotiations with the reception team on the ground, and to witness the launch of seven heavily armed, to key class landing ships. The Kiramak was on its way. Jag only hoped that Bakara was ready for it. <laughs>